Hello. My name is Mark Douglas, and I'm the author of The Disciplined Trader and Trading in the Zone. I've been a trading coach since 1982, and over the years, I've worked with some of the industry's biggest hedge fund and money managers, as well as some of the exchange's largest floor traders. I know that all of you want to experience consistent results from your trading. In other words, you want to be able to generate an income you can rely on. However, one of the major obstacles in trying to accomplish this objective is in the area of trade execution. To produce a consistent income, a trader has to be able to execute their trades without making any errors or mistakes. In other words, trading without hesitation, reservation, or internal conflict. Basically, all of the errors we are susceptible to are a result of a lack of confidence, or more specifically, trading with fear. What most people don't realize is that trading without fear is actually a learned trading skill, a skill that has to be cultivated and is the primary difference that separates the professional from the typical trader. In this series of DVDs, I'm going to provide you with the kind of insight, understanding, and specific mental techniques you'll need to learn to trade without fear, so that like the professional, you can move in and out of your trades with the kind of confidence and ease that will allow you to take full advantage of your wise trade or any other trading methodology. Hello. <laughs> yeah, good morning. <laughs> and also, too, how many people came from the West Coast or, or in, that, in the West Coast time zone? Yeah, it was like the, the, the wise trade people picked me up at 6.30 in the morning, which was 4.30 in the morning for me. So, so when I say that, you know, when I say this, we're here for you and to ignore the cameras, ignore the environment, I really mean that. But at the same time, I want you guys to help me a little bit, okay? <laughs> it might take me a little bit, you know, it might take me a little bit to get going because I'm not used to doing presentations at, you know, 6.30 in the morning, my time, or 7 o'clock in the morning, my time. But anyway, what, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go through the process of learning how to think like a professional trader. Why would we want to learn how to think like a professional? Anybody make got any money. ideas? What's that? Make some money. Make some money. But you don't have to think like a professional to make money, do you? Okay. What does it even imply? What does it imply to, to think like a professional trader? I mean, let me ask you this. How many you guys have, I don't know what your, what your trading experience has been in terms of the number of years you've been at it, or it, kind of give me an idea of the, of, of the demographics here of the audience. I mean, how many people have been trading for more than two or three years? Most everybody? Uh, then, then, less than, then less than two years? Kind of new people? Oh, okay, so we've got about half and half. What would it mean two guys to say, well, let's think like a professional trader. What's that? Not thinking like an amateur. Okay, that's good. But w w what are the implications of the difference between a professional and an amateur? Right, consistency. Consistency. There you go. You see you're at my Houston workshop, right? <laughs> yeah, consistency. Exactly. In other words, what, what that would imply is that, is that if, I'm a if I'm a professional trader, in other words, if I've aspired to be a professional, it, 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 one of the implications would be that, that I can make consistent money because if I'm trading in the mode of a professional, I could be a hedge fund manager, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a professional hedger working for trading companies, or just having a full-time job as a trader where my income, my sole income, is derived as a trader. And to be in that kind of a position or to be in a position where other people are going to give you their money or, or give you their assets to be able to, you know, uh, uh, make money for them, it would certainly imply that you can make consistent money. That there is a way for you to, let's say, create an equity curve that looks, you know, something like this. Isn't that right? Are you going to give your money to somebody with an equity curve that looks like that? No. I'm not saying that people don't do it, and I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. But I'm saying that if I've aspired to be a professional trader, 
It means that I must have learned something that's different than the people who can't do this. There must be something about, about the way that I approach trading that allows me to do that. And believe me, there is. There's a lot. What's that? Cool. Yeah, cool. Basically, uh, and, and I don't know if, how many people in, in the room have, uh, have either read Trading in the Zone or, or The Discipline Trader? got a few people so so probably there so there's actually most of the people in the group aren't familiar maybe even with me or my background at all true or not yes or no see no right oh, okay um, so I'm gonna just give you a little bit uh, and I'll, I'll give you more later on but uh, I started trading back in 1978 and uh, the first trade that I made, I, I, the first trade I made was in potato futures at the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which they don't even trade potato futures anymore. Why I pick potato futures, I have no idea. Uh, I think that's probably what my broker said I should be trading. Maybe he said that there was, you know, there was, there was an opportunity in potato futures, but anyway, I made money. And of course, you know, just like most people who make money, their, their first trade or their second trade, it's, it's about as easy as one could imagine, and therefore you think to yourself, oh my God, why didn't I learn about this a long time ago? It sound, I mean, that sounds kind of familiar, right, in terms of a thought process? And uh, I went from trading potatoes to trading gold to trading silver. And uh, my, I'd say my trading experience back then was probably typical even to what it is today with most people, although you have to keep in mind that the technology that we had back then wasn't anything, anything like what you have available to you right now today. It still boggles my mind when I think about the way we had to trade 25 years ago, or almost 30 years ago, compared to what's available right now. I mean, I've never, I've always been attracted more to trading commodities than stocks. As a matter of fact, I've never even traded stocks. I've always traded commodities and options. And, and it's just, and I've never really, never really had the um, desire to trade on the floor of the exchange. Uh, although I lived in Chicago for uh, 20 years, uh, it just, it never really appealed to me. I don't know how many people are familiar with the floor or the, or the, or the trading pits, but I just thought it was an extremely harsh environment and, and not something that, you know, not something that just, like I said, it appealed to me. But the, the kind of trading platforms that you guys have available to you today really, truly approximate what it would be like to have a seat at the, at the Chicago Board of Trade or Chicago Mercantile Exchange and, and to trade at that level. You have instantaneous execution. And, and, and it's like you, can, it's like you can change your mind and not feel humiliated or, or, or like, you know, there's something wrong with you. You can put it in an order. You can cancel it. Back, you know, before, before the advent of electronic trading platforms, we used to have to call a broker. Now, you think about the time you made a decision to put on a trade. You think about the time that it takes, one, to dial the phone, for someone to pick the phone up, you know, how many times it has to ring, and then he gets on the other end of the line, you know, you got your broker, and then you give your broker your order, and then you've got to deal with the fact that does your broker really approve of your order? In other words, my, what I mean by approve is that, well, see, I'm, you know, I, I want to buy, you know, I want to buy three gold contracts. I say, well, you know, some of my biggest, biggest customers, they, they just went short gold. Now, you know, now what are you going to do with that information, okay? Or I've got, you know, X number of guys that are, that are on the other side of that trade. I say, well, yeah, if you want to, you know, you want to take the other side of their trade. I mean, that's fine, fine with me. I'll put the order in. So it's like, you know, so he, he can put the order in, and then, you know, you've got to wait for, you've got to wait for a fill. I can't tell you how many times that I put orders in the market where there were limit orders because I didn't want to do a market order because I didn't want to get the slippage of a market order. So you do a limit order, and, and on a limit order, the market has to trade... To be guaranteed to fill, the market has to trade through your price, does it not? How many times has the market traded to your price, okay, just right to your price on a buy order and reversed and you didn't get filled? 
That's very possible. The problem when you're doing it with a, with a, with a broker over the phone is that, is that that order goes into the pit. It goes to an executing, executing broker in the pit itself. So you've got a runner, and, 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 uh, and the order, you've got to go back to the runner, back to the phone bank, back to the broker, and the broker calls you with a fill. You're talking several minutes. Now, what if you're in a situation in a fast market where the market actually hit your price? You may have gotten filled, but you really don't know. You don't want to put a stop in the market because you don't even know if you're in or not. And the market's screaming, let's say, even in your favor, and you'd like to take profits, but you still haven't gotten your fill back yet. You don't even know if you're in the market. This is the kind of stuff we had to deal with all the time. All the time. It was a completely different world. Not only that, the only information that we had available to us was open, high, low, and close. That was it. Open, high, low, and close bars. And we used to have to get those unless we talked to our broker and pestered them, you know, X number of times a day. You know, you get it through the Wall Street Journal. We used to have to keep our own daily charts. Intraday stuff was just like non-existent. So, so anyway, I, you know, that's, I, I started trading like that. I went through, uh, Oh, I don't even remember what, what my first trading account was. I think it was around $20,000. You know, I lost all of that. And then, you know, saved up some money and opened up another one for around 15. You know, lost all of that. And then went to another broker. And I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And I'll find somebody who does. And, uh, and then this is, this is what really, really, this is probably the reason I'm even standing here today. Was this particular trade. Because, because this particular trade... Uh, just, it had a profound impact on me in terms, of, in terms of how it changed my life and what I was willing to do to find out what this was all about. To find out really what does it take to be a consistently successful trader. What does it take to really be able to earn an income as a trader? I was, uh, I was... Long uh, Silver, this would have been back in, uh, right around 1980 or 1981, or 1980, I think. I was Long Silver at around 975 an ounce. And there was two 5,000 ounce contracts at the uh, COMEX. In other words, I was Long 10,000 ounces of silver at 975 an ounce. And right after I got into the market, the market dropped about 20 cents on me. To about 9.55, so I was down $2,000, and my broker said, "Well, okay, you know, here's what we're going to do. Instead of getting out, we'll 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 put you into a spread. And so what we'll do is we'll your long 10,000 ounces of silver in New York, we'll go short 10,000 ounces of silver in Chicago because you could trade Chicago silver at the Chicago Board of Trade. Are you, everybody with me on this?" I just want to make sure that you guys are all with, you know, even though I know many of you are stock traders, it's, uh, the concept is the same, okay? So I'm, I'm long, 10,000 at 975. He puts me short, 10,000 at 955 in Chicago. So I've got this spread going on. And then he said, well, when the market goes back in your favor, we'll just take the short leg of the spread off. Now, keep in mind, back then, you guys are, you guys are what, do you, what do you typically pay for commissions, even in commodities? Or even, I don't know what you'd pay for stocks, but, but typically the average commission is about 4 to $5 a round turn, right? That's what you'd expect to pay? No, what are you paying? Less? No, more. More? Yeah. Round turn? Oh, well, really? I got the lowest. Well, you're in the, Dow, you're in the Dow Mini. What are you paying for the Dow, Dow Mini? Um, 11. 11? Oh, as as it started at like 30. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, then 11. Back in the day. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> back then, back in the 80s, we were, how much do you think we were paying back then? Come on, give me a guess. Come on. Guess. What? 100. Yeah, 125. How about, how's 125 a round turn yeah. uh, per contract? Yeah. So in other words, for me to put this trade on cost me 250 bucks. Yeah. Okay. When you put this one on right here, it cost me another 250 bucks. And then he said, of course, that when the market goes back into my favor, he'll take the short leg of the spread off and, you know, I should be all right. So that's exactly what the market did. The market went back up to, you know, right around the 975 area. He took the short leg of the spread off and then the market immediately dropped back down another 20 cents and put the short, the short leg of the spread back on again. So that's another 250 bucks, okay? Plus, he just locked in. When he took this off, 
First of all, he locked in a $2,000 loss by putting this trade on. When the market went back up to 975 and he took this off, he locked in another $2,000 loss. And then when it went back down again, he put it, put it back on and locked in another $2,000 loss. Now I'm down $6,750. Okay? And then, of course, it, it happened two or three more times. Now, from, from, from the market's perspective, all I'm in, all the markets, the silver market's just in a trading range. That's all it is. It's just in a trading range. But, but I don't really, I didn't know how to read chart, chart patterns at the time. I didn't really understand what was going on. I was just listening to him. And so what he was doing was just taking advantage of the fact that he was going back and forth between support and resistance and, and generating commissions for himself, okay? That's, that was it. That's, that's basically, he was, just, he was just turning my account. But that's, that's not the story, okay? That's, that's happened to a lot of people. Of course, it happens less now because we're all responsible for the, the trades that we put on. All, all we have to do is click the mouse button, and, and it's not that much money. But here's, here's the story, is that as these losses are, as these losses are mounting, okay, and I can't, I can't sleep and, and, and getting real stressed out, you know, I, I wake up one morning and I thought, you know what, this is it. I just can't take this anymore. I just, I just can't take it. And so, you know, when I got to work, I called them and I said, you know what, just get out of the whole damn thing. I, I just can't do this. So just liquidate the position. Does anybody remember the Hunt Brothers silver debacle? <sighs> oh, it didn't, it, it, does anybody, if I say the word limit up, does anybody understand what I mean by that? Okay, the exchanges will impose artificial price limits of how much a commodity, or even a stock for that matter, can fluctuate in any given day before they stop trading. So we don't have, the, we don't have these kinds of moves too much anymore, but back in the 80s, limit moves were really quite common. They really were. In other words, what would happen is this, is that, is that if, the market, if the market went up, let's say, I think in silver it was 50 cents. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but if the market went up by 50 cents, they would actually stop trading. Meaning if the market was bid up to, let's say, in this case, $10.25, trading would stop. In essence, what, that, what this means is that, is that, is that at 1025 there were no people, there wasn't anybody in the world, there wasn't, now keep, this, this is important for later on, there wasn't one person in the world who was willing to sell silver at 1025 if it was a limit move. Not one person. And so what happens is that the market, the price will go up seeking to find who will actually sell. So what, and, but, what they, but what the exchanges didn't want is the exchanges didn't want there to be this, this huge fluctuation all in one day. There might have been sellers at 1026, or there might have been sellers at $11, but you don't know that because the exchange says we're going to stop trading at 1025. You guys with me on this? Okay. So what happened is that I don't think it happened more than maybe half an hour, 45 minutes after I got out. The market was trading right around 975 an ounce where, where silver went limit up. And went limit up, was 30 days in a row to $49 an ounce? To forty nine dollars an ounce. I, I, I was looking now. Now keep now think now think about this. Okay, now think about being in this kind of a winning trade. Now, <clears throat> when we're in a winning trade, w the market almost never goes straight up and it never goes straight down. There are rare occasions, of course, like in this case, when it does. So that we're when we're in a winning trade, we have to constantly be making decisions about where we're going to take profits and how much heat we can take with the market coming back against our position to say, well, is this a time to take profits? Or am I going to let it come back a little bit further? Am I going to come back a little bit further against me? Because, well, is this, just a nor is this normal retracement or, or is this more significant, okay? Is this a little bit of a profit-taking retracement? Is it more significant? Should I get out now? Do we have more left? Is it, are we going to make new highs? You've got to be making all these kinds of decisions. And it's very difficult, as we all know, right? See, in this case, I didn't have to be making any decisions because the market went limit up 30 days in a row. Boom, boom. It was like, wake up, go ahead. Were you out or were you still I was out. I just got out like a half an hour before it happened. So you were just going, oh my God. Oh, my God. see, the problem is I couldn't even get back in because there wasn't anybody willing to take the other side of the buy orders. On a limit move, you can't get back in. 
So I sat back and, and watched in complete agony. I mean, and I mean intense, intense agony. I don't know, I, don't, I didn't throw up, but you know, it's like, eh, maybe I almost did. I don't know. Go ahead. You, you said you had five contracts? No, well, two. Two. Just Why don't you just take one off the table, let the other one run for another day? First of all, Jerry, you're, you're assuming that I knew that this was going to happen. No, I'm assuming that getting out all at once takes you, off the, takes you out of the play completely. Jerry, have you ever been in a situation where we really lost a ton of money and you just can't deal with it anymore? Yeah. Well, I, well, no, I I've been at. in a situation where I've been down a lot of money. Okay. I didn't lose because that's on paper. No, well, commodities, no. With stocks, you're right. With stocks, it's technically on paper. With, when, you're, when you're in commodities, the, the money's out of your account. It's gone. It's gone at the end of the day. Okay? It's not, th this is not paper money. This is real money. Are, are you with me on this? Yeah, I'm understanding you. Okay. So, so, so I wasn't looking at, at uh, I wasn't looking at, at, you know, at, like I said, paper losses. The money was out of my account. So, I had had enough. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. So when you, when you think about it in that context, when you just made up your mind that I just can't deal with this anymore, it doesn't even occur to you to get out in stages. Why would I get out in stages when, when, I, when I've already gone through a week and a half of this back and forth and, you know, uh, and it's virtually wiped out my account? Because by then, I probably would have had to put more money. If, even for me to take just one contract off and leave one on, I probably would have had to put more money in, in the account. And I'm not, there's not any point in doing that. Are you with me on this? I, mean, I, do, I don't trade commodities. I trade other things in... But the concept's the same. Except it doesn't come out of my, it's, as you said, it's a paper trade. Yeah, you already own, you own stock, you own an asset. I own an asset. And if you want to hold on to that asset until it goes down to zero, that's fine. Okay, your, your money is not flowing. In a sense, money's flowing out of your account, but not in the same way it is with a commodity. No. Yeah. Okay, I have to pay that money right now. You're just losing the value of an asset. I actually have to pay mm. that money. And it comes out every single day. Go ahead. Go ahead and hand the microphone back to that gentleman. Well, another thing that can be uh, of interest here is, uh, at least from the way I gathered you was talking a while ago, you really weren't controlling this. Your broker was doing this. Correct. So even if you had wanted to get out in stages, your broker was doing it saying, hey, here's what I'm doing to you in this yeah, case. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like I didn't really, I wasn't really in control of the situation because I didn't know what I was doing. All I know is that I was within, let's say, a half an hour, 45 minutes of, just, of a monster trade. A monster trade. Yeah, and like I said, I, I sat back and watched in agony as the market went up to $49 an ounce. I'm thinking to myself, I was like that close to $400,000 on just two contracts. $400,000. And so, like I said, when I first started telling you this, this really had a profound impact on me. It really did. And I thought to myself, and at the time, I was managing a, a commercial casualty insurance agency in the suburbs of Detroit. Not really, you know, I thought that's what I wanted to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But, you know, I, I aspired to, to management. I was very successful. And, uh, you know, for, at the time, you know, even back then in, in you know, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, w was making a six-figure income, and I was only in, in my early 30s. So, you know, it was, I really had a lot of things going for me. But, uh, you know, after this experience, I thought to myself, you know what, i, I got to figure out what's going on here. And I certainly wasn't going to be able to do it in Michigan. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to Chicago. And that's what I did. I went to Chicago. The first I just thought, you know, if, if I'm going to get into the business, who am I going to get into the business with? Well, back then there was Merrill Lynch, there's Dean Witter, Smith Barney, you know, and I thought, who are you going to, who are you going to pick? You pick Merrill Lynch, right? Okay, so I went over to the Chicago Board of Trade. They have an office right there and right on the second floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. And uh, they just so happened they had three openings uh, for trainee brokers and they had over a thousand people applying for it. So how am I going to how am I going to be one of those three people? I thought, well, you know what? I went back, you know, I went back home. I went to, you know, one of, the, one of the bigger Merrill Lynch offices in the Detroit area, and I went through the whole employment, employment process to familiarize myself with what it is that they required to get a job. And, and, and this is what I think got me that job at the Board of Trade. 
is that they had an aptitude test and this is a multi-page application but on the back of the application they had a they had a square like this on you know and and they wanted spontaneously while you're in the you know while you're filling this application out spontaneously what they wanted you to do was to write like a little mini essay about some philosophical question before I went to the Board of Trade and actually filled out that application I spent two weeks agonizing over every word just to make sure every word of that two or three paragraphs that I wrote down was completely perfect so that when I took the app I wrote down exactly what I'd worked on and and I can imagine why they hired me because if you thought that I wrote that spontaneously in the moment so hey this guy we gotta have this guy here we gotta have this guy okay so I did I got the job now think about this now when I was working for the agency the casualty agency commercial casualty insurance I was I, as a matter of fact, I had just signed a contract, not more than like three or four months before I actually went to the went to work in, in Chicago, over a three-year period for three hundred sixty thousand dollars. And what Merrill Lynch was offering me was twenty thousand dollars on a draw. Okay, in other words, it, it was it was a you know they're going to give me twenty thousand, but it's a draw. I mean, I got to pay it back based on commissions. Now, there, if you can imagine, there wasn't one person in my life, not one person, who thought that I wasn't absolutely stark raving out of my mind. To give that up to go to Chicago to do this so you know it wasn't like I had a lot of support you know and I wasn't like I wasn't catching a lot of grief from everybody that I knew about what it was that, that I was doing so you can imagine my horror you might is a good word for it I mean because when I got to Chicago I'm thinking why am I even doing this I'm doing this because I'm going to Chicago because because that's where the traders are that's that's where the people are who, who know who know what they're doing Correct? And then to get there to find out that that is not the case. That is not the case at all. That the, there were 40, almost 50 brokers in the office, and none of them knew how to trade. And not only did they not know how to trade, I mean, they, Merrill Lynch made absolutely no bones about the fact that we were not traders. They spent no money, no time, and completely discouraged us from even learning how to trade. We were salesmen. We were taught how to talk about trading. We were taught how to talk about investments. We were taught how to, you know, it's called dialing for dollars, to get on the phone and get people to open up accounts. And, and, the, uh, and, and even though this was unspoken, I'd say the, the underlying philosophy behind the business was, especially in the commodities business, I'm not talking about the equities. I'm not saying that, that on the equity side of the business that, there, that it wasn't more reputable. But, but this was about as irreputable as it could be. Because the underlying philosophy that we operated from was all commodity traders are terminal, meaning like they have a terminal Ill illness. It's only a matter of time before they want to say all commodity traders are terminal and it is our job as a broker to make them as comfortable as possible until they expire. In other words, to extract as much money out of their account as you could until they're gone. And, 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 and even to this day, even to this day, it, it just blows me away to think that when I went, I went to a 30-day training class in Manhattan. And there were brokers from all over the world, probably about 80 or 90 of us. And, and the guy and, and the person that was the head of Merrill Lynch Commodities at the time, his name was John Conheny. And when he came in to address our class, and to this day, I don't know why he did this, but he, like he said, hi, and he started out, and he started out with these words, the average Merrill Lynch customer loses all their money in six months. And that was the truth. Uh, commodities, not equities, commodities. And that was the truth. That was about what it was. It's, it took about six months for people to lose their account and... And, uh, and you just, like I said, you just go to the next one. So here I'm, I, I, I left this six-figure income to go to Chicago to learn about this business and this industry. And here I'm in a situation, and it's like, uh, it was, like I said, it was appalling, absolutely appalling. So I thought, well, okay, uh, I'll make friends with people on the floor. They must know what they're doing. The floor traders, the floor traders know what they're doing. Well, I found out that wasn't necessarily the case either. Now, it doesn't mean that the floor traders didn't know how to make money. But, but and this is, I'm not going to get into this because we don't have time. But even though you, what you do is called trading, and what they do they call trading, 
the way and the mindset that you have to have to make money couldn't be further apart, even though they're both called trading. The typical local, when I mean the person who traded for their own account in the pit or on the floor of the exchange, the way they made money, almost they, didn't, they didn't, weren't trying to make direction-related decisions. In other words, it wasn't the kind of trading where they actually, they would find themselves in winning trades that were going in their favor, but that's not the reason why they put the trade on. And like I said, I'm not going to get into the, the, the specifics or dynamics of it because it would take me too long to explain. It just isn't necessary for right now. All I'm saying is that, is that it just, it, it's, it's a completely, as a matter of fact, before I, I left Chicago and moved to, um, to Arizona, uh, I, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange asked me, and I, and I worked on it for, for, oh, for a while, for about six months before I left, asked me to put together a program to help floor traders make the transition from the floor to screen-based trading. Because it's, it's, very, it's, it's a huge psychological leap. It really is. It's a huge transition that, that, that has to be made. So what I'm saying is that not knowing that before I got to Chicago, it was like here I'm in a situation where... where I really didn't know anybody who really knew how to trade, or at least knew how to trade in the sense of creating that consistency that we're looking for. It doesn't mean that people couldn't make money. People were making money all the time. It's just that, you know, what's the point of making money if you're, you're susceptible to giving it all back? In other words, if this is your equity curve, and then all of a sudden you're, 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 you're experiencing these huge losses and huge drawdowns, not only is this certainly damaging financially, but it's also damaging emotionally. And it, and it can be very difficult to recover from. These are what I call the boom and busters. Okay, you basically had traders that fall into three categories as far as equity curve is concerned. You've got your consistent winners, the people who have the traders You've got your consistent winners. Now, that doesn't, now, it doesn't mean that there aren't drawdowns here, okay? But what do you think these drawdowns would be a reflection of for the consistent winners? Consistent winners take losing trades all the time. But their drawdowns are a reflection of what? Anybody got any ideas? Good uh, money management skills. Yeah, money, man money management skills. Capital preservation. Okay, these are okay. These are two good answers, but not the answer I'm looking for. Their drawdowns are simply a reflection of the normal losses that any trading methodology will incur. There are, there is such a thing as normal losses. You don't have to write this down because I'm just we're just starting to scratch the surface. We are going to go into this in far more detail later on. So, I mean, if you guys want to write it down, that's fine. But it, it really isn't necessary. Okay, normal losses that any trading methodology will incur. Then you've got people who, who, have, who, who learn something about how to trade, who acquire a good methodology where it is possible, based on that methodology, to experience consistent, a consistent income, but your equity curve might look more like this. Most people who are experienced the boom and bust cycles, these are the bust cycles, would say that something happened in the market to cause this. What you're going to find out today is that it is not the case. Even though it may seem like it, it is not the case. These are virtually always the result of trading errors, what I call trading errors, which we're going to go into in, in, in detail later on. One of the, oh, just, just, to, I, just for the gentlemen, the people, few people back here that don't have any idea of my background, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go a little bit further in it, and, and just, I'm just going to jump ahead for a second. I ended up, ended up uh, being a trading coach. And, and, and working with, uh, I was a trading coach for probably about 17 years. I don't really do it, do it much anymore. I just pretty much focus on my own trading. But 
but while I was, especially in the, you know, throughout the, the 80s and, and most of the 90s, um, I worked with a lot of floor traders. And um, one floor, we talk about boom and bust. There, there was one of the floor traders I worked with was probably one of the five biggest bond traders at the Chicago Board of Trade. And when I met him, uh, was in like around May of 1992. And from January of 92 until the time that I met him in May of 1992, he had around, this is, no, this is a guy that just traded for himself. He didn't trade for a firm. He just traded his own account in, on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade in the bond pit. He had $12 million roll in and out of his account. And he had a particularly bad day. And uh, he ran into somebody who attended one of my workshops and said, hey, you should go see this guy. He called me. We had a few appointments, didn't really go anywhere. And the next thing, about a month later, I get a frantic call from his wife, who I hadn't even met, didn't even know who she was. Got a frantic call from his wife that said, you know, they're going to lose their house if, you know, if, if uh, I don't do something with him, okay? <laughs> He, he had had a particularly, he had another bad, real bad day. So anyway, I started working with him in, in July of 1992. And from July of 1992 until the end of the year, he ended up the year with, with uh, almost $6, $6 million. Now, that may not seem like a lot considering he had these swings, but he'd never finished, he'd never finished a year with more than, I think, around seven hundred, six hundred fifty or $700,000. So he had just under $6 million. And so then he went on vacation. He happened to take a book with him called The Coming Collapse of the Bond Market. And this would have been uh, in like December of, or late December of 1992, early January of 93. And uh, came back. Now, if anybody remembers the bond market back then, it rallied, to, it rallied to spectacular heights. But in the meantime, he'd read this The Coming Collapse of the Bond Market. So he was going into the market every day short. Okay, and, and, and pissing away the six million dollars until he got to the point where he had about two of it left. And, and it took him about, I don't know, until maybe mid-February. And, and he was so exasperated that he said, hey, you know what? I'm willing to do anything. Okay, now keep in mind, I'm willing to do anything. And he wasn't, it wasn't lip service. It was real. It was genuine. It was sincere. And I said, if you're willing to do anything, then here's what you have to do. What I've been working with him, what I noticed is that he was able to stay focused, really, for not more than about an hour a day. Now, this guy loved trading. I mean, he just loved being in the pit. He just loved every part of it. He just, he just had the hardest time tearing himself away. But if he really wanted to make consistent money, then I, I felt that an hour a day was about it. Because after an hour a day, he'd start losing, his focus would start to diminish, and then he'd also start to get reckless. He was the kind of guy, and this, and this here again, this even kind of, this is very difficult for people to comprehend, but it is the absolute truth. He, he was the kind of guy where, when I was working with him during that period, in, you know, in, in, in the second half of 1992, where he would have a, um, he'd have a, a, a half million dollar day, winnings, he'd, he'd make a half million dollars, but when he called after he was out of the pit to, to have his consultation, you know, he'd be real angry with himself because he, up to about five minutes before the close, he was up a half a million dollars and then he'd, then he'd piss away about 175 of it. So it only ended up with $325,000 for the day. Now this is just like a normal guy like, like us here in this room with $325,000 and this was not an abnormal day, but he's real angry with himself. Because he pissed away that 175, and then the next day, you know, he'd do about the same thing. He'd make 400 and 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 piss away maybe two at the close, and then the next day he'd make you know 350 and then piss away another 150. He, he's got spectacular wins up until Friday, but this accumulated anger, anger that that he was building up throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. By the time Friday rolled around, you know, he'd lose a million and a half bucks. And then start to cycle all over again. So this, so now it's like I'm saying, you know what? Especially as a floor trader, 
As a floor trader, you really have to be focused. When you're trading at the level that he traded at, where you're trading hundreds of sometimes thousands of contracts, if anybody knows anything about the bond market, we know that, that, that one incremental price change in a bond contract is $31.25, okay? You guys with me on this? So this would be a tick. So in other words, if the bonds went, went one, one tick up and you're long one contract, you'd make $31.25. If it went down one tick and you were long one contract, you just lost $31.25. He would trade 1,000 contracts at a time. That means one incremental tick price change was $31,000. 31250 bucks. Now, if anybody's ever watched the bonds move, you know that it can move 5, 10, 15 ticks like that. Not only that, there can be what's called price vacuums. Everybody familiar with the price vacuum? You know what I mean by price vacuum? It means that if, if, the, bond is, if the bonds are at, uh, let's say, 106, uh, 106.10, uh, you guys are probably not familiar with bond prices. 106.10, that was the last posted price. That something can happen, and you're long. Something can happen where there are, there are no more offers, and the next posted price is 106 even. That means the market went down 10 ticks without there being any trades between 10 and even. No trades at all. Which means if you're long... You just lost, in that instant, $31,000.25 on 1,000 on contracts. This is quite common. So you really have to be focused. It would be like when you're trading at this level, I, I, would, I would make an analogy. It, it's almost like there's a couple of analogies. One, it's like if you're in an NBA playoff, it's the finals, it's the last game, seven games, it's a it's seven game NBA Finals. One minute left. The score is tied. The coach is going to send somebody in who's really focused. If the coach thinks you're distracted and you're not on your game, you think you're going to get in that game? This is the way you to be in these kind of circumstances in the pit. That's the kind of mindset that you had to maintain. Because even if you got, you just, even if you, were, if you were distracted and turned away, there could be bids and offers that would have gotten you out of your trade that all of a sudden dry up. Meaning when, when guys are bidding and offering in the pit, they're using hand signals. And they're, and they're telling you they want to buy or they want to sell and how many. And there's, there's hundreds of guys all around screaming. Now these bids and offers can dry up because when you have, make eye contact and you point, you say, okay, we've got a trade, and then you, you write your trade down in your trading card, and now it's an electronic handheld, handheld device. But otherwise, you make a trade, and okay, then you could be out of your trade and take your profits. When these kind of things happen, these price vacuums, you, know, you're, you could be in bad shape. And just be a matter of just, just a momentary look away. The guy that you were going to use to get out of your trade is gone now. He put his hands down. Uh-oh, I'm, 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 in, I'm in trouble. Well, what I found is that, is that he could maintain his, an ideal mindset for about an hour a day. And so that's what I said. I said if you're really sincere, you're, you, if you're really, you really want to do, if you really do anything, you can only trade an hour a day. And he agreed to it. And he said, what hour a day? I said, doesn't, it really won't matter. And it really didn't. He was convinced initially that what hour he went in would make a big difference. It really didn't make any difference at all. He was so good. As a matter of fact, there were other bond traders that I work with that said that watching him trade would have been the equivalent of like watching Michael Jordan play basketball. He was that good. And so he did. He went in just one hour a day. And because he knew that he only had that one hour, he was really focused and he was averaging $175,000 for that one day, or for that, on, on an average, for that one hour per day. Okay? But that would be an example. He would be an example of an extreme boom and buster. We get, kinda, if we're going to kind of have that concept down in the brain about boom and busters, okay? And then what you have is you have the consistent losers. People whose equity curve looks like that. Now, just to get back to uh, my situation, 
when I, when I, like I said, when I went to Chicago, I'm thinking, okay, you know, uh, I mean, I've got quite a bit of money. I, I, I sold my interest in the agency, but at the same time, uh, I had a uh, pretty expensive lifestyle. As you can quite imagine, I had, I had a house in, in Michigan that uh, uh, I had a girlfriend, a very high maintenance girlfriend, and, and, and who, 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 her, her two daughters were living in. And I had a very expensive apartment in Chicago and a Porsche, and you know, I just I had the life, okay? And, uh, and you know, and I, was, I was going back and forth every weekend to visit them. Uh, so, I mean, really, my situation was I, I really I, I couldn 't maintain that kind of lifestyle with the money that I had without making without being successful as a trader and that was the whole idea anyway I thought you know okay i'll i 'll make whatever shortfall that you know I end up with as a trader and interestingly enough, I had to have my trading account with another brokerage firm secretly i couldn 't trade through Merrill Lynch. And there wasn't anybody else in the office who, who traded their own money. I was the only, unless they were doing it secretly and didn't tell me. I was the only person in the office who, who was actually trading their own money. Who actually traded, period, other than putting on trades for their customers. So what ended up happening is that, and oh, another, another part of this is that, is that I also had this, um, I, I just... I, I don't, and I can't really tell you why I knew this, it's just that I did. I just, it just made sense to me. It, it just never occurred to me that trading was anything other than about psychology. I mean, the first trading book I ever bought was, was actually the very, very first book on trading, the, the, only, the first book that was devoted uh, uh, specifically to trading psychology, which was Jake Bernstein's Investor's Quotient that came out in 1980. And there weren't that many trading books avail even available back then. And that was the first trading book that I, I didn't buy a book on technical analysis. I bought a book on trading psychology. So I was, I was not only Im immersed in the concepts of trading psychology virtually right from the very beginning, I was also keeping very extensive journals of, of my thinking process, what was going on, what I was observing from uh, other brokers in the, you know, in the uh, Merrill Lynch office, as well as what I was observing from uh, m interacting with my customers. And I noticed we were all kind of, all kind of you know, conforming to the same patterns, the same problems. But just say that because I, I did have, you know, I did have this kind of foundation you know, to understand that, that it was basically psychological in nature. Because one of the things we're going to talk about, you know, when I get into the skill section of, of this, of the presentation, is that when you look at trading skills, it's like, well, what kind of skills are we talking about? If we're talking about thinking like a professional, we're implying that the skills are all mental in nature, and they are. Because when you really get right down to it, and you really start to think about it, what physical skills are necessary to, to trade? We're not talking about a golf swing or a tennis racket or any other kind of, you know, any other kind of physical endeavor that, that, we're, we're, that we're familiar with. What kind of skills are we, what does it take physically to put on a trade? A mouse click. A mouse click, that's it. Your ability to move the mouse and click it on the buy or sell button. It's that simple. And as a result of it being that simple, it's easy to think that, oh my God, trading is so easy. It isn't. As you well probably know, whether you've been at it a long time or even a little bit of time, there are some very sophisticated psychological skills that you have to acquire to get this kind of an equity curve. And, and virtually all these skills are founded in Learning how to trade without fear. That's basically what this whole workshop's about. Is learning how to trade without fear. Because that's what's going to screw you up on virtually everything. Everything that you can do wrong as a trader is going to be the result of what you're afraid of. And the effects that fear has on your perception of market information. So... 
so with my situation, it's like here I'd given all this up to go to Chicago to learn how to trade, to find out that the only people who really knew how to trade back then were, were people that I didn't have access to. Meaning there were, there were, you know, there were some big names in the industry who never really took the time or expended the effort to find out exactly what it is that allowed them to create a consistently rising equity curve. What they would say is, well, yeah, you got to go with the flow. The trend is your friend. Cut your losses. Let your profits run. You know, it was all these, all these neat little phrases, but it's like, who in the hell knew what that meant and how to do it? Yeah, it sounds great. Cut your losses, let your profits run. Oh, you know. Even cutting your losses is, it can be extremely difficult to learn. Letting your profits run can be 10 times more difficult than learning how to cut your, profit, cut, cut your losses. In fact, it's one of the most difficult things to, to acquire in terms of a skill is learning how to let your profits run. So it was like all this was kind of building up. And my lifestyle was, was, draining, was draining my money away. And one of the things, that, one of the things that, that I would say characterized me back then, if I was probably obsessive about anything, it was my credit. It's like my credit was my, as far as I was concerned, it was like the most important thing in life is to have flawless, flawless credit. Not just, I mean, flawless and here I'm in a situation where I'm, I am truly running out of money. And my trading losses, I didn't really, it wasn't really like I was losing a lot of money trading because I'd really stopped the hemorrhaging. I wasn't trading in a way where I was actually losing money, but I wasn't making any money. And it's like there was always this little voice in the back of my brain, you know, it would come to the forefront of my consciousness and it would say, you know, Mark, this ain't adding up. There's something wrong here. There's, some, there's something wrong. It's like it's not, it's not adding up. And then I kind of shove it back there and, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be all right. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. It's going to be all right. Eventually, it got to the point where I, I, I was literally out of money. And the only choice I had was to file bankruptcy. Fortunately, I was in a situation where I had two residences one in Chicago and one in Michigan. And so I had a choice of where I filed. And of course I filed in Michigan because if Merrill Lynch would have found out, they probably would have fired me. As a matter of fact, nobody knew what had happened. I, nobody knew in Chicago, nobody that I knew in Chicago knew what had happened. So I filed in Michigan and I'm thinking, and literally, because of my attitudes about credit, I'm thinking if I've got to do this, I'm going to fall beneath the cracks of society and never reemerge. I really believe that. I honestly, God really did. I just didn't see how it was possible to live after having, have to, after having to do something like that. And of course, you know, what I found is that, and when I ended up, I mean, what I say in the Discipline Trader, and I don't really go into a lot of detail in the Discipline Trader about this, but just, just to say that what I ended up with was really, I, I had an apartment, I, I had my bed and my TV, and, 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 and when, I, when I filed, I was still current on everything. I wasn't even late one day on any of my bills. As a matter of fact, I even, I even called, you know, called the, the, the finance company to come and pick the car up. But I wasn't even late a payment. I said, you know what, I can't do it anymore. You're probably going to want it back anyway. So, you know, it was like, come and pick it up. And, of course, they did. And, and, uh, and the, the, you guys, want, there's a funny story about that. I've never, I've never told anybody this. But you guys want to hear a funny story about that? When the guy came to pick it up. And uh, so I'm thinking, you know, because we're, we're in front of the apartment building, and, and I'm thinking, well, if he's going to pick this up, you know, then I ought to get some sort of receipt that it was in perfect condition. You know, because I don't know what the hell he's going to do to it on, on you know. I, I mean, I don't know. So it's like, and the guy wouldn't give me a receipt saying that. And so I wouldn't give him the keys. And so, you know, so he called his boss, and, and, I, and I, heard, I heard his boss on the other end of the line screaming at him, you do whatever he wants to get those keys. You know, it's like, and I, he said something else. I'm not going to say uh, for this, for, the, for this, you know, for, for this particular presentation. But yeah, it was like, you know, they just, uh, you know, someone's someone's willing to give you the car. They don't even have to go repossess it. It's like, you know, hey, give them the receipt. But in any case, uh, 
what I realized, I mean, now you think about this, it's like, it's like when you define yourself based on your possessions, you know, just like anybody that loses anything, you, you know, you, you've, got, you've got an internal representation and you've got an external representation. And now there was, there was a, uh, a discrepancy between what was outside of me and what was inside of me in terms of the way that I define myself. And, you know, so that has to be reconciled. And what I realized, you know, and it didn't even really take that long. I don't remember how long it took. But it was like, one, I still had my job at Merrill Lynch. And so as a result, I mean, it's like I'm starting thinking, okay, well, things are going to be all right. I was in my worst fear. I mean, that was my worst fear. I mean, when the, when the fear would creep up into the forefront of my mind, I was like, the, you know, that was my worst fear. Now I'm in it. And I'm realizing that, you know, I think I'm going to be all right. I, I'm healthy. I can still think. I'm going I'm to be all right. And when I came to this realization that I'm going to be all right, this is when things change for me as a trader. And, and, this, is, and this is the interesting part about my situation that, that most people don't have the benefit of experiencing. There are two things. One, I had this foundation of knowing that it was all psychological anyway. So I had all these things that, I, that I'd been working on up to that point. And two, when you tap out as a trader, I mean, when you really tap out, you don't get to trade anymore because you don't have any money, right? But I was in a situation where I still got to trade. Even though I was working with other people's money, I still got to trade every day. And so as a result of experiencing my worst fears, coming to the realization that I'm going to be all right, and then at the same time being, being in a position where I'm able to interact with the market, it was like because I didn't have anything more to lose, I didn't. It was like, it was like this, the market completely changed for me. It was like I had these blinders on that all of a sudden just came off because the market was different because I wasn't afraid anymore. I was seeing the same patterns over and over and over again beforehand, but I was seeing the same patterns differently. I was seeing the same patterns from a, let's say, relatively carefree state of mind. And that relatively carefree state of mind allowed me to, like you say, flow in and out of my trades with an ease and effortlessness that I would not have been able to imagine beforehand. And then what happened is that I started making consistent money for my customers. And there's even, well, uh, there's, there's one, one really, as a matter of one really good, good story where, I mean, there, there are a lot of good stories that I can tell you about my customers at Merrill Lynch. But in one case, uh, I inherited this guy who, was, who at the time was the head of the state of Illinois' uh, mainframe computers, and he was from India. And he had put together his own trading program, and he was using the you know, state computers to do it. And so, uh, and, and he had an account, technically an account with Merrill Lynch, but wasn't funded because he'd lost all his money. But he, but he still had, he still maintained the, the account. And so I inherited him as a customer, and he would call me every day. And he was just like, and all he would say to me is like, I'd pick up the phone. He wouldn't say, hi, how are you? He'd say, give me data. You know, like, give me the high, low, and close. Eh. And, you know, so we interacted like this for a long time. Well, he came up with his own day trading system that, uh, that, that eventually, well, because he and I started working on it together, he had, the, he had the internal program for it, but he didn't have any money management parameters for it. So after about two or three months of working with him on it, we came up with some really good money management parameters, and then all my customers started trading it, and, and we were making consistent money day after day, even to the point where Merrill Lynch was starting to take notice. You know, that, that you know, here all, all this whole customer, his, his customer base is, is making money. And, and he got to the point where, where he's thinking, okay, all these people are now deriving this benefit from my work. I should be able to do it too. And he talked his wife into letting him put $5,000 into his account to fund his account. I don't know what happened to him. Why? I mean, I, you know, not like we had personal discussions. So I don't know why he didn't have any money in his account. The guy was a maniac. It was like he, got, he, put the, he put the money in his account, and two days later, it was all gone. It was like he called me up and he'd say, okay, do this. I said, well, wait a second. The, the system says to do this. He said, no, 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 no. I don't care what the system says. This is what's going to happen. He didn't follow any of his own rules. Now, here we had a track record. We had a legitimate 
track record, bona fide, real money, day after day. He gets a few bucks in his account, and it's like he thinks he knows where the market's going. Like I said, he, he was gone in two days, and that was it. It was all over with, because at that point, he, he, you know, he was done. I didn't get the system because it was in, in his computer, mainframe computer at the state of Illinois and, and had no more contact with him. And shortly after that, ended up getting fired from Merrill Lynch anyway because there was a, like one of these management consultants that came in from New York and she was going around the office talking to all the different brokers because of whatever, whatever it was that they were trying to find out. And she got to me and at that, by that time, I was already writing the discipline trader. And so, and I just like, you know, I started very exciting to say, oh yeah, this is what I found out and this is what I've learned. And her eyes lit up saying, this is exactly, this is exactly what we're looking for. And she was just, you know, we talked for probably about an hour, hour and a half. And she, she was all excited. And then she, and then she said, I, you know, I got to go tell, well, I'm not going to say his name, the, the office manager, okay? And she walked away from me, walked over to the office manager. Ten minutes later, ten minutes later, he came over and said, pack up your stuff and get out. Right then and there, right then and there on the spot. Pack up your stuff and get out. So that's how I ended up, uh, uh, ended up actually being a trading coach because by then, uh, just, you know, floor trade, because I'd made friends with floor traders, you know, I was making friends to find out how they trade and that sort of thing. Well, they started coming to me for advice, even while I was at Merrill Lynch. And, uh, and because it's a pretty small community, uh, you know, the word gets around, especially when, when you, you know, people are really genuinely helped with, with the kind of advice that you're, the, that you're giving them. And I'd, you know, and I'd help several floor traders turn their trading around. And so what had happened is I started getting hired by uh, clearing firms. What I mean by clearing firms is that to trade on the floor of an exchange, you have to, uh, you have to clear your trades through a financial institution. And so, you know, it's like you're, it's, it, these are traders just like you. They have their own account, but, but what they have to do is they have to clear their trades through, like I said, one of the, one of the major clearing firms at the exchange. Well, what, it hap what would happen is this, that it isn't like this now, but back in the, back in the early 80s, or the mid 80s, clearing firms were in some ways like, like almost like family operations where, where the people who owned the clearing firms, they knew all the, all the floor traders, they were friends with them, they partied together, you know, Christmases and holidays and that sort of thing. And so if one of the floor traders would go debit, you know what I mean by go debit? In other words, you know, you have to trade, have to have a, a positive, a positive balance in your account. Well, the problem with floor trading is that not, again, not today, but back then, when you traded on the floor, you had, to, you had to record your trades on a trading card. So in other words, if you and I are entering into a trade where I'm going long and you're going short, what I would do is, is that we would, we would take our badge, like a, the acronym of our badge, and, and our clearinghouse number, record it on this card, and how many contracts we traded. Let's say you're short 10 and I'm long 10, and the price that, that, that we traded them at. Well, those cards didn't have to be turned in until the end of the day. And then they'd all get reconciled, meaning that between all the different trades and all the, all the traders from all the different clearing firms, this would all go into a central clearing operation to find out which trades were, you know, to find out who's long and who's short, how much money's coming out of whose account, and whether or not they were called, what are called out trades, meaning that you thought, you thought I said 10, and, and I thought we were doing it for 100. Okay, so now we've got a discrepancy in 90 trades. These were called out trades that had to be reconciled before the open of the next day, which is a whole nother world. We're not, we're not, we're not going to get into it. All, but all I'm saying is that, all I'm saying is that, is that it would not be unusual for guys to overtrade during the day, and the clearing firm wouldn't even find out about it until the end of the day. For an example, one of the one of the guys I worked with at Merrill Lynch, eventually he was a mathematics professor, a really nice guy, should not have been a trader at all, had absolutely, I mean. Anyway, the peas at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and he was a one-lot trader, meaning, you know, just traded one contract, one in and out, one contract, and, 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 and eventually the forces inside of him were building up where he's frustrated with the fact that he's, you know, he can't make a living at it, he's just eking, eking it out, where one day he snapped, and this, and this one-lot trader almost took down the clearing firm. In other words, he's got like several thousand S&Ps on, several thousand contracts, 
where other guys are into those trades and, and the market's going against them. So he almost took down a clearing firm just, just by himself. So what would happen is that, is that because guys would go debit, meaning the end up of the day lost, maybe they're down 25000 or fifty or $100,000, the guy that owns the clearing firm doesn't want to say, hey, you can't trade until you pay this off. They'd want to let him go back into the pit to work it, to work it down. Well, after, you know, you've got four or five of these troublesome or 15 of these troublesome traders that are constantly running debits, you start to get a little worried. And so what they did is start, they, they, they hired me to work with these guys. Most of the information, most of the insight, let's say, that, that you'll find in the disciplined trader and trading in the zone came from me working with these floor traders on a daily basis. <laughs> And it was, I'm laughing because obviously it was quite a, it was quite a trip <laughs> working with these guys because they, they are not like, they are not like you and me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really about the best I can, the best way I can describe it without going into a lot of detail. They're not like you and me. So anyway, I, you know, this is kind of a, a, maybe a long drawn out introduction to the fact that what we're talking about here is that you guys have. A, a really wonderful trading methodology where there is an enormous amount of potential for you to be able to make a consistent income from being able to take full advantage of the potential that this trading methodology offers you. But I would say that there's probably, it wouldn't be unfair for me to say It wouldn't be unfair for me to say that there's probably what I'm going to call the profit gap. The gap between the potential and your bottom line results. This is the potential and this is your bottom line results. Most people think that when they realize that this gap exists, that somehow learning more about the markets is what's going to fill it. And what you're here today to learn is that that is categorically not the case. You have to learn more about yourself and how you interact with your trading platform and the market to be able to fill this gap. There are psychological skills involved. And then when I talk about psychological skills, we, we, let, let, let's, do, do anybody think of an example of a psychological skill? This, this, this is difficult. I don't think, you know, I'm not saying that you should have the answer, but can you think of an analogy in, you know, in maybe in other parts of the way we express ourselves that you can think of what would be an example of a psychological skill? Anger management. Anger management? Okay, that, good. Anybody else? Okay. What about a situation? And I was just, anybody watch Wimbledon here lately? Just it was on? I, I'm, I'm not a big tennis fan, but I just happened to be watching it. And because I knew that this, I was doing this, this workshop here, this is something that really sticks in my mind. What's the difference between, between let's say, oh, here, this is even a better example. What's the difference between a, bas a pro basketball player who can stand at the free throw line and hit 20 in a row, even 30 in a row, where the thing about the variables are fixed. The line and the basket and the distances, they're all fixed. And they've got the motor skills to be able to hit, like I said, 10, 15, 20 in a row. But they get into a situation where there's one second left and the score is tied and this basket is going to win the game and he chokes. That's a cycle. The guy that doesn't choke has a psychological skill that the other one doesn't. Trading without fear is a psychological skill. It is a skill that the professionals have acquired and that they have evolved beyond the typical mindset or the kind of mindset that the typical trader operates out of. So when we're talking about trading or thinking like a pro, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that you will evolve beyond the typical mindset so that you can take full advantage 
Full advantage. This represents if this line represents potential that you can take the potential of your methodology so that you can take full advantage of your methodology. Because it has to do with your state of mind. In this section, we're going to cover the underlying nature of the mental skills that you're going to be learning. And then at the end of the section, I'm going to put these skills within the context of three developmental modes that you're going to eventually learn to trade in, which would be first the mechanical mode, then the subjective mode, and then the intuitive. Everybody kind of have a good idea where we're going today? Maybe a little bit better of an idea than when you kind of walked in here? Yeah? Okay? So anyway, what I want to do is let's just, let's just go through and take a, a little bit of an attitude survey here, kind of get an idea where you're at. There are no right or wrong answers here. It's just a matter of what you believe about the nature of trading. So if we just kind of money, making money as a trader is primarily a function of analysis. Who would agree with that? Everyone, come raise your hands. It's all right. You raise your hands. So you're telling me that only a few people would agree? Part of it? Okay. Okay. Uh, I often find myself thinking there must be a way to trade without having to take a loss. Come on, be honest. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll let's say I find myself thinking that. There must be a way to trade without taking a loss, right? Okay? Okay. By the way, the first one, one, one of the things, one, I mean, this is, one, this is a primary, uh, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about a lot of making money as a trader is primarily a function of analysis. That, that, that really isn't the case at all, what you're going to learn. In other words, trading is execution. Trading is execution. How, what you decide to do, of course, is analysis. And the problem is that it depends on what you're using your analysis for. If you're using your analysis to avoid the risk, then, then certainly making money is not a function of that because you will, you will virtually consistently lose. But we're going to talk about that more in a little bit, okay? Okay. Uh, I have trouble getting out of a losing trade. Who has, anybody here still have trouble getting out of a losing trade? Okay, that's fine. You won't have that trouble after today. I, I, I'm, <laughs> really, my goal is that when you walk out of here, you will understand in no uncertain terms that there was absolutely, absolutely no reason to hang on to what you will define in advance as a losing trade. Do you find yourself planning trades you never execute and executing trades you never planned? That's a pretty common thing that affect most traders. There's always a cost associated with finding out what the market may do next. It's good to think that. That means you're accepting the risk. That there's a certain amount of I mean, cost, meaning a certain amount of risk involved in finding out what the market may do next. If I were to thoroughly analyze my trading results, I would find that my average losing trade is much bigger than my average winning trade. Well, there's a few people in here that, that might still be falling in that category. It only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of any particular trade. Who agrees with that? Anybody? Raise your hand if you agree with that, please. Nobody raises their hand. Oh, this is big. I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for not agreeing with that because you couldn't be further from the truth. You couldn't be more wrong. This is one of the things you're going to learn. It only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your trade or your edge. That's all. Just one. You're going to learn that today. I wouldn't put on a trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner. Who agrees with that statement? Please raise your hand. Please. Who agrees with that statement? Good. 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 I'm saying good because, because what I'm saying is that, yes, there is a gap here that we're going to have to fill between your particular attitudes about trading now and, and where you're going to end up with, hopefully, by the end of the day. I would answer this question, absolutely not. I wouldn't put on this trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner. I trade, trade from the perspective of I don't know if any trade is going to be a winner. And I, and I don't have to know. As a matter of fact, that is one of the principal, let's say, principal concepts that you will have to adapt to become a consistently successful trader. And what the pros have adapted and the reason why they can do what they do is because they have learned, not just learned, but they believe without a shred of doubt that they do not have to know what's going to happen next to make money. And don't even think about it in those terms. They don't even think about it in those terms. It's not a matter of what's going, going to happen next. When you understand the nature of how technical analysis, how your technical formulas and your mathematical formulas interact with market behavior, 
and what they can and can't do and what their inherent limitations are, you will also understand that I wouldn't put on a trade if I wasn't sure it was going to be a winner is absolutely one of the, one of the worst mistakes you can make to be a consistently successful trader. It is. In fact, it's probably the number one. Kind of perplexing at this moment? Yes? Good. Okay, I always define my risk before I enter a trade. Is everybody here in this room at the point where they always predefine their risk? Who doesn't? Raise your hand. Please raise your hand. I want to know where everyone's at. Come on. It's all right. Okay. Sometimes I find myself blaming the market for what went wrong. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Does anybody, anybody feel betrayed by the market ever? <laughs> Any, anybody ever feel betrayed by their, by their, 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 their signal, their technical signal? or whatever methodology that they use. We're going to talk about that in, in detail, too. The more a trader learns about the nature of the markets, the easier it will be for him to execute his trades. Who thinks there's a correlation there that the more I learn about the nature of markets and price movement, the easier it will be to execute your trades? Who thinks there's a co positive correlation there? Okay, again, couldn't be further from the truth. There's a negative correlation there. The more you learn, the harder it's going to be to execute your trades. To be, it depends on why you're learning it, of course, but we'll get into that. To be a successful technical trader, you have to determine what the market is going to do next. I already said that's not the case, so, so you'll, you'll know how to answer that one. But, but if I hadn't said it, how would you have answered it? Who would have said yes if I hadn't have already told you guys? A couple people? And you came to Houston? Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, trading skills. Who are the professionals? We already talked about that. And why would it be beneficial to think like a professional trader? We already talked about that. What's the answer? Ah, anybody can make money, okay? We kind of already established the fact that anybody can make money as a trader. Consistent. Yeah, we're talking about consistency. What we want to do is we want to close that profit gap. We want, to, we want to make sure that our bottom line results reflect the potential of our methodologies. Okay? And that's what the professional has learned how to do. The professional has learned how to close that profit gap. They have learned the appropriate skills to do that. They're people just like you and me, okay? They're no different. They really aren't. They've evolved into a different way of thinking about trading. That's the reason why they can do it. And you can do it too with understanding and awareness. That is really primarily what this workshop is about anyway. Because, because when you think about it, if you've read stories of people who, who have, have aspired to greatness in the, as a trader, you'll always find, with well, almost all of them, that there's this underlying thread, this underlying theme that, that virtually all of them have lost one or more of what they considered a fortune before they started becoming consistently successful. Why do you think that underlying thread or theme exists in their lives? What's that? Why do you think that commonality exists? Because at some point they lose so often and then come back from losing that one, they gain the confidence that they can do it and as a result, the fear dissipates and as soon as the fear is gone, they're trading from a carefree state of mind and when you trade from that carefree state of mind, everything about your trading changes. Remember that the primary skill that we're talking about here is simply trading without fear. This is a trading skill. It is the primary skill that you will have to acquire to create consistency, to trade without fear. What does uh, consistency look like? I've already went through on the, on the grease board here and showed you a uh, consistently rising equity curve with, with the drawdowns, the normal drawdowns being a reflection of what? Can anybody remember what I said about that? What, what that? Normal losses that reflect any trading methodology, right? Okay, what skills are necessary to experience a winning trade? Now, think about it. Now, I'm going to contrast, okay? I'm going to do a little bit of contrasting here. Just to, just to show you one of the reasons why it can be so difficult to get even into a frame of mind where we start asking the, the appropriate questions about what do I need to really be consistently successful? Because what does it really take to experience a winning trade? What skills do you need? Anybody got any idea? 
What skills do you need to experience a winning trade? What? What's your name, sir? Maurice. Maurice says a click of the mouse. Who's who's with Maurice on that? Come on, who's who's with Maurice on a click of the mouse? Got one, two, anybody else? Three, four. He's absolutely right. That's all it takes. There are no other skills needed. No other skills needed other than the actual physical ability to put your finger on the mouse button and click in the buy or the sell, and you can find yourself in a winning trade. You can find yourself in a, in a spectacularly winning trade far beyond what you could have ever imagine. And what skill did it take? What, what did it take? This, uh, just doing it, that's all. Just doing it at that, at that moment. Do you need an edge? Do you, need to ha do, you even, do you even have to know, even know what an edge is? Is it possible to just be, to, to walk up to your computer and the arrow happened to be on the buy button, you click and then find yourself in a winning trade? You didn't have an edge, did you? You just clicked it. What did it take? It took nothing. Do you need a plan? Need no plan. <laughs> Do you need the discipline to execute the plan? No, you don't need that either, do you? Now, see, you're going to see the, the opposite of all this, of course, is, is what we're going to be talking about in terms of creating consistency. But go ahead. What you're saying is a blind squirrel will, catch, will eventually find a nut. Sorry. What you're saying is a blind squirrel will eventually find a nut. Did you say a squirrel? I'm sorry, yeah. squirrel. Squirrel. You, squirrel. Okay, squirrel. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I can click a mouse. You know, the arrow hits the buy, I click, I get a great trade. I'm gonna, that's good. It's all the things that lead up to me. That's the implementation. But what about all the things that lead up to that implementation? Oh, I understand. I'm not, I'm not negating that at all. I'm just saying that, 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 that the reality is you don't need anything. That's all I'm saying because I'm contrasting here. I'm just making a contrast between what you need to be consistent and what you need to win. Oh, okay. That's all I'm doing, okay? Now you just summed that up with what I was about to say. There's all the difference in the world between having the skills necessary to experience a winning trade as compared to having the skills necessary to consistently experience a winning Absolutely. Trade. That's what I'm that's all I'm talking about here because see there's because what this does is this the, the not understanding this contrast creates what I call like a huge psychological gap. Because if you don't because it's very easy for us to think that trading is easy. And if you believe that trading is easy, even if, you're get, even, if, even if all your experience is starting to tell you that it's not, it doesn't mean that that experience is dropping down to a level of realization where you change your behavior or change the way that you think about trading. If your first impression, if your first experience was that this couldn't be simpler. And then you spend, you know, how many X number of years or half a lifetime finally coming to the realization that, you know what? Yeah, to, to win. Like, what do you need? Like, I could, I could be in a casino and, and plunk a $100 bill down you know, at a blackjack table and, and end up with a blackjack. What did I need? I, nothing. I just happened to win. Now, if I want to be a professional blackjack player and make a, make a consistent income from playing blackjack, well, that's a, that's a whole other matter isn't it? And we're talking about the same things here with trading. There would be a number of skills that I'd have to acquire to be able to make a consistent, reliable income as a blackjack player. And there are people who do it. Do you need a good reason to put the trade on to win? Do you need a good reason? No, not at all. What characteristics distinguish the pro from the typical trader? Well, they plan their trades. No. Oh. They execute their plan without error. Ah, we'll talk about trading errors in a minute. Big difference. Okay, they can move in and out of their trades with an ease and effortlessness that would boggle the mind of the typical trader. Okay, what do you need to achieve consistent results? Well, you're going you're gonna to need an edge. You're going to be able to identify an edge. You're going to have to have a trading methodology, are you not? Right? Okay? And you have to have a plan on how to utilize that edge. In other words, you're going to have to determine risk parameters, 
how much does it cost me to find out if this particular edge that my methodology provides me, how much is it going to cost? To, how much is it going to cost me to find out that this edge is working on this particular trade or not? That's your risk parameter. Are you guys with me on this? Okay. Money management parameters. In other words, how much? Your, your, in other words, contract size or number of shares that you trade. All these have to be. All this has to be taken into consideration. You could have a standard amount, or you could have an amount that fluctuates based on you know based on other criteria that you use, you know, to determine you know the, the level of trade that it is. Like it could be like a five star trade or a one star trade. With a five star trade, you go in with a maximum position. With a one star trade, you go in with a minimum position. And profit objectives. You have to be able to set profit objectives. See, just having a methodology to get you into a trade is not enough. You have to be able to determine what the risk is on a consistent basis. You have to know, you have to know what your money management parameters are. And you have to be able to determine where to take profits. These, none of these are easy things to do, are they? Trade execution. The ability to execute trades flawlessly so you can utilize your trading plan to its maximum potential. This is, this is the big one right here. This is the area because when you get right down to it, trading is about ex trading is execution. The act of trading is executing trades. And if you're going to execute trades, you're going to have to be able to do them without errors. Because it just it doesn't make any sense to think that you will that you will achieve a consistently rising equity curve if you're constantly making trading errors. Trading errors would be defined as mistakes. Mistakes that detract from your bottom line results. Now the interesting thing about mistakes is that when you're when you're trading from the let's say the perspective of you know, it doesn't really take anything to win, then there really aren't any mistakes that you can make because anything that you do could, end, could result in a winning trade for any reason. But when we're talking about making consistent money or an income that we can rely on, then everything changes about this. Everything changes. What I'm talking about here is I'm talking about these like five or four broad skill sets. To be able to create consistent results, the kind of results that you can rely on as an income, you're going to have to learn an edge. You're going to have to acquire a trading methodology that gives you an edge. I'm defining an edge as that there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another. That's what an edge is. And you're, we're going to learn the nature of probabilities here in a moment. You're going to have to have, you know, you're going to have, to, uh, have a plan on how, do you, how you utilize that edge, meaning what the risk is position size and profit objectives. Then you're going to have to be able to execute, you're going to have to get to the point where you can execute that edge without making errors. For you to be able to execute that edge without making errors, you're going to have to learn how to trade from a carefree state of mind, meaning you're going to have to aspire to the point where you can trade without fear. And to trade without fear, you're going to have to learn how to think in probabilities. That's basically where we're going here. And I said this primary skill was learning how to trade without fear. Learning how to trade without fear is a function of learning how to think in probabilities. Meaning we're going to, we're going to set aside or move from thinking in a trade-by-trade -trade mentality. In other words, what this trade is going to do for me right now, am I right or wrong on this trade, and we're going to move to a series of trades perspective. Because that's what your methodology does anyway. Any trading methodology just gives you a, a win or loss ratio over a percentage of trades. In other words, if I take the same, take the same criteria that's in any kind of mathematical, any kind of technical formula that's mathematical ba mathematically based, or, or a, a, a technical price pattern that you would be able to see visually, what we're going to learn is that my edge, meaning a higher probability of one thing happening over another is simply going to give me a higher win rate over a series of trades. Let's say the next 20 trades. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And that the actual, on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, I don't know which one's going to win or which one's going to lose in advance. There is no way for me to find out. There's no way for me to determine that. 
that on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, no matter what reason or rationale that you come up with, is that there's no way to assure yourself that it's going to be a winning trade. There's nothing that can tell you that. That trading methodologies give you a win percentage, let's say 70% of the next 20 trades are going to be winners. There's no way I'm going to know which of the 70, you know, which, which 12 or 13 are going to be the winners or which six or seven are going to be the losers. What you're going to learn, and this is what traders, what pro, the pro professionals have learned, is that there's a random distribution between wins and losses over any given set of criteria that define your edge. There's a random distribution. I will get a higher percentage of wins to losses, but I just don't know which trades are going to be. It requires a complete shift in the way you think about trading. When you make this complete shift, everything about your trading will change. Now, I'm expecting you to make it now because I'm just still get, I'm still, we're still in the introduction. We won't really get into the meat of this until a little bit, but this is, this is where we're going, okay? That's all I want to get. This is where we're going. You're going, to, you're going to genuinely learn how to think in probabilities because when you've integrated, when you have genuinely integrated these concepts into your mental system at a functional level, your fear will go away. You do not need to lose everything to get to the point where you can figure out that, well, you know, I've got nothing to lose anymore, so I don't have anything to be afraid of. You don't have to do that, okay? You don't have to do that. All you have to do is commit yourself to learn how to think about trading in another way, and your fear will go away. Because what we're going to learn is the correlation between what we believe and what we feel. There's a direct correlation between if I'm going into a situation with a certain belief that, let's say, that my particular edge is going to tell me what's going to happen on this trade right here, I wouldn't even put this trade on unless I thought it was going to win. When you really understand the nature of price movement, which is what we're going to get into after we go through this section on, on skills, when, when you really understand that, you will never think that way again. When you really understand the nature of price movement, you won't think that way again. And that is one of the biggest problems that most, the, the typical trader has. Let's say the typical screen-based trader is that, is that they really don't understand the nature of how prices move and the underlying dynamics because you haven't had the exposure. You're, you haven't had the exposure to, to, to the direct markets. Your only exposure has been those blips on the screen. And as a result, there, there's a real gap in, in understanding about what's really happening. When you understand what's behind those blips, what's behind those photons that show up on your screen, when you really understand that, you will think about trading in another way, in, in a completely different way. It won't even occur to you to do some of the things that you're doing now. It won't even occur to you. Okay, now, so I've got, so we've got, I've given you three so far. The next broad area that you're going to have to learn, it's like, it's like you, can, you can be an expert at, at defining an edge. You can, even, you can even be able to execute your trades flawlessly, and, but run into the next challenge, and that's what I just call self-sabotaging beliefs. In other words... All of us have a sense of self-valuation. All of us have this, this sense that we're, what we're worth as a person, you might say. And if, if you were to take like an old Ben Franklin accounting scale, okay, and this is positive and this is negative, meaning if you were to list every experience in your life, if you had, let's say, conscious access to every experience in your life, that contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation, that yes, I am a worthy person. Because what we're running into, but I kind of got ahead of myself, what we're running into is this, is that when you learn how to define an edge and learn how to execute your trades flawlessly, what, what, you're, what you're now exposed to is the possibilities for unlimited wealth. There's really, there's really, not, there's really nothing holding you back. 
Well, let's put it this way. There's nothing on the outside that's holding you back, but there might be something on the inside that's holding you back. Those things on the inside could be self-sabotaging beliefs. In the sense that if you listed all of the experiences that contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation and all experiences that, that, that contributed to a negative sense of self-valuation, that I'm not worthy as a person, I feel guilty about this, 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 and this, that you could end up, you know, you, could, you, go, you, you, go, you can go plus negative or, you know, net positive or net negative. What could end up happening is that if you don't have the, let's say, the skills or the awareness to realize that as your equity curve, as you start making money, these internal forces, if you have net negative, these internal forces start building up to the point where they'll cause you to make unconscious trading errors where you're not even really aware that you hit the sell button instead of the buy button. Those kinds of things. And you have, to, you have to become aware of when these forces are starting to build up inside of you and either compensate for it by not trading, by to stop trading, or to find a way to neutralize them. And there are, there are various techniques available. But all I'm saying is that, is that these kinds of, these kinds of errors that are the result of self-sabotaging beliefs don't really have anything to do with your direct trading skills. In other words, your ability to identify an edge and your ability to execute your trade. But they can have an enormous impact on your equity curve. I would assume to, that you would be monitoring your equity curve and you would start seeing your curve go down in an abnormal way. And you would start looking for your whatever's happening to you. Let's say you're not feeling well or whatever. Uh, uh, your wife just divorced you. I'm just, or maybe yes. something. Yeah, these subtle. are all. Yes, are all good things, right? Things that you're bringing up. I mean, these are things what, that what are all relevant. What I'm saying is, though, the you show two extremes: <clears throat> a normal drawdown, and then the the boom or bust drawdown. There must be some way to know. At least I'm 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 looking for to know when you start looking that you're self-sabotaging. That's my question. Good question. As a matter of fact, there are software programs available now that will tell you that. There are software programs available that will tell you when, in other words, I'll give you an example. There, 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 I'll give you an example. When I was working with traders, with especially like hedge funds managers and, 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 and larger traders, there, there are people, first of all, there are people that, that their, their sole job was if they were, let's say they were central, here, let me think about how important this is. They had, let's say, this is, they're in the middle and they've got, and they've got, let's say, you know, 10 or 12 money managers. These are guys that all have, they're, they're managing funds, okay? This guy's sole responsibility was to shift money from here to here to here to each manager based on chart patterns of their equity curves. In other words, they would chart the equity of these particular traders just like price patterns in the market to determine their potential for inordinately large drawdowns because of self-sabotaging beliefs. That's how sophisticated the market has become. That's how relevant these issues are. So that you can actually chart your equity and then you start to go like this. Oh, well, and then do another one like that. Uh, something's happening here, okay? I mean, it was, it was just, it was really kind of amazing to me when I was working with floor traders especially. I mean, this one guy, this pops into my brain just, just as you, as we're talking about this. I mean, you know, he came in for, for a consultation and he had his worst day in his life ever. Worst trading day, lost more money than what he's ever lost in his life. And I said, well, you know, and, and you know, it's like normally, almost virtually in every case, it, something catastrophic is happening in that person's life. But what was always amazing to me is how much of a disconnect that, that the person would have between the catastrophic event in their life and what they ended up doing as a trader in the market. And I said, well, you know, well, what's going on? And he just, I just said, well, what's going on? And he just, he's kind of, 
And well, yeah, my wife and I had this really bad argument last night, and you know, and I when I left, you know, when I left for the for the exchange this morning, you know, he he slapped his kids around and he kicked his dog, and you know, it's like, and then he came in and had his worst day and didn't make the connection between what you know between what happened, what happened at home and what he did on the floor. I mean, he might have felt completely justified in, with the argument that he had with his wife and slapping his kid around and kicking the dog, but that's, that's what's going on consciously. But let's say subconsciously, you know, everyone has, you know, let's say if a person's relatively normal, not a psychopath, you know, they've got, they've got some sense of, of fairness and, and, he's, and he feels guilty about what he did and he took that guilt out in, in the way he traded that day. The, the market is not a good arena to be doing this, by the way. Okay, this is, this is not a good area to be working these kind of emotional issues out. Go ahead. We, we need the microphone. You want, me to, you want me to put it right here and I'll just, I'll just hand it to him? My next question would be the, the market also changes the patterns of the, or your edge may change in relation to the market. To distinguish between your own troubled state, let's say, and market behavior, uh, I can see that maybe one of these fellows here in the pie there might be using a system that is not as valid as it used to be when the market changes. How would you know if you were the guy in the center whether he was just having a, a, a bad stay with, with whatever's going on in his personal life versus uh, a change in his system in relation to the market. Another good question. You wouldn't know immediately, but upon investigation, you could find out. In, in other words, by just talking to the guy, or what what you or what you do is that see see what you do is you trade in sample sizes too. In other words, when you have a particular methodology that has that has a defined criteria for when you get into a trade, what you do is you trade in a limited sample size so that if you trade in 25 trade sample sizes or like 20 or whatever, what you do is you analyze your results at the end of, that, at the end of a sample size. And if your results are satisfying, then what you do is you take another sample size. If the results are not satisfying, then, then because, you always, because you knew exactly what you did and under what circumstances you did it, you limited your variables, what you do is then you can go back and tweak your variables to see if you can improve your, improve your results. Because, because wh what's your name? Tom. Because what Tom, what Tom was really bringing up is, is the fact that you're right. Because we're taking a limited set of variables, a mathematical formula, to, uh, that, that's a being applied to a dynamic event. And that dynamic event are traders who are acting on their own behalf creating price movement and they basically they create patterns that were the, doing the same thing over and over again but you've got new people coming in with new ideas and old people leaving and as a result these patterns can change over time diminishing the results of a particular edge so what you want to do is you want to make sure that your sample size is large enough to adequately test that edge but small enough so that if the edge is diminishing in its effectiveness you're not losing an inordinate amount of money before you find that out. Does that answer your question? So that's how they find out, okay? Besides that, there are, because there's software available that'll, that'll even tell you now. There's software, yeah, there's software available that'll, that'll track, your, track your edges, or to track your equity in a way that can indicate whether or not you're ready to take a hit. I don't know the name of it, but, you know, because I just found out about it myself, so. What are, the, are some other ways that you can uh, address maybe a emotional problem you might be going through or other things outside of the trading area besides stop trading? Well, when you say there, I mean, there, there are a number of techniques, a number of books available. There's, there's counseling. You know, I mean, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make a recommendation of a particular book later on, you know, when we get into a little bit more detail. But, but uh, you know, it's, it depends on the effect that it has on your trading. I mean, you don't necessarily have to stop trading. But you, all, but you have to make an objective assessment as to, what, as to your state of mind. In other words, you, know, you, you can actually say to yourself, am I in the best state of mind to be trading today? And, you know, and, and the kind of answer that you get back from yourself, you know, if it's relatively objective, it's like if you're really not in the best state of mind because of things that are going on in your life and some troubling aspects that you haven't reconciled, then, but you don't want to stop trading, well, at least you're aware of it. By, in, another, another technique would be by keeping journals. Because most really good traders keep pretty extensive journals over you know, about you know what they're doing and what they're thinking while they're doing it, and then you, you make this assessment so that at least if you're not 
You don't want to stop trading. You still want to put, your, put whatever edges on you have for that day. You scale back. In other words, if your maximum position size is, let's say, 5,000 shares, you're not in the best state of mind, maybe you only want to trade 1,000. Maybe you only want to trade 500. In other words, to take these things into consideration. And you'd be surprised by just being aware of it and taking it into consideration. A lot of times these, these things will, will, will reconcile themselves. I don't, does that help you? Yes, it does. Thanks. Okay. 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 And the last area of the, these, these broad skill sets that we're talking about is develop the ability to recognize if you've crossed the threshold from normal self-confidence into a state of euphoria. <laughs> you guys are laughing. I finally, I finally got some giggles out of you, giggles out of you guys here. What's so funny about this? Anybody want to? Anybody want to want to share? <laughs> what? What's that? You don't want to be in a state of euphoria. No, you're right. I mean, being in a state of euphoria. Let's put it this way: the, the primary, let's say, the, the the primary characteristic of the state of euphoria is that it's a state of mind of complete and absolute risklessness. Everybody get what I just said? You are in a state of risklessness. In other words, you have no ability whatsoever to perceive risk. So if, for an example... If this line right here, if below this line represents normal self-confidence and above this line is euphoria and, and this threshold is different for everybody by the way. I mean, there are certain chemicals that scientists have found that, you know, that, that, flood, our, that flood our mind and our body when we've crossed this, this threshold. I have, I've worked with traders who will flip into a state of euphoria with one winning trade. Okay, usually for most people it takes more than one winning trade. But I have worked with, I have worked with people that they'll flip into a state of euphoria with one winning trade. Now the problem with this, and it's a great state of mind to be in, I mean to be in a, a in, in virtually a riskless state of mind, I mean it's like, hey, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a cool place to be, but the problem is that when we're in a state of euphoria as a trader, we are, I mean it's, it's virtually guaranteed that we're going to make a trading error. And the kind of trading error that we'll make in a state of euphoria usually has to do with position size. So for an example, if you're normal, if you if you normally only trade a thousand shares, in a state of euphoria, it's like, okay, let's let's mortgage the house. Okay? It's like, you know, let's go to ten thousand, twenty, thirty, whatever. Thousand shares. Because you see, you absolutely know for a fact. You wouldn't be putting, on, putting this trade on if it wasn't going to work. See, you know for, you know for a fact. See, because no, you, you don't have any, any ability to perceive risk at all. Now, the problem, even though it could even end, end up being a winning trade. It's not that, it's not that the, the trade might not end up being a winner, but here's typically what's going to happen. If you're a normal 1,000 share trader, and you go up to 10,000 shares... If when you put 1,000 shares on and the market went against you 5 cents a share, wouldn't be any big deal. You got 10,000 shares on when you absolutely knew for a fact that the trade was a winner and it goes 5 or 10 cents against you. It has the potential to flip you into a state of pure, unadulterated terror. instantaneously you'll go from euphoria to a state of terror in one instant because your expectations about what was going to happen were so resolute it creates a psychological shock that puts you in a state of mind freeze mind freeze Mind freeze is when you are conscious of what is happening, but find yourself totally immobilized to do anything about it. 
And so if the market happens to go 10 cents against you but keeps on going, okay, you just sit there and watch completely immobilized while the market takes your money away until finally something flips you out of that and you say, I, you know, you just come back to your senses and you had enough and you get out of the trade. I know that's probably never happened to anybody in this group, but, 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 uh, <laughs> but I've worked with many people who, who it has happened with. <laughs> uh, so, so this is not something unfamiliar to anybody here. The terror part, not the <laughs> It's, it's like going literally from a state of mind. It's like literally going from heaven to hell instantaneously. And keep in mind the dynamics here. It was all based on your expectation. It's all based on your expectation. So you guys have got this? Okay, there's, there's, so when we're talking about consistency, see, this is, goes back to when I was doing the contrast, okay, is that to, to experience a winning trade, you need nothing. I'm not saying that you don't put something into it, but the fact is you need nothing. There's no skills that are required to experience a winning trade. But to experience consistent results as a trader, the kind of results that you can rely on as an income, there are, there are, these are, there are some pretty kind of profound skills that we're talking about, are we not? You've got to have an edge. You've got to have a plan on how to execute the edge. You've got to be able to execute the plan flawlessly or at least without, you know, without a minimum number of errors or otherwise it's going to detract from your results. You've got to be able to recognize when you might have some self-sabotaging beliefs that are, that are rising to the surface to say, hey, you know, this is too much money. Why, have you, why do you think it is that you have probably read in, the, in some of the trading books, I know I'm sure you have read at some point, that someone gives you the advice that when you have windfall profits to stop trading and take a vacation. Why do you think that that advice exists? Why do you think people have written that down? I just gave you the underlying dynamics for why that's true. It's not just the euphoria. No it's, not just, no, it's not the tear afterwards. It's, it's the possibility for self-sabotaging beliefs coming in and saying, I am not worth this much money. Even though it's what I want. It's what I desire. It's what I've been working for. It doesn't mean that you believe you really deserve it. You have to believe you really deserve it to keep it. Or at least recognize that you don't necessarily believe it and don't do anything to give it away. In other words, take a vacation, put it in the bank, let yourself get used to having it, and, and at which point you'll say, you know what, yeah, I, you know, I do deserve this money. And then you'll be less likely to give it away. The, one of the best examples that I, that, I could, that I could give you to illustrate this is a floor trader that I work with. Again, another bond trader, not as big as the other bond trader that I, was, that I, that I referred to earlier. He was the kind of trader who had this reputation as, as, as I mean, being completely consistent. When I, when I met him, he, was, he would make anywhere from, I'd say, fifteen dollars to $20,000 a day. That was his daily, his daily thing, okay? Day in, day out. Fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a day. Never had these catastrophic bad days. That was his reputation. And it was true. And so what did he need me for? Well, he he had hired a bunch of guys to trade his money, thinking that he's gonna it, this is very common. You kind of have a funny look, but this is very common in Chicago where once you become successful and established, what you want to do is, is, is bring in, you know, as many, let's say, bring in young talent that you can, you know, uh, uh, teach your particular techniques and just, you know, multiply what you make based on their efforts. I mean, that's, you know. But the problem is that the guys that he brought into his group, they were, you know, I mean, I don't know how to put it. I, I, want, to be, I want to be nice. I want to... 
uh, they were just they were just basically leeches. I mean, they a lot of them. When I you know talk to them, it's like I don't even. There's some some of them I don't even think wanted to be traders. They just they just saw the opportunity to be able to get money from him for and the opportunity to do something they hadn't done before. And and it was you know it was these were not the kind of people that that you would that you would hire under these circumstances. They weren't really suited for it. In many cases, they weren't really suited for it at all especially to trade down on the floor. So he wanted particular, he wanted ideas on, on how to, you know, how to, how to build this, this group up into, you know, a really successful trading group. And while we were talking one day, we had ordered lunch in, somebody, a delivery person came to, with the lunch, and he, uh, and he was a devout Catholic, by the way. This is, this is a very important part of this. He was a devout Catholic. And he, it's so devout that he carried a rosary with him all the time. He had a rosary in his pocket. And so when he, uh, he, he paid, you know, he took his wallet out of his pocket, paid for the lunch, and he took the change, and he just sort of unconsciously started to put the change in the same pocket with his rosary. And then we realized what he was doing. He took his hand out like that. And I said, well, you know, I say, hey, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I can't put money in, can't, can't have money touch the rosary. And so we started exploring his beliefs about money and his beliefs about religion in relationship to money and certainly his beliefs about the Catholic Church and their beliefs about money. And, you know, once, and it's something he never really thought about. But when he thought about, you know, the Catholic Church certainly doesn't believe that money is dirty. And so why should he believe that money is dirty in that respect? In other words, it's not spiritual to have money in a way that, you know, in a way that it can, in other words, there's a dichotomy in his mind between his ability to, his ability to, to make money in the pit, and yet you would think that in, a, in, a, in this kind of a situation, he would be giving his money away because he felt guilty about having it. Well, he didn't give it away as a trader because he was just too strong of a trader to do it. But he was giving it away in, in, with this organization, the kind of people that he had around him. In other words, it wasn't going out the front door, the money was going out the back door. So he did find a way to, to extract that money about his beliefs about money, religion, the Catholic Church, their beliefs about money, realize the, the, you know, the inconsistencies. And, and so as, as we're coming to kind of reconciliation about this, I gave him an exercise to see if, if in fact, he'd really accepted what it is that we were talking about. And what do you think the exercise was? Come on, what do you think the exercise was? It's not that hard. Go ahead, put some money in that pocket. Yeah, that's right. Put, put, put money in the pocket with the rosary. Put the money and the rosary together. He couldn't do it. He literally, his, 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 his arm, he tried to put the money in, it, it, it was like, it, it got, it got like he could not do it. His beliefs that we talked about were so strong that it literally wouldn't consciously let him do it. But he worked on it. See, he, he wanted to get to the point where he, he recognized the validity of the things that we were talking about, and so he did want to do it, and so he kept on trying. It took him about a week. And once he got the money in with the rosary, he had like all these conflicting beliefs he had about the nature of money and the guilt that he, that he felt over it. it just, they just sort of all melted away, and he fired all these people. <laughs> He didn't even try to make them traders because he realized that they, you know, these were not guys that, you know, that really wanted to be traders. He realized what he was doing. He realized he was just, he was just giving his money away. What gives a professional trader the ability to execute their trades out of error? They are confident, meaning they are no longer encumbered by the same fears that plague the typical trader. Trading without fears is learned mental skills. I've already given you examples of mental skills. Remember what, what did we say about, about the ability not to choke? Okay? Under, that would be an example of a mental skill. Learning to trade without fear, hesitation, or internal conflicts is a function of believing that you don't have to know what's going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis to win or make consistent money. This is, the, this is the heart of it right here, everyone. Okay? This is the heart of it. And again, we're still in the introduction, believe it or not. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to reinforce all this. 
But eventually, what you're going to do is get to the point where you believe that you do not have to know what is going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. This trade, and this particular trade, and this particular trade, you don't have to enter these trades thinking that you know it's going to happen next to win, to make consistent money. And that when you stop believing that, you will start making consistent money. Because it's, the, it's your expectations about this trade winning that's, that's going to mess you up. Go ahead. What you're really saying is you have to have a belief in your plan or your methodology and you're looking for a probabilistic result saying, over a period of time, I will execute 60, 70, 80 percent of my trades. The one I'm going into now could be a good one, could be a bad one. That's right. I don't care. That's right. Exactly right. Perfect. Thank you. This is where we're going. Okay? Thinking, assuming, or believing you know what will happen next creates an unrealistic expectation in a, in a specific outcome. What's wrong with an unrealistic expectation? Well, think about, let's say, expectations in relationship to the, the characteristics of humanity. You can, this cuts across all, everybody, and cuts across all cultural, all cultural lines or barriers. Everyone, it, well, first of all, before we get, get to that point, what is an expectation? An expectation is a mental representation. In other words, a belief, an assumption, or an opinion, or whatever, thinking, assuming, or believing, a mental representation of what the next moment, meaning next moment, next five seconds, or the next in 10 seconds, or the next hour, or whatever, is either going to, in the environment, in other words, we have a mental representation, and we have an external environment that expresses itself, okay? So my mental representation, meaning my expectation, if the, if the environment shows up in a way that is consistent with what I believe, then what, it, what, will, what will my state of mind be? This is a universal characteristic of humanity. This isn't any different with anybody, anywhere. How will I feel? What will be my state of mind? What will be my experience? I'll be in a state of satisfaction, a state of well-being. I could be joyous. I could even end up in a state of euphoria. The degree to which the environment does not express itself in a way that's consistent, what I, the way, consistent with the way I think it's either going to look like, sound like, taste like, smell like, or feel like, okay? I will be in a state of dissatisfaction. A state of betrayal, disgust, anger, fear, terror. Your ability to create consistent results as a trader is all about what you expect. When you change your expectations to be consistent with the way the environment, the market environment exists, the fear will go away. When you change your expectations in a way that's consistent with the way the actual market environment exists, your fear will go away. And you'll be able to do exactly what you need to do when you need to do it without conflict, without hesitation. and be able to close that profit gap between what your methodology will give you and what you end up with in your bottom line. Unrealistic expectations cause us to define and interpret and therefore perceive market information as threatening. Ultimately, we can, look at, we can break the market down to its lowest definable component parts. If we break the market down to its lowest definable component parts, what we end up with is up and down ticks. Okay? An uptick, an uptick is one incremental price change where the price moved from one to two, from two to three, four, five, six, whatever, and then down ticks. Okay? When we're operating out of unrealistic expectations, we're going to tap into four primary trading fears that will cause all the errors that we make as traders. 
Those fears are the fear of being wrong, losing money, missing out, and leaving money on the table. And those fears will actually cause us to perceive these up and down ticks as threatening. And what we're going to learn about the nature of fear a little later is that fear will cause us to focus on the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experience we're trying to avoid. Therefore, if I'm trying, if I'm afraid of being wrong, I will actually perceive this information in a way that causes me to be wrong. If I'm afraid of losing, I will perceive these up and down ticks in a way that will actually cause me to lose. If I'm afraid of missing out, I'll actually create the experience of missing out. And if I'm afraid of leaving money on the table, that's exactly what I'll end up doing. Now, when you think about the nature of these up and down ticks and the photons that appear on your computer screens, is, is, there, is there an inherent characteristic in that information that's threatening in any way? In other words, is it, is it information, is it, in other words, when we talk about the nature of emotional pain, which is, which is the threat of pain, okay, the, the fear, not physical pain, where we have, a, 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 all of us have <coughs> a normal nervous system, and we come into contact with a physical object, object, you know, if I hit this with my arm, it's going to hurt. If you hit it with your arm, it's going to hurt. So, so we've got some universal commonality. But with emotional pain, it's not that way at all. Although we think that it is, it's not. Because <clears throat> emotional pain requires an interpretation. And then interpretation comes from what we believe. You guys with me on this, on the interpretation part? Because, see, the information itself, the up and down ticks, have no charge to them whatsoever. They're not positively or negatively charged. They're just up and down ticks. That, based on your ability to read those up and down ticks, tell you what the, what the potential is for the market to move in any particular direction. If you're perceiving them as threatening in some way, that's definitely going to cause you problems when it comes to creating consistent results. In fact, you're going to find it impossible. Okay, let's talk about some typical trading errors. The typical trading errors, the professional has evolved beyond. Don't define the risk in advance of putting on a trade. Why in the world, now of all the trading books that you've ever read, out of all the workshops you've probably been to, I'm sure that you have been exposed to this particular piece of advice countless times. And yet, it is, it is the primary trading error that people commit all the time. They don't predefine the risk in advance of putting on a trade. If you don't predefine the risk in advance, you're operating out of the mindset that you think you know it's going to happen next. And what I'm going to establish from you when you establish for you when we get into the next section is that that is absolutely not the case. It doesn't mean we don't think that, but the reality is it isn't the case. See, because when we, have, when we predefine our risk, let's put it this way. If, if I'm a typical trader operating out of the four fundamental fears, the fear of being wrong, the fear of missing out, losing money, etc., we've got a real problem here because our minds are naturally wired to associate. In other words, they automatic, our minds will automatically make connections, meaning this, that if I, if, I'm, if I get into a trade and I end up being wrong. I expect it to win, and I'm wrong. I have to admit that I'm wrong. It isn't just admitting that I'm wrong on this one trade. Our minds, because the way our minds are wired, it has the potential to tap us into the accumulated, the accumulated, the accumulated negative energy of every time I've been wrong in my life. Okay? So if this circle represents a huge ball of negative energy inside of our mental environment about what it means to be wrong. Being wrong on just one trade could tap us into that pain. 
and it's going to work differently for everybody. Everyone's mind works, works a little bit differently, but that's the potential. If you wonder why people seem to live and die on the outcome of the next trade, this is one of the reasons why. This is why it's so important. Because it has a, the potential to tap us into the accumulated negative pain of every time we've been wrong in our lives. Every time we've lost something in our lives. Every time we've missed out on an opportunity that we didn't take advantage of. Every time we've been on, in an opportunity and didn't get the maximum amount that was available. Those are the four fears. So the problem with predefining our risk is this is that if I'm afraid of being wrong and I don't know how to think about trading appropriately in a probabilistic mindset, I'm not going to get into this trade unless I think I'm right. And the problem with predefining the risk is that it requires that I gather evidence as to why it might not work. Predefining your risk requires that you gather evidence as to why it might not work. Well, I wouldn't even be getting into it in the first place if that were the case. So I'm, I'm going to gather as much evidence as possible to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Because if I start gathering evidence as to why it might not work, then I might talk myself out of taking the trade. And then if I end up talking myself out of taking the trade and it turns out to be a winner, I'll probably be in more emotional pain than what I would have been in had I taken the trade and it turned out to be a loser. So I just make sure that I've got all my ducks in a row and I don't take the trade unless I do. And therefore, what I have done, now think about this, what I have essentially done is define the risk out of the trade. I've gone through a mental process in which I have literally defined the risk out of the trade. Why do I have to put a stop in the market and predefine my risk if I know I'm going to win? A professional trader just doesn't think that way. They would not, I'm not saying that they never thought that way. I'm not saying that, that they didn't experience the exact same thought process that I just took you through. I'm saying they have evolved beyond it. They would never allow themselves to get into a trade without predefining the risk. In other words, what does the market have to look like, sound like, or feel like to tell me this trade isn't working? The next error, define the risk, but don't take the loss, and it turns out to be a bigger loss. That's probably, again, probably one of those things that never happened to anybody in this room, but <laughs> just in case someone watches the DVD where this sort of thing has happened, I, I included it. <laughs> Same dynamics, basically. Hesitate, get in too late. Why are you going to hesitate? Why are you going to hesitate to get in? If, you're, if the criteria that you use to define an, edge, define an edge is present in this moment, why would you hesitate? Because you don't think the trade's going to work. You have doubt. In other words, you are either thinking, believing, or assuming that you know what's going to happen next. Think of the connection here. You couldn't hesitate unless you either assumed, think, or believed that you know what's going to happen next. If you operate out of the perspective that you don't know what's going to happen next, I don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money, then there's no point in hesitating. Jump the gun. Get in too soon where the signal never actually develops. Coming off of a winning trade. You're going to jump the gun when you come off a winning trade or a series of winning trades, right? <coughs> And you're just so excited about what you see developing. Eh, the signal isn't quite there yet. But you know what? Let, let's get in before everyone else. And you never actually get a signal. That's a trading error. Now see, the, the point, that doesn't mean that you couldn't win. See, what you're going to find is that when you trade on what I call a trade-by-trade -trade basis, so we're going to make, the, we're going to make the, the distinction between trading trade by trade and tra trading over a series of trades. When you trade trade by trade, it means that each individual trade is like a life or death thing. In other words, I, I wouldn't be putting this trade on if I didn't think this trade was going to win. Not that, not the other, the, 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 um, the opposite of that, was, which is, 
I'm going to put on the next 20 trades because I think that 70 or 75% of them or 50% of them are going to win. There's a huge difference in perspective. So if you're coming off a winning trade or a series of wins, you're likely to jump the gun. But the interesting part about all this is that each one of these errors that I'm giving you could all result in a winning trade. You could do every single one of these things and still win. You could not predefine your risk and still find yourself in a winning trade. You can hesitate and find out it's exactly, exactly the right thing to do in that moment. You can jump the gun and find out it's exactly the right thing to do in that moment. You can not take your loss and the market comes back in your favor. All these errors that we're talking about, you can commit over and over again, and they could end up having, you could end up experiencing positive results. Except one thing, one thing, is that when you indulge yourself in behaviors, in these kinds of behaviors, it could lead to usually, a, no, but not could, it virtually every time leads to a catastrophic loss. Catastrophic. You put on a trade without predefining your risk three or four times in a row and turns out to be a winner. And then the next one, you don't do it. That's the one that's going to be the catastrophic loss. See, so on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, you can do anything for any reason and commit any error or what would be considered an error in the perspective of trying to create consistency and still win and still have winning streaks and still have a lot of fun. But you're setting yourself up for catastrophic losses. Get out of a winning trade too soon and leave money on the table. There's, there isn't a trader alive who hasn't experienced that. Let a winning trade turn into a loser without having taken any profits. All these errors are the result of Thinking, assuming, or believing that we know what's going to happen next. Move a stop closer to an entry point, get stopped out, and the market trades back in your favor. In other words, what would that tell you? If, you, if you're here, if you buy at this price right here, and you put your stop here, this is, all you're really saying is that this is, this is how far I'm going to let the market trade against my position to tell me that this trade is either not working at all, or that the potential for it working is so diminished that it's not worth me staying in any longer. And then the market starts to drift down to your stop. And then you move your stop up and again get stopped out. And then the market does this. What would that tell you about your attitude? What? Yeah, and you hadn't accepted the risk of that trade, did you? See, see, people can put stops in the market. It doesn't mean they've really accepted the risk. You can put a stop in the market, but it doesn't mean you've genuinely accepted the risk. This would tell me, someone came to me and said, Mark, this is what I did. This is what I know. I know that you didn't accept the risk of that trade or you wouldn't move the stop. What? Yeah, you can move it the other way too, you know. Yeah, because you, well, that's because you don't want to admit you're wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> The professional trader is no longer susceptible to these typical trading errors because he's learned to think in probabilities. When you understand the relationship between how prices move and the mathematical formulas and price patterns that make up a trading methodology, patterns that make up a trading methodology, quantifies that movement into tradable edges, then why you have to learn the skill of thinking and probabilities will become self-evident. In other words, when we get through the next section, the way you need to think, I want you guys to be at a point where it just becomes completely self-evident as to why you need to think in probabilities to make consistent money. It'll just make sense. It's just like, oh, yeah, okay. This makes absolute sense. The three developmental modes of trading. Now, I, I gave you the broad skill sets that you have to learn to, to create consistency. Well, within w those broad skill sets are within the three, what I call three developmental modes of trading. There's mechanical trading, subjective trading, and intuitive trading. There's three stages. In other words, in mechanical, what you want to do is you want to you want to trade with rigid a rigid criteria that defines your edge. All execution decisions are made in advance of market activity. The market either confirms your conforms to your definition of an edge or not, 
and you you execute your you execute your trades based on a plan. In other words, what you're doing in the mechanical mode of trading is you're limiting the number of variables that you're dealing with in the market. Because what you want to find out is this. You want to find out what works and what doesn't. This is where, to find out what works and what doesn't, you can paper trade. In other words, you can, you can actually take a particular trading strategy and methodology and forward trade it with paper trading, or if you've got software that, that does the analysis for you, you can do it that way too. But it's better to probably paper trade it so that you're actually interacting with your particular variables that are defining an edge. So you're finding out what works and what doesn't. If you use an unlimited number of variables to define an edge when you're trading randomly, you never, never find out what works and what doesn't. So you have to learn that. You have to have confidence in that. But the other part of it, too, is finding out whether or not your own personal psychology is made up in a way that you can actually execute that edge. And the problem with the execution part of it is that paper trading doesn't cut it. You actually have to have money on the line. And so what you do in the mechanical stage is that you use the mechanical stage as a means to learn trading skills. In other words, your focus is on skills and not necessarily on how much money you're making or not making. Because when you've acquired the appropriate skills, the money will simply just be a byproduct of those skills. And then what you do is that if you find that you cannot execute your plan, then you're going to, have to, you're going to have to get into a mode where you learn exactly how to do that, which is what we're going to get into later on. But the point is, is that, that, that what I recommend to people is that if they're having problems executing their trades, in most cases it's because they're probably, they're probably, their position size is too large. In other words, if, they're, if once, they, once they learn that, they, that, that there's a, a specific regimen in which they can learn to be consistent, you know, what they want to do is they want, they, want, they want their cake and eat it too, sort of. In other words, they want to learn the techniques, but they don't want to cut themselves off from still making a lot of money. When the reality is they don't have the psychological skills to be able to execute trades based on the way they were trading before. So if they were a 5,000 share trader before, they'll set up these exercises that we're going to talk about later on in the afternoon with 5,000 shares and then, and then completely blow it and can't do it. The reality is their psychological makeup is such that they may only be able to trade, do it, and do it flawlessly with 10 shares. So I work with people who had to go down to one. To be able to execute it flawlessly, they had to go down to one share. And then they work their way up. And then they go to two, and then they go to five, they go to 10. And they just work their way up. I mean, is there anybody in this room who hasn't paper traded? And who, is there anybody in the room who hasn't experienced being able to execute your trades flawlessly on paper? But that when you, when you try to execute your plan with real money, it, it doesn't work? See, the plan's, the plan's working, you're not working. This is what mechanical trading is all about, okay? Mechanical trading is finding out just how big that gap is. You cannot take for granted that because you recognize an opportunity to enrich yourself in some way, that you have the skills to be able to take advantage of it appropriately. You can't take it for granted. And most everybody does. So mechanical trading gives you all this information. It gives you, it tells you what works and what doesn't in the market and what works and what doesn't with you. so that you know what you need to focus on to be able to make consistent money. You guys, you guys with me on this? Yes. Is it making sense? Okay, then you can evolve, if you want, to the subjective stage of trading, because you can make consistent money trading mechanically. Okay, that's, I mean, it's, but most people like to be able to use their, their rational thinking and process and try to figure things out. And the subjective stage of trading is simply, this is a broader, more flexible mode of trading where you use everything you've ever learned about the price movement to determine your edges. In other words, you know, all the different patterns you've learned, all the different nuances of, 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 of market behavior will determine, you know, where you get in, how much profit you take, where you set your stops. You see, in the subjective mode of trading, in the subjective mode, if someone said to me, okay, uh, I'm buying here, 
and my stop is here, but the mark is starting to come down to my stop, and I get out right here, and I don't let my stop get, I don't let myself get stopped out at my original spot. And it truly, for someone who's evolved in the subjective mode of trading, that's all right. You can do that. Because you're, you're not doing it out of fear, or you're not doing it out of the fact that you haven't accepted the risk. You're doing it because you recognize the pattern that the market is giving you is such that there's a high probability you are going to get stopped out, and so therefore, you might as well just scratch your trade or, or, or get out with, it with a little bit of a loss. It's not because you're afraid. There's a huge difference. You guys with me on this? And then, the last stage is the intuitive. This is the most advanced mode of trading. It would be the equivalent to getting a black belt in martial arts. It's when you find yourself in the zone, tapped into the collective consciousness of the market, giving you a sense of the flow. If you look at the market as being, you know, a collection of individuals, you can tap into that. You can find yourself. It's not something you can will yourself into. You just find yourself in, the, in this zone where you're just seeing and doing things that you can't necessarily explain at a rational level. And the problem is that there are people, everyone has intuitive capabilities. There are, but, but some people it's completely shut off. And with others, you know, they don't trust it because, you know, they, 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 don't, they can't make the distinction between what's intuition and what's just their mind hoping that something's going to happen or hoping that, you know, what they see is, is, is really what's going on and making it feel like intuition. The problem is, until you've acquired these fundamental skills that we're talking about, you definitely don't want to be trading based on intuitive impulses. You just want to make note of them. When you've got the skills, then find yourself in the zone, then go ahead and do whatever, whatever comes to your brain until you flip yourself out of it. Meaning, when you start thinking at a rational level, you mostly just, you flip yourself right out, of the, right out of the zone. Because your rational mind wants to know, wants reasons. Your rational mind wants logical reasons, and these intuitive impulses don't come from that part of your brain. They come from that creative part of your brain. And by definition, creativity is bringing something forth that didn't previously exist. It may exist somewhere in the world or in the universe somewhere, but it didn't exist in your mind. And it's outside the parameters of what you already believe. So there's going to be an instant conflict between what you think at a rational level and your intuitive impulses until you train your rational mind to accept your intuitive impulses. Got that? <laughs> In this section, we're going to discuss how prices move and who the players are behind it. When you understand how traders make prices move, then how you need to think to generate consistent results will start to become clear to you. Okay, where we're going now? Is that, is that, I think what I said when we, you know, just before the break, is that when you guys understand the nature of price movement and how any technical methodology that's based on a mathematical formula or a price pattern interacts with that movement, when you understand that relationship, how you need to think will become self-evident. Do you remember me saying that? Okay, this is the part that we're going into right now, okay? In other words, where you understand just exactly how prices move. Because what I found in doing these workshops over the years, is that here I'm, I'm, I'm addressing a group of people who trade, and who in many cases have traded for years, and if you ask somebody exactly how do prices get from one price to the next, they can't tell you. They don't know. They don't know how it happens. And maybe you guys are, I'm sure you guys aren't, aren't that group. But we'll, you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll go over it just as a refresher, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it as a kind of refresher. So, <laughs> oh. no, actually, I haven't, I haven't addressed a group yet that, that there were very few people, or if anybody, could tell you exactly how prices move from one price level to the next. So for an example, okay, if the last reported price that you see on your screen of something is 10, how does it get to 11? 
What? They asked 12. Who's they? Uh, market maker. The market maker, market maker asked 12, okay. Well, no. Well, okay, it's at 10. How does it get to 11? How does the price actually move to 11? More buyers. More buyers. Well, more buyers, but that, okay, that's true. But then again, when you, when you, what's that? Demand. Demand, okay. But when you look at 10, what you have is you have offers at 11 and you have bids at 9, right? Everybody understands that? Okay, now, there's only two ways that anybody can make money in this business. There's only two possible ways, no matter what strategies you're employing, no matter how elaborate they are, no matter how simple they are. You have to be able to buy something at a low price and sell it back at a higher price, or sell something at a high price and buy it back at a lower price. Are we in agreement on that? And would you also agree that Everyone that trades is trading to make money? Yes. In other words, I'm going to say that there isn't anybody who puts on a trade that does so knowingly and consciously thinking it's going to be a loser. In other words, when they go into the market and say, I, my purpose is to lose money. Okay, you guys with me on this? Now, if the only way that you can make money is to buy low and sell high, or sell high and buy low, and the last price, posted price, is 10, which represents the value at that moment, then what's low? 9 is low, and what's high? 11. What's the only way that it can get to 11? Somebody, somebody thinks 11 is a good price, meaning that they have to buy high relative to the last price, right? So for an example, so, so basically what this also means is that, that all the offers have to be taken out at 10, do they not? Anybody who had an offer in at 10 that wanted to sell at 10 will get filled and all those offers have to be taken out for the price to go to 11, correct? And of course, and for the price to go to 12, all the offers that exist at 11 have to be taken out so that someone could actually bid the price up to 12. For prices to move, somebody literally has to bid the market up. Or for prices to go lower, it means that someone has to offer it lower. Now, if the only way that anyone can make money is to buy low and sell high and sell high and buy low, why in the world would anybody bid the market past the last posted price? Conviction. Exactly. Conviction. In other words, what you have is a situation where on every trade, every trade that exists, there are, both, there are two people on both sides of the trade. Even in stocks, there are, there's even someone who's selling a stock, not like a commodity where, where in a futures contract or an options contract, there's two people on both sides of the trade. There's a buyer and there's a seller, and the next tick is going to make one of them a winner and one of them a loser, right off the bat. If you and I... You and I enter into a trade at 10, okay? We enter into a trade at 10. It means that you, in essence, if you're the seller, let's say you, you sold them at 10 and I bought them at 10. The next tick is going to make one of us a winner and one of us a loser. If the next tick is 9, the amount of money that flows into your account is coming directly out of mine. Are you guys with me on this? If the next tick is 11, the amount of money flowing into my account is coming directly out of your account, Okay? So basically what you have is you have two diametrically opposing beliefs entering into every single trade. Every trade that is made, there are diametrically opposing beliefs about what the future is going to be. So again, I'm going to say, what would cause anybody to buy high or sell low? Just conviction. In other words, what you have is a situation where if someone's willing to bid a market up to the next highest price, basically what that person is doing is that person is stepping out, saying that my conviction that the price is going to go to 12 or beyond is so great that I am willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money. Think about what I just said. I am willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money because my conviction is so strong that the next price will be 12 or 13. Otherwise, this person would wait. 
If this person thought the next price was going to be nine, then they'd buy lower. If they thought it was going to be eight, they'd buy low, they'd wait and buy lower. Whereas, so what happens is that the person who's willing to bid a market up and take out these offers at 10, take out all the offers at 10 and bid it up to 11, has to have a stronger conviction in the future than the person who sold it to him at 11. Because this person is creating price movement, is actually creating movement, and the person on the other side of the trade is being passive because they're doing exactly what they think they need to do, and that's sell high relative to the last price. Are you guys with me on this? Okay, everybody understand it? Now, I want to ask you, is there anybody in this room who has purposefully bid up a market? There are? There are some people who've actually bid a market up? In other words, the people who've actually taken, taken the offers, all the offers out at the next highest price and bid it up? Do people like that exist? Yes. yes. That, so in other words, we are aware of the fact that there are traders who, have both, who both have the financial and the psychological resources to actually purposefully bid markets up or offer them lower. Are we, we're together on this, right? Okay. So basically what you have is that all price movement has to be a result of an imbalance in the degree of conviction between the traders who believe that prices are going up and those who believe that it's going down. That is the only way that prices move. It doesn't matter what the reasons are that people tell you about why they did what they did. Or it doesn't matter what the reasons that you hear on CNBC or whatever about where the market is and why it went the way that it went. Ultimately, it all boils down to an imbalance in conviction. That's the only way prices can move. Because the only way they can move is for someone to actually purposefully bid it up or offer it lower. And for them to do it, there has to be, you know, like, like a, a sense of, of, of strength in terms of energy in their belief that the next tick is going to make them a winner. Okay, so we basically, does everybody understand, everyone's with me on this. All price movement is, is a result of an imbalance in conviction between the buyers and the sellers. Every trade, every trade that's made, there's somebody on both sides of the trade that have diametrically opposing beliefs. You're always having, with every single trade, there's always a clash. There's always a clash in wills and a clash in belief in terms of what the next tick is going to be or what the future holds. We've got two people coming, entering into, in a sense, an agreement by making a trade, but both of those people have diametrically opposing expectations of the future. And one of them is willing to say, hey, you know what? My expectation is so great, is so strong, that I am actually willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money and bid a market up. Now, there are traders who will do that. I call them dynamic traders. They are the people that have, like I said, both the financial and the psychological resources to actually bid markets up. What the typical, and what I'm going to call everyone else, passive technical traders, okay, they've got dynamic traders and passive technical traders. What the typical passive technical trader doesn't really, I'd say, really not aware of or think about is the fact that the only way that they will find themselves in a winning trade is by the actions of the people who are willing to bid a market up and offer, offer it lower. That's the only way that it happens. In other words, when you and I get into a trade, and I am a passive technical trader, by the way. I'm not one of these dynamic guys. I don't bid markets up and offer them lower. Okay, that when you and I get into a trade at this price right here, let's say we got into the, we bought at seven, we're buyers at seven. What are we really saying when we get into that trade? Bottom line, what are we saying? Based on the dynamics of what I just explained, we're saying that I think that someone is going to come into the market after me and buy at a worse price than what I did. That's so, that has such a strong conviction that this market is going to go up, that that person is actually willing to buy at a worse price than me, to buy at 8, to buy at 9, to buy at 10. Because if there isn't anybody else that comes into the market to take out all the offers at 8, take out all the offers at 9, take out all the offers at 10, that market ain't going up. 
and I'm not going to be in a winning trade. You see, the implications are every single trade that we put on as passive technical traders, we are in fact obliged and dependent on other people who are willing to do something at a worse price than what we've done it, we did it at. Or we won't be a winner. Are you guys following me on this? Is it starting to put the idea of trading into a different context? That in essence, what you're really trading is other people's perception of what is high and what is low? That any technical indicator, any price pattern that you might trade, any trade that you put on, you are basically trading other people's perceptions of what is high and what is low. Now, when you think about how well you might know other people's perceptions, you think about it in that context, it might not make a lot of sense to get so fixated on staying in a trade that isn't working. It might be a little easier to put in a stop and to say, hey, you know what? If, they, if, these, if, the, if people aren't coming in to buy at a higher price than me, I'm going to give them this much room from here to here, and if they don't come in, I'm out of this trade. I'll just go to the next one. Because that's basically what you're doing as a trader. You are completely dependent on other, on other traders to make you a winner. Now, who are these dynamic traders? Who are the people that are going to do this and why? What? Hedge funds, okay? Money managers? Uh, in the commodities arena? Do you guys really know how like, the futures markets even started in the first place? Or why they even exist? I know people probably exist because they're on the screen and it's part of the platform, but you know, there's actually a legitimate economic purpose for these things. And when you, when you get to the underlying, when you understand the underlying reason for these markets, you'll, you'll understand why they trade the way that they do and why prices move the way that they do. You know, for an example, what, you know, what, it really, what, what, what happened in the past is that, if, for an example, if you had a farmer who, uh, uh, you know, who planted their, their, their corn in the spring and harvested the, the corn in the fall, what they were dependent on, of course, was a lot of different factors that they had no control of, one of them being the weather and one of them being how much other, how much other corn was planted out throughout the country and how much of that corn would end up end up in, in the market in the fall in relationship to what the demand was. So if there was a lot of corn and, and, and let's say um, the demand remained relatively constant, the price of the corn would go down and the farmer would lose money. If there wasn't a lot of corn and demand would remain constant, the price would go up. If there wasn't a lot of corn and for some reason demand was really high and the price would go up even further. So what you had is a situation where there was a great deal of economic risk in, in being a farmer or being anybody that manufactured anything or, or dug stuff out of the ground like gold or silver or, or manufactured electric motors that needed copper or, or whatever goes into all the products that we use. So what, what evolved was a situation where the, the farmer and the, and the manufacturer, let's say of bread that needed the flour, they would enter into what was called a forward agreement meaning that they both wanted the economic risks taken out of their business. They both wanted to be able to make a profit. They both wanted you know, to be able to, to have some sense of certainty as to what you know, prices might be at some point in the future. So for an example, if, if I'm a farmer and it costs me $4 a bushel to plant my corn and bring it to harvest or bring it to market, then for me to force me to make some money, I want at least five dollars a bushel, right? And if I'm the guy on the other end of that trade or the other end of that transaction that wants to buy that corn in the fall or wheat or whatever, and I want to know exactly how much I'm going to have to pay for it. So what ends up happening is that if let's say it's it's April or it's it's March, and the price of corn is four dollars a bushel, you enter into a forward agreement. With, with, the, with the end user and they say, hey, you know what? I will deliver uh, a million dollars of, or a million bushels of corn or 100,000 bushels of corn at, at say 450 a bushel or whatever price they agree on $5 a bushel regardless of what the price of corn is in the fall. 
So if the price of corn in the fall happens to be uh, $3 a bushel because there's so much demand, or because there's, because there's so much corn and very little demand, then the farmer actually still got his price at, let's say, $5 a bushel, but the, but the manufacturer ended up having to pay $2 a bushel more than what he would have if he had waited and just bought his corn on the open market in the fall. So in that sense, he seemed to lose on that transaction. But then the next year, what ends up happening is that there's very little corn or there's more demand than what there is corn, and the price of corn ends up being $7 a bushel. And the farmer would have made the $7 had he not ordered, entered into a forward agreement, but what ends up happening is he still made his dollar a bushel profit, and the, and the end user ended up saving himself $2 a bushel. So over the years, all this evens out. Well, so then what happened then is that exchanges... In other words, instead of these, these people individually entering into these transactions, exchanges uh, were uh, uh, developed. So in other words, they had a central place to come to and make these transactions, like the Chicago Board of Trade and Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Well, what ended up happening is that when, with the advent of exchanges, what you had is a situation where there were people that were willing to take the other sides of these trades that had nothing to do with the actual process of making bread or growing wheat or corn. They were called speculators. And then that's when futures, futures contracts you know, came into being. So what would happen is that, is that if I'm... If I'm a farmer, instead of me having to make the transaction directly with, a, uh, um, with someone who, who manufactures bread, I could go to the Chicago Board of Trade and sell my corn or wheat with a futures contract. And so if I'm selling it at $4 a bushel, and so that means I'm long corn. This is where the long and the short comes from. I am long cash. I'm long corn and because I've got a crop in, crop in the ground. And so if, um, if I sell it at $4 a bushel on a futures contract, I take the equivalent number of futures contracts. And so if the price of corn goes down, or let's say the price of corn goes up, I've already locked in, well, I'm going to sell it $5, but I've locked in my dollar bushel profit. So if the price of corn goes up, what I've done is I'm short futures. I'm short the actual futures contract. I'm long the corn. So I'm going to lose money on my futures contract. Because as the price goes up, I'm losing money, but I'm making money on my cash. So I'm making the equivalent amount of money on my cash as what I'm losing on my futures. So in any case, it doesn't matter what the market does. The market can go up, the market can go down. I've locked in my dollar profit bushel, a dollar per bushel profit. And the person on the other side of that trade, the speculator, if of course the market goes up, then the speculator is the one that makes that two dollars a bushel profit if it goes up to seven dollars a bushel. Okay, you guys with me on all this? If the price, of course, if the price of, 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 of it goes down, then I'm losing, money. I'm losing money on my cash crop, but I'm making money on my futures contract. And the speculator on the other side of the contract is losing money because the market's going down. In other words, the, the speculator is just one-sided. This, the farmer is two-sided. He is hedged. That's what's, that's what's called a hedge. Now, what's interesting about all this is that, is that as these markets evolved, you will find that, that the farmers don't trade against each other. Or the grain elevators. Or the people who, the commercials who actually are involved with the production and manufacture of anything, they don't take the other side of each other's trades. What they do is they want speculators to take the other sides of their trades. In other words, if I'm a, if I'm a commercial grain elevator, I'm, I'm not going to be, that I'm, another commercial grain elevator is not going to be taking the other side of my trade because we're both going to be doing the same thing. Okay, if I'm a farmer uh, and I'm going to sell, sell my wheat or sell my corn, the guy, the farmer down the street who also trades isn't going to be taking the other side of my trades. What, what commercials and hedgers and fund managers and all the people who are really, let's say, professionals, they have become very, very sophisticated at finding ways of drawing the general public into taking the other sides of their trades. Meaning, and the point that I'm making here, is that they will purposefully do things 
that will draw the typical general public, let's say, the general public into the other side of their trades when in fact what they want to do is the exact opposite. For an example, let's, uh, if, I'm, if, I'm a hedge fund, if I'm a hedge fund manager and, I wanna, and I'm long stocks, or, or it doesn't really matter what it is, I could be long bonds, I could be long uh, gold, I could be whatever it is, and I, wanna, and I wanna liquidate my position. Now, I've got a huge position, meaning I've got a cash position and I wanna sell it. If I go into the market right now and sell my entire position, what do you think is going to happen to the price? Chances are it's going to go down. I'm going to, I am actually going to, because of the volume of my trades, I am actually going to drive the price down, making my average cost lower and lower. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, so for an example, if I come into the market and I say, hey, you know what, I've got uh, 10 million shares of this and that to sell, what's going to end up happening is that those 10 million shares are going to end up taking out all the bids, all the, all the prices down, take out all the bids until you find a spot where it can't take out, where the, where the size of the trade cannot take out any more bids and the price stabilizes. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, now, what you get is you, you got these, what I'm going to call like these, these hot, shot, hot shot kind of uh, uh, hardcore traders where, you know, to make a name for themselves because they're in a, they're in a big trading room and they, they compete amongst one another and their bonuses depend on how well they do. What, they're, it'd be, what, if, what if they did something like this? I'm looking at a price chart. Let's just say they could be daily bars or whatever. Okay. And... This is like a swing high, swing low, okay? Now, interestingly enough, as we're talking about this, I want to make a point about what does, this, what does this price represent right here? And what does this price represent right here? What? Yeah, we're going to call it resistance, but, but, but more from a practical matter, what does it represent? What's that? Nobody believes it's going to go higher. Ah, yeah. In other words, there wasn't... No. You're right. He said, he said that nobody believes it's going to go higher. It represents there wasn't one person in the whole world, in the whole world, that was willing to bid it, bid the price one tick higher. Not one. Up to this point, there could be any number of people who were willing to bid it higher. But it got to a certain price level and there wasn't one person left in the whole world that would bid it higher. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why technical analysis works, is because the market has a memory. This is why technical analysis works. The market has a memory. Because when the market came back down, he formed a swing low, came back up to this high, there were people, there were people who made money by selling this high. There's a good chance those same traders are going to come back into the market and do it again. As well as there are people who lost money by buying that high. Because for every trade that was made up to this last price, there was a buyer and a seller. There was a trader on the other end of the trade that sold, that bought that high. Now when the market comes back again to the this, to this same price level, chances are there will be an imbalance between the buyers and the sellers. Just by the mere fact that the people who made money are going to be willing to trade it again and come into the market maybe with a, with a lot of ferocity. And the traders who lost money by buying that high are probably not going to be willing to do it again. And so what you have is even more of an imbalance that existed the last time. Are you guys with me on this? Okay, well that's fine. You can do that. However, no, I'm not going to really get. I'm just, the most I'm going to do is get into what we're just doing right now because this is not, you know, this is not a course in technical analysis. I mean, it, it, and and it doesn't really matter anyway because you guys are trading off of mathematical formulas, and and not doing subjective trading. So, and this would fall into the category of subjective trading. Subjective trading also is is the equivalent to uh, like uh, like who who watches uh, Texas Hold'em tournaments like on TV. Anybody? Come on, give me, give me more of a show of. So, so you've got so you've got categories of development where where initially people when when they play Texas Hold'em, you play your cards, and then you get well enough, you get good enough at playing your cards. What you start doing is playing the people, 
and you get good enough, you get so good that you don't even have to play your cards. You don't have to look at your cards, you just play the person. That's the equivalent to subjective trading, okay? What you're doing is you're, is you're using a process of deductive reasoning to determine who's thinking what and what they're likely to do. Okay? And all, the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all this information and making this point is so that you understand with, with no uncertain terms that there are as a whole category of traders out there people out there, traders, people who have both the financial and the psychological resources to bid markets up and offer them lower. And what's the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is that any particular technical methodology that you use to determine a pattern is present that gives you a higher probability of one thing happening over another, until you can get into the minds of the people who actually move prices, you will never know for sure what's going to happen next. The only people that know for sure are the people who are willing to do it. And that's what you've got to, you've got to burn that in your brain. You will never know for sure what's going to happen next. Unless you can read the minds of the people who are going to do it. And there are people who will do it. And they do it all the time. That's the only way you end up in a winning trade. Most of the time when you end up in a winning trade is because of what these other dynamic traders are doing. So to convince you that there are people who are willing to do this, if I'm a hedge fund manager and I've got to unload, if I've got to unload a huge position and the market happens to be sitting right here in, in relative to this chart pattern, how might I maximize my profits? What might I do? Now remember, I've got to sell. I'm going to be a seller. But what might I do to make sure that I get the best price? What? Yeah, drive it up. In other words, I will do the opposite of what I want to do to get a better price. And I will drive it up. But how much risk am I taking by doing that? Well, yeah, I mean, if I drive the price up by taking out these offers and then bidding up, Taking out and off, take, in other words, I can look with, with, depending on the kind of software I have, I can find out what depth, uh, the depth of the market, meaning that, that, you know, and I'm not saying these are hard, hard offers because people pull their offers all the time, but I can look at this, I can look at this high and I say, you know what, what if, how much money might it take for me to drive the market from here to just past these highs right here? How many offers do I have to take out to do it? Just tally it up and see if you want to spend the money. Because in essence, how much risk are you actually taking? See, by, by, by driving it up, what you're doing is you're, you're increasing the asset value of your portfolio. So in that sense, you're not taking any risk. You're actually making money. If I, if I continue to drive the price up, I am actually making the trades that I made down here winners. Every tick that I drive the price up, I'm making myself a winner on the trades that I made at lower prices to actually drive a price up because you are making yourself a winner at the prices that, you know, what you bought at lower prices. If, for an example, by me driving this price up, it draws other people into the market, that will help, will it not, because it creates more of an imbalance. Now, that's the real thing. What I want to do is I want to get more buyers into the market. And the reason why I want to get more buyers into the market is so somebody is there to take the other side of my sell orders. Because that's ultimately what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I want to sell. So what I'm doing is creating a bigger pool of, 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 of orders to come into the market so I can sell into so that my, my sell orders don't drive the price down. Down. And so I will purposefully do the opposite of what I want to do, ultimately, with respect to my position. Now, what, the reason why I'm selling has nothing to do with this chart pattern. Absolutely nothing to do with the chart pattern itself. I'm just using the chart pattern as a means to maximize my profits. Now, what if I managed to drive it up to resistance? Chances are there's going to be a lot of sell orders coming in that I'm going to have to compete with. That's, that's a risk, that, I, that's a risk that, I, that, I'm, that I'm taking here. But what if I can drive it a little past that resistance? What I'm going to have is a situation where all the people, the other traders who sold at this level right here that came into the market because it was approaching this previous high, 
they're going to put their stops a little bit above the market. Now, what kind of stops are they going to be? They're going to be buy stops. If they sold to get out at a loss, they have to be buyers. If I can drive the market to those buy stops, I have given myself an instant pool, an instant pool of orders to take the other side of my trades and, and get me out at, at maximum profits. This is typically what you see in a chart pattern as a false breakout. Because what will end up happening is that as soon as my order hits the market, it's so large, and, the, and the, because there really weren't a, that many other traders that were willing to bid, continue to bid the market up, what it'll do is it'll take out all the bids and then drive the price right down. That's called a false breakout. It's, it's being done at different, at different uh, time frames all of the time. To do this, you have to have a large enough position so that when you drive up your cost basis, it's incrementally small compared to where you really are today. Yeah. And then, as you said, you get up to either you do it below that resistance, hope you break above, and then you just dump your shares. Right. Right. Thank you. Now, like I said, th this is... Did, did, did anybody ever wonder why, like, uh, like... You, you have a really strong bull market or a really strong bear market, and the market seems to open up in the morning, like in bull markets it opens lower and bear market opens higher. Like, why does that happen? Well, what's the deal with that? What do you think is going on? You ever heard the term shaking out the weak longs and the weak shorts? That's, that's, what, that's what dynamic traders are doing. They're shaking out the weak longs and the weak shorts. In other words, they're taking their spot. Because what you have in a bull market is you have, you know, people that, you know, the market's going up. This is, this is a daily bar, but if we made it an intraday bar or whatever, as the market is going up, they're buying, people are buying, but they're not, they're not like really confident about what it is that they're doing. Now, in the morning, before the market opens, there might not be that many bids in other words, if the, after the market opens, there'll be more bids that come into the market. But before the market opens, there might not be that many bids. So, what, so if there aren't, what these dynamic traders to, will do to take advantage of this is they'll hit those bids. In other words, they'll sell. They'll sell into those bids, drive the market down. And then when the market opens up, all of the weak longs, meaning people who aren't that confident, will, will, start, to, will start to get a little frightened and to get out of their position, what do they have to do? They have to sell, and these other dynamic traders will take the other side of their sell orders to buy and increase their position, and the market goes right straight back up. All they did was shake these guys out, take their spot at lower prices by, by, by forcing the market lower on the open. Go ahead. Isn't this an argument to have a vi to either not use? Let's talk. No, 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 no. It is not. No, I don't want to get. I don't want to get into the use or not. Absolutely, use stops. I'm not going to. We're not going to get into that. We're yes. You as, as mechanical passive technical traders in the mechanical mode. Uh, this is not in any way saying that you should not use stops. Absolutely, it's a disastrous thing to do. Not use stops. Okay, because I'm not saying that regardless of any of this that you can't make money. You, I'm giving, all I'm doing is giving you examples that there are people out there who will drive prices up and offer them lower, that they have the psychological and financial resources to do it. And the reason why I'm spending, you know, making so much emphasis is that the passive, typ tic, the passive typical passive technical trader would never conceive of, of actually bidding a market up. And so as a result, it's very difficult for you to think that anyone else can do it either. When the reality is that's the only way, in many cases, you're going to make money. And so the point that I'm making is that what you, you're trading off of a mathematical formula. Literally, you're trading. You're, and this mathematical formula, what technical analysis does is it gets into the collective mind of the market. In other words, every tick, every uptick and every downtick is information. That information is accumulated and mathematical principles are applied to it. There are, there are actual patterns that, that, that emerge, that repeat themselves over and over and over again, that you can identify with mathematical formulas or with these visual price patterns. But the problem is, is that there's no mathematical formula that can get into the mind of the individual traders who actually are driving prices up or offering them lower. 
But if you don't know that, you somehow or another, if you happen to, if you're trading on a smaller time frame, you're trading on a smaller time frame and you get a, a, little, uh, a little pullback right here, okay? And based on that pullback, your methodology says, okay, it's time to buy. And you do. And, but, and you do it just before this hedge fund manager comes in and starts driving the price up. See, you're going to think that the reason why you won is because that your mathematical formula told you what was happening next. And that was the reason why it happened. What I'm saying to you now is that there almost isn't any reason that you could come up with, whether you won or lost, that would correspond to what really happened in the market. You hear what I just said? There's almost no reason that you will come up with to put on a trade that will ever correspond with the actual reason why the market went up or the market went down other than the fact that there was an imbalance in conviction between buyers and sellers. Because the people who do this will not tell you unless it's in their best interest to do so. And the reason the people who report it in the news agencies, they don't know either. They're making it up. They make up the reasons because they sound reasonable. They are paid to sound reasonable. And there's no way to verify what it is that they say. That's right. There's no, there's no way. The only people who can do it are the people who actually made the trades. The only people who know for sure what's going to happen next are the ones who are willing to make it happen. You see, we'll put on a trade and find ourselves in a nice monster little winner here and think, oh man, my, my methodology, it is just fantastic. And then the next time you get the same signal, and then you don't get anything. Not only that, it's a loser. You think, oh, now you feel betrayed. You think your, your, your methodology let you down. Your methodology wasn't designed to tell you what's going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. No technical methodology is. That's where your expectations are not in line with the reality of the situation. That's why it's so easy to make mistakes. It's because you're expecting something from your methodology that just doesn't exist. It just doesn't. It never did. On a trade-by-trade -trade basis. They will tell you what will happen. Let's say, I don't want to use the words to happen next. They'll tell you what will happen over a series of trades on a percentage basis. This particular pattern will emerge X number of times, and when it does, there's a higher probability of this happening than that. If I limit my risk when I take the trade and my, profits, uh, my profit potential is at least you know, one or two or three times greater than what I need to risk, then over a series of trades, I will be a consistent winner. That's what trading is all about, guys, as a passive technical trader. Unless you're doing this other stuff, I just said it right then and there. I said it all right then and there. There was a guy that I, the guy that, I, uh, guy that came to me for, for consultations uh, uh, several years ago. Um, he was a, uh, uh, he wasn't really anything. He, he, was, he was a guy that, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he was a guy that lost a lot of people's money. He was basically what he was. He, he, uh, uh, he was actually, he was a really good anal analyst, I should say. Really, he, he, was, he was an excellent analyst. In fact, as far as, as far as market analysis was concerned, he was probably one of the best analysts I'd ever worked with. But the problem is that he had some really, as far as executing his trades, and, and uh, let's put it this way, he, he was, let's say, on the arrogant side. And that's, and that's, and that's, and that's, being, that's, that's being nice. And so when he put on a trade, he just thought that that was it. You know, the market was going to do what he thought it was going to do, period. So he, he was the kind of guy who, you know, he, he went through all of his, re his relatives' money with trading accounts and his friends and that sort of thing, and he was getting to the point where he was really exasperated. So he, he came to me for consultations, and basically after listening to him, I said, hey, you know what? Why don't you do something, get paid for something that you're good at, and, you know, and stop trying to, you know, stop losing other people's money, and go get a job as an analyst. Just get paid to be an analyst, not as a trader. And so he did. He got a job with, a, uh, with one of the major clearing firms at the Chicago Board of Trade as one of their analysts for their brokers and that sort of thing. And uh, the president, or the, actually the chairman of the board, he was, his son was actually the president. He'd, chairman had retired. He was an old-time grain trader, soybean trader. 
and, uh, you know, made his money in the 40s and the 50s and that sort of thing, and, and traded pit-style trading. In other words, it's something that I talked about earlier this morning I'm not going to get into, but in any case, he didn't make direction-related trades. And so, the, so he was really mystified with, this, with the idea of technical analysis. I mean, he really was. He was literally mystified with the idea that you could basically predict prices based on chart patterns and that sort of thing. So he thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sit down with this guy and, you know, this, this star analyst here that we have in the firm now and find out what this, what, what this crap is all about, basically, is the way he thought about it. And um, so he's, he's sitting down with them for a few days, and uh, it got to a point where one day um, you know, the, the soybean market was... Uh, The soybean market was, was basically, you know, trading in a range, about the middle of a range between what the analysts projected as the high of the day. Not just the high, the high of the day and the low of the day, okay? And so the market drifted around, you know, like, you know maybe did a little bit of a close to a test of the high. And it's coming down, to the, coming down to the low. And they're both sitting there and they're both watching it right now. And the, the chairman of the board, the soybean trader, old soybean trader says, okay, so this is going to be the low of the day right here, right? The guy said, yep, that's it. Gets that price, it's the low of the day. Low of the day. And the guy looked at him and he said, that's bull. And he picked up the phone, which had a direct line to the soybean pit. He said, sell 10 million beans at the market. Now, 10 million beans is 2,000 contracts because they trade in 5,000 5, bushel increments. So he hit the market at that moment with 2,000 sell orders, okay, which drove, the, immediately drove the price down 10 cents, which basically is a, is a million dollar trade, by the way. He, he, driving the price, of course, of course if, he'd got, if he'd have sold all of them at this price and bought them all back at this price, but they were, he was, they were, it, there was an average price down, but from here to here is, 10 mil, is a million bucks on 2,000 contracts. And then after the price dropped, he, you know, he, he looked at him and said, hey, if I can do that, anybody can do that. If I can do that, anybody can do it. Now think about the implications of what I just said. If you remember back in that survey that we just took a little while ago and I said, it only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your edge. Oh, gee, what if you're one of the people that bought right here? How many people did it take to mess up your trade? Just one. Just one person. That's all. It's usually more than one, but that's all it takes is one. You guys starting to get the idea? This kind of stuff is going on all of the time. As a matter of fact, when prices move, this is usually the reason why. When I was at Merrill Lynch... I mean, this, I mean, you know, and for many years, even when I was teaching, teaching, you know, material in the psychology of trading, I didn't really include a lot of this stuff because I just sort of took it for granted that people understood it and knew it. You know, and the reason why I took it for granted is because I guess I learned it so early in my trading career that it just, you know, it was self-evident to me. But it was self-evident because here I was at Merrill Lynch and, and I, had, I had access to a squawk box. Now our squawk boxes were open phone lines to the various pits in both Chicago and New York meaning we had Merrill Lynch representatives in each of those pits that as, as buy and sell orders would come in, they would tell us who was buying and who was selling. What houses, what manufacturers, what big accounts, what big traders, if they could. In other words, if they had, if they had access to the information, they would tell us who was buying, you know, and, and, and maybe who was even taking the other side of their orders if, if they could determine it. So it's like he had a very intimate it was like, a, you know, you had this sort of intimate um, connection with what was really going on. Now, at the same time, I, when I was doing my own technical analysis, I would, do, I would do my equations because we didn't have computers back then. Of course, you could do the, the Hewitt-Packard the handheld thing, but I didn't do that. I did all my equations, on a, all my analysis on a spreadsheet, and I actually did all the, all the calculations by hand. And I did it on purpose that way so that I could get an intimate sense of how the actual mathematics of my signals, in other words, the actual calculations, the multiplications, the divisions, the subtractions, 
you know, and what the, what the final product was in terms of a signal, how it related to the actual market movement. And I found that there was no relationship other than the fact that it would identify patterns where the signals would work sometimes and, you know, sometimes they wouldn't. But the point is, is that there wasn't any relationship between this fixed mathematical formula and the people who were buying and selling at that moment and the reasons why they were doing it. There was none at all. But not only that, here's what really shocked me. Is we had uh, a TV monitors going all the time. And we had it on, uh, in Chicago, there was a, a local investment channel, Channel 26. And it was very much like CNBC now, but it was a lot less sophisticated. And, you know, so we'd watch as, as people would come on the show and, uh, and with various, you know, have various interviews and that sort of thing. And I'm watching, watching one morning, and there's this b vice president from Heinhold, which was, now doesn't exist anymore, but they were one of the biggest hog and, and meat producers in the Midwest back in the 80s. And uh, this, this vice president from Heinhold is being interviewed by, you know, the guy on Channel 26. And he's talking about how, you know, how uh, people, got, people got to get into live hogs and pork bellies because prices are going up. And, you know, and he's just going on and on about what a great investment it is. And, and really, and, and here, and this would happen quite frequently, by the way, but this was just an example. And then all the phones started lighting up. These are all the people in the Chicago area, the typical, you know, the traders in the Chicago area that are listening to this guy because I, because I say that because the phones are lighting up and all the brokers are starting to take orders to, to, uh, uh, to buy bellies and buy hogs. And I will think, well, you know, that was pretty, pretty impactful, right? Oh, gee, and then on Squawk Box, guess who's taking the other side of those orders? Hind hold. <laughs> they needed somebody to come in and take the other side of their orders. What does a mathematical formula have to do with that? Now, as it just so happens, if my math is working in a way where I happen to get in at that moment, I end up in a winning trade, well, that's great. But that doesn't mean I can rely on it, rely on it to do the same thing the next time. Uh, okay, I explained hedging, reverse auction. In a normal auction, this is what I'm talking about dynamic traders right now. In a, in a normal auction, what do people do in a normal auction? In other words, if you're in, in a situation where, where things or items are up for bid, when you bid, when you're outbidding somebody, what are you doing? You're eliminating the competition, right? In other words, by bidding higher, you're hopefully eliminating anybody else who will bid higher than you. Hedgers and commercials... And dynamic traders create what I call a reverse auction. They'll bid a market up or offer it lower to try to attract the public into the market to take the other side of their trades. You guys with me on this? They will bid a market up or offer it lower as a reverse auction. That doesn't mean that they want the, they, you know, they could, the market can go higher, but their, their immediate objective is that if they're bidding it up, it means that they want to sell. They just want someone to take the other side of their trades. So they're actually creating a reverse auction, attracting people into the market, because as the market goes up, the, the people are thinking, okay, I'm going to be missing out, and, and I've got the assurance that I need that it's going to keep on going, and so they get sucked into this move, and then, and then they slam them with a huge order. Now, see, I had intimate contact with all that Merrill Lynch. <laughs> I really, you know, <laughs> not only that, I mean, because, because I knew the floor traders, I knew many of the floor traders who actually created the movement that particular day. And there were a number of times where the movement was significant and they were fast markets and, you know, enough to track the, the media to the exchange. And, you know, and they put a microphone in front of their, in front of their mouth and, you know, and the, I definitely, they definitely would say something that was palatable to the public. In other words, what was reasonable, I can guarantee you that the reason why they did what they did during the day had nothing to do with what they said. Nothing. There was no relationship whatsoever. Go ahead. I fully understand your concept of the, the movement that's taking place because of dynamic players. And I can understand how that would relate to the commodity, stock, and stock options market. But can you have the same effect in, say, the foreign currency market, where it's a much bigger market that's 
traded worldwide? It, it just depends on the player. Absolutely. You get a central bank that starts, that starts, doing, that starts unloading something, and, and they're gonna, it's going to have a, a major impact on the market, yes. But, you, but, yeah, you've got – basically what you have is a situation where, where this market's so large, it's so liquid, that it, is, it would be very difficult for individuals to have any impact on it. Is that what you're saying to me? Is that what you're – Well, I wasn't necessarily limiting it to individuals. I mean, even a central bank um, – it just, on, on the world market, could they have that kind of an impact? Well, it's what I call the pebble in a pond effect. Okay, they might not have enough. They might not have enough impact initially. Okay, initially to, to, to do something. Okay, to have to have that meaningful make to create that meaningful of a price move. But you've got a pebble in a pond, which is the way a lot of prices move anyway. Because it's like what you got is you drop a pebble in a pond. Well, if it's you know, it creates waves, does it not? Okay. And what I found is that, especially with floor traders, and, 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 and really the kind of same, the kind of same, the, the same kind of dynamics work even, uh, uh, even with off the floor traders in the general market itself, I found that what you had is that most floor traders did not know what they were doing in the sense that they didn't have a real good reason for buying or selling at any given moment other than the fact that they were following the lead of other people who thought they thought did have an idea of what they're doing. So what ends up happening is that, is that what you've got is you've got the, the guy, the trader who's confident, knows exactly what he's doing, why he wants to do it, and does it. And then you've got all, you've got all the other guys who are, let's say, in the pit, okay, who are closest to this particular, this, this guy might be on this step right here, who are closest to this guy that will, that will mimic what he does. And then what it does is it starts spreading out. And that, and that as, as word gets out, Okay, the guys at the farthest end end up getting prices that are that are greatly diminished in relationship to this particular individual. But the point is, it's kind of like the pebble in a pond. A central bank could create, create the same thing. In other words, initially, a central bank hitting the market with a huge order m might be absorbed. But the fact that the central bank is doing it will cause other people to want to do it too, and therefore, as a result of all the other traders who pile on, it creates a huge move. Does that make sense? Okay, we're moving right along here. Okay, dynamic traders, okay, players, they know and understand the mindset and behavior patterns of the crowd or herd. They, they, they basically refer to the general public as the herd. And they are the herd masters. Okay, they are the herd masters. Whenever possible, they will use that knowledge to move prices in a way that will extract the most amount of money from the largest number of traders. That is their mission. That is what they do. Characteristics of passive technical traders, they're usually mystified by price movement. Would that be a fair characterization? Okay, they wouldn't think about trying to cause price movement. As a result, they typically can't conceive of anyone else doing it either. They're typically drawn into trades based on an opinion about the attractiveness of the price or stampeded out because of fear. The passive technical trader's objective is to find himself in a winning trade without any intent to move prices. Now think about what you're doing. You are trading in a way where you want to find yourself in a winning trade, but absolutely wouldn't even think about moving prices to do it. You're completely dependent on someone else doing it for you. To find himself in a winning trade, he's dependent on other traders to be willing to either buy or sell at a worse price than himself to create movement in his direction. The typical passive technical trader is expecting other dynamic traders to make him a winner when they usually have little or no knowledge, insight, or understanding about how dynamic traders operate. Would that be fair? The typical passive trader does not realize it only takes one dynamic trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of his edge. Is that a fair statement now? Does anybody want to argue with the statement anymore? Or, and I would say anybody did in the first place, but there are some people who raised raise their hand and said that that wasn't the case. Is there anybody that, that's not convinced about this? Seriously, I want to know. And I'm not, we're not going to get into a fight or anything, but you know. <laughs> Okay, the characteristics of technical analysis. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take what we now understand about the nature of price movement 
and look at the nature of technical analysis to see, just see what we got here, okay? <laughs> see how well it, you know, it meshes. Okay, technical indicators define, identify, and organize market data, the up and down ticks into understandable patterns. Are you guys with me on this? The patterns are observa observable, quantifiable, meaning they can be measured and repeat themselves with statistical reliability. And, and, and really, and, and while I'm doing this and while we're going through this, I want you guys to really keep in mind that, that just because I explained the, the underlying characteristics of dynamic traders and people who can actually move the market and do it and do it all the time, in fact, when the market's moving, they're the ones who are doing it. It's not you or I. The only time you or I move the market is when there's an overabundance of market orders coming into the market from passive technical traders. Because a market order does what? Okay? If the last, again, the last price is 10, we've got 9, we've got 11. Okay, what's the market? The last price is 10. If I want to buy, the market's actually 11, isn't it? That's the market because that's where the offers are. The offers are at 11, so that's where I'm going to get filled. I'm going to get filled at 11. Well, if there's so many buy orders, come market buy orders coming into the market, and all the, all the offers are taken out at 11, then that means the next price up where there's offers are 12, and that's where I'm going to get filled. And if there's so many more that got in before me, and this is real, I mean, it's really an overabundance, of buy orders in relationship to the number of offers that, are, that, that exist, then I might get filled at 13. Because that's the market. So that's the difference. You've got, you've got an overabundance of, of passive technical mar orders coming into the market that will drive it up, or you've got dynamic traders who are doing it purposefully. And when they're doing it purposefully, I guarantee you, they got, they got a good reason for it. They know what they're doing. I'm not saying it always works, but they know what they're doing. And it doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of it. It doesn't mean that you can't make a consistent income, even a, a, I mean a, a, really, a really good consistent income with your technical methodologies. You don't, you don't even have to, you don't have to understand all these, these uh, subtle dynamics or, of market or price movement to be able to take advantage of, of it. All you've got to do is be able to trade your edge and follow your plan. I just want you to understand that when you understand what's going on, you will, will be able to trade your plan because you won't be putting so much emphasis on things that don't have any relevance. Like expecting this next trade to work just because you got a signal. Is this what drives the price up uh, typically early in the morning, like when the market opens some popular stock? All the market, all the orders come in or it goes down, and is that what creates this gap? or? Well, I can't tell you the. I mean, when you say what, that's what happens. I mean, all you can. Let's is put it, it a, this way: Is it a log jam? It, like you can, you can always break it down to one fundamental reason. The only fun, the only reason that, that really there is, there's an imbalance mm -hmm. between between buyers and sellers. Price movement is always the result of an imbalance, because when there's balance, there's no movement. Right. It's that simple. Right. If there's balance, there's no movement. Prices do not move when there's balance. There has to be an imbalance for people to bid it up or offer it lower. And if people aren't actually bidding it up in this example, we don't... See, what I, what the reason why I can't a answer you exactly is because I don't know if it's actually being bid up purposefully by somebody or, or it's because there's an overabundance of buy orders in relationship to the amount of offers. That's what I don't know. Okay? The, pa the patterns basically measure the collective mind of the market. In other words, here, and I, should have, and I should have really emphasized this word, collective, collective mind of the market. Not the individual minds, the collective mind. Meaning all of the actions, all of the beliefs, all of the agendas, all of the objectives are built into that next incremental price change from 11 to 12 or from 12 to 13. It's all there. And the only thing that mathematical formulas can do is actually measure that, you know, measure the patterns that result from that information. 
It isn't getting the information of the guy who actually bid the market up by taking out all the offers because he's got some specific agenda about what he wants to do with where he wants to see the prices go because he's, he's doing something that has nothing to do with any of this, meaning your technical methodology or anybody else's. He might be putting on a huge hedge position based on some contract that he has to deliver something three months from now. So collective mind of the market, indicating when there is a higher probability of one thing happening over another, represented as an edge. So because the patterns show up in every time frame, technical analysis turns the market into an unending stream of opportunities to enrich ourselves. These patterns that the mathematical formulas identify show up in every time frame, from the smallest to the largest. And as a result, if we learn how to think about these patterns or edges appropriately, it will actually turn the market into an unending stream to enrich ourselves. But not on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. But not on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, but rather as a percentage over a series of trades. This is big, guys. This is it right here. This is the holy grail of technical analysis right here, right now. Your technical indicators will turn the market into an unending stream of opportunity to enrich yourself, but not on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. but rather as a percentage over a series of trades. That means you have to learn how to think in probabilities. You may understand the concept of probabilities. It doesn't mean that you can think that way. I've worked with traders. In fact, one guy came to one of my workshops many years ago, a hedge fund manager, reasonably successful. You know, let's say reasonably because he made, you know, I don't know, 10 to 18% a year. But his indicators if he had followed them the way, you know, the way they were planned to be followed, he could have made anywhere from 60 to 70% a year. A little frustrated, came to a workshop, and then, you know, some, some consultations afterwards. In one particular situation where he said, you know, he, he put in a trade, a trade he'd been watching for months, finally got to his price level. You know, he put the trade on, then put a stop in the market. You know, and the market started approaching a stop, and, you know, he, he, got, out of, he got out of the trade early. The market didn't even hit a stop. He got out of the trade early, and then it just pff, went, just, just fell to pieces because he was short. And, he, you know, in his direction, he wasn't in the trade. And he would have been someone who would have said that he understood the nature of probabilities because he majored in it in college. But he hasn't, he, he did not do the sufficient amount of work to train his mind to think in probabilities at a functional level. There's a huge difference. You can't take it for granted that because you understand the nature of percentages that you can think that way at a functional level. It would be, you know, like you can, you can do, I'll do the analogy to technical analysis to uh, flipping a coin. Okay, that if you, if you take an evenly weighted coin and flip it a thousand times, you've got a large sample size there, right? The pattern that will emerge with each thousand flip sample size is a relatively even distribution between heads and tails. Maybe not quite 50-50, but let's say 49.2 and, you know, uh, 49.8 or something, whatever. There might be a little bit of variance, more variance there. But in any case, that will be a pattern. See, that's a pattern. Because it'll happen every single time you flip the coin a thousand times. But within that thousand flip sample size, is there any way, since you're going to get an even distribution between heads and tails, is there any way that you can know for sure which individual flip is going to be heads and which individual flip is going to be tails? No. You could get 10 flips of heads in a row and be absolutely positive the next one's going to be tails. And it could come up heads again. 
And even though you can have all these streaks of heads and tails, in the end, they're still going to come up 50-50. This is exactly the way technical analysis works. Exactly. When you consider the diversity, the diversity of the market, with all the different players and all the different agendas from people all over the world, trying to predict what will happen next would be almost equivalent to sitting in front of a slot machine and coming up with some rational reason why you think that the, the pattern that you're looking for is going to come up on the next push of the button. It wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? But the reason why it's, we get fooled as traders and we think of it in, a, in, 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 not this, in not this probabilistic way is because when we put on a trade, we put on a trade for a reason. See, reasons are important in our lives. Reasons are important. We put on a trade for a reason. And see, the problem is, is that when the trade works, we think our re we just naturally think our reason was right. What I'm trying to do here is help you disconnect, is disconnect any reason that you put on a trade with the reason why it actually moved. Because like I said before, there's almost never a relationship. There's almost never a correlation. And so the next time that reason seems to appear in the market, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing, thinking we'll get the same result. And then when we don't, we feel betrayed. And then the next time the reason comes up, we're going to be a little hesitant. We might not put it on at all. We'll try to find additional reasons why this trade will work. When the reality is there isn't any reason you're going to be able to come up with that's going to assure you of anything. Unless the reason you're coming up with is you know the people who are actually going to bid the market up or offer it lower. And they tell you what they're going to do and why. Ultimately, there's only one reason why markets, why prices move. And what would that reason be? Come on. Imbalance yeah, an imbalance in conviction. That's the only, and what technical analysis does is it finds patterns in that imbalance, okay? Technical analysis finds in patterns in the imbalance. Where there's momentum in a direction. It's still not going to tell you what's going to happen next. Technical analysis doesn't, nor can it get into the minds of any particular individual trader who has both the financial and psychological resources to either move prices or defend certain price levels. And traders will defend price levels, by the way. There are dynamic traders who will actually defend a price. Is it reasonable to expect the fixed criteria that make up a mathematical formula to stay, to stay consistent with a dynamic event that's in perpetual motion on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. What's the answer to that? Well, what is the answer? No. Come on. No. no! No, it is not reasonable. No, it is not. Especially where that motion is being caused by traders all around the world with differing beliefs, objectives, and agendas. There was no way of determining the intentions of all these traders, yet the typical passive trader trades their methodology as if they are being told what those intentions are. The professionals do not. Do you guys get that? The typical passive technical trader trades their methodology as if they are being told what their intentions are, whereas the professional does not. And why doesn't the professional? Because the professional understands the underlying dynamics of price movement and that anybody could come into the market at any time to do anything. 
There was another floor trader that I worked with who executed, uh, traded his own account in the soybean market, but also also executed the orders for one at the time one of the biggest soybean uh, producers in the world. There was an Italian firm that actually tried the corner of the soybean market, got thrown off the board of trade. But before that happened. You know, there was many days where, you know, they, he would call, you know, be in touch with the, the head traders at the home office, and they're plotting out their strategy. And like, you know, he told me one day, you know, it's like, like the whole strategy for that day from the home office traders, the whole strategy was to spank the locals at the Chicago Board of Trade. That was their only purpose that day. They were going to suck the locals into a trade, and they were going to try to wipe them out. So he said, we're going to spank the locals today. Now, your mathematical pattern, okay, you happen to get a buy signal, ends up to be a big winning trade. You think it's because, because a couple of lines crossed, you know, no matter what it is, you know, whether it's stochastics or wise trade or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It had absolutely nothing to do with the reality of why the price has moved. Nothing. This is the primary characteristic that separates the professional from everyone else. What I just said right here. In this fourth section, I will cover the underlying dynamics of confidence and fear so that you can build a framework for understanding how to create a carefree state of mind when you trade. Okay, the next section that we're going to get into is exploring the dynamics of confidence and fear. In other words, what, what was the, from this morning and, and, and just a little while ago, not so much a little while ago, but especially from this morning, what's the primary problem? Why, why, why do we have so much of a problem, or what creates the problem with a, in a trade-by-trade -trade perspective? In other words, if I'm looking at the market, if my technical indicator gives me a signal to buy right now, okay, What's if, and, and if I and if I'm not predefining my risk, if I'm hesitating, uh, if I'm jumping the gun, if I'm you know if I put my trade on and 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 you know I, I want to move my stop, what is it that's going on right now? What, what's compelling me to make these kinds of errors? Fear. 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 And and what's behind the fear? The possible negative mistakes that we've made in the past. Okay, but that's good. But I want but. Yeah, because you don't want to get tapped into being wrong, losing, missing out, all that, all, all that pain. But remember I said, what was, what was the universal characteristic of all humanity in terms of how we feel about our expectations being fulfilled? Satisfaction. Well, yeah, but it, well, no, when they are. But what I'm saying is that it's because I'm expecting this trade to work. Okay, I want you guys, you guys got to get this, okay? The reason why I'm having a problem is because I'm expecting this trade to work this, this trade it's not because I'm thinking that I've got a I've got a series of trades remember the pattern with the pattern with flipping the coin the pattern is that if I've got an edge well, I'll give you another example let's say that I've got a coin that's weighted uh, weighted heavier on the tail side so that it's going to come up on a percentage basis, 65% of the time heads. And I get someone to take the other side of a bet where I get to call the flip every time. What am I going to do? Am I going to try to determine when tails is going to... 35% of the times tails is going to come up. I'm going to call heads every time. That's a pattern, Okay. The way it relates here is that I've got a technical methodology that gives me winning trades, let's say, 65% of the time. I don't know which of those of the next 20 trades or 25 trades that come up, I don't know which ones are going to be the winners and which ones are going to be the losers. If I'm going to trade my methodology appropriately, it really obligates me to take every single trade. 
I can't be picking and choosing my trades based on what I think is going to happen because I hopefully have already established you don't know. And if you think you know, you're just making it up in your own mind. I'm going to repeat that. If you think you know, you're just making it up. Is, this, is everybody all right with what I just said? And so it obligates me to take every single trade that comes up because I don't know which ones are going to be the winners and which ones are going to be the losers. It means that if I'm having problems, it's because I have a certain expectation about this trade or about this trade or about this one. So what if I'm expecting a random outcome? What if I change my expectations? Will I feel differently about it? If I change my expectations, will I feel differently about it? Is there anybody in this room? Do you, does anybody who trades? Let's put it, I've, it's been. This, I don't think I've ever met anybody who trades who hasn't at least gambled at some point in their lives. Right? What do you expect when you put money into a slot machine and push the button? Goodbye. Good. Well, one of those answers was goodbye. I like that. What else? Loud. If anybody's going to say anything, what are you expecting? Really? On this one? Seriously. What do you expect? You, what do you, you know what you're expecting? You're expecting something to happen, right? You're expecting the wheels to turn. You're expecting something to show up. Now think about what I'm just saying. Because you know what? What I just said is exactly what I expect when I put on a trade. I'm expecting something to happen. I don't know what. But over a series of trades, if I do everything right, I'll make money. Because I'm managing my expectations on each one of these trades. I'm managing my expectations so that I do not have the potential to define and interpret these up and down ticks, the information the market gives me in some sort of threatening or painful way. Because what I'm going to tell you, what we're going to get into now is, is the effects of that. When you put money... What's that? How realistic then is that 65% on your methodology? What do you mean how realistic? Uh, it could be 70 or 80 or 50. Go ahead. No, no. Take the microphone. How realistic is a 65% win ratio on your methodology? I'm not understanding the question. How realistic is it? Well, if you can't go by any individual specific trade, but you say over 20 trades, you can say you expect to win 65% of the time. Correct. They're based on past performance. Okay. But then, again, looking at over any individual uh, 20 or 50 sample, how realistic is maybe that 65% saying that you are, that's a real number? I'll find out. I don't know. I don't know. How, how will I know? How, how could I know? I'll find out. That's why you trade in sample sizes that are limited. In other words, I don't make an assessment of how well it's working until after the end of a sample size. If, if at the end of a sample size, I get a high enough percentage of winning trades where I'm satisfied, then I'll take another sample size. If I don't, then I'll find ways to tweak my indicators to improve my results. So if you were to say, how realistic is it? I have no idea of knowing what, what, what's going to happen in the future. When you get right down to it, it is possible. Would it not be possible for me to get into, start a sample size that trade one and end up where every single one of them was a loser? Am I going to know that in advance? And see, and that's where paper trading is so critical, is that by paper trading, you will get a realistic assessment as to how well your edge works. And people have no problem paper trading. They'll paper trade to find out if, if you know, if their they can, you know, they can their methodology works and to gain confidence in it. It's the other part that they won't they won't participate in, meaning that they won't take that same take take a similar exercise 
to see how well their own psychology matches up to what they need to do to be consistently successful. In other words, to set up an exercise. Paper trading is an exercise, is it not? It's an exercise in developing skills, in understanding your methodology, is it not? So wouldn't it be just as reasonable to set up an exercise to learn how to execute properly so you'd manage your expectations? Uh, uh, what, what, what do you consider a, a proper sample size? 20, 25 trades. I don't think it has to be more than that. I really don't. If it's not working within 25 trades, then, you, there's, then there's, something that, there's something you're going to have to change. Okay, so it's all about our expectations. When I put money into a slot machine, I'm expecting something to happen. If it comes up a loser, do I get all worked up about this? Does this tap me into my accumulated emotional pain of every time I've been wrong and lost in my life? I mean, look, look, look at it. There, there, are, there are people who trade and, 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 and because of their expectations make every error in the book and can't make consistent money. And the reason why is because of their, like I said, because of their expectations. And yet, if they put money into a slot machine, where essentially the only difference between technical trading and a slot machine is the fact that with a slot machine, you have to put your money in first and then wait for a pattern to emerge. With technical trading, you have to wait for a pattern to emerge and then technically put your money on the line. The problem is because the way our minds think, we think that because the pattern emerged, that somehow or another it's giving us an edge on that particular individual trade. And there's just no way of knowing that. But over a series of trades, it does. So it's like technical analysis gives the individual the, the availability of being the casino. Technical analysis lets you own the slot machine because you've got the odds in your favor. The casino makes the slot machine available to us because they've got the odds in their favor. But to, but to derive the benefit of those odds, you have to be able to execute properly. And you have to think about this properly. It is just a numbers game based on the odds. That means that you can't put an extraordinary, a, 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 let's say an, ex, an, ex, an extraordinary amount of significance on each individual trade. Because if you sat and played a slot machine, you wouldn't think anything of it. If you if you put you played a dollar slot machine and you sat down with the idea that you know what I got a hundred bucks in my pocket, and you didn't win, you know you might have you know let's say ten times in a row you didn't win, you're still you're still going to push the button because eventually you think eventually I'm going to hit, eventually I'm going to hit, so it's all right. You see, it's all right. Same thing here. This trade didn't work. Well, eventually, eventually I'll get a winner. This trade didn't work. Eventually I'll get a winner. This trade didn't work. Well, eventually I'll get a winner. Well, well I don't know about this next one now. And that's almost always the winner. Now, if it turns out that your methodology has diminished in its, let's say, in its capacity to produce a winning percentage because the underlying nature of the market is changing in relationship to this fixed formula, then, you know, that's why you trade in smaller sample sizes or a sample size where you don't lose an inordinate amount of money to find out it's not working. But you do this right and you're the casino. Regardless of all the dynamic traders, regardless of all this other stuff I'm talking about, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff's important. As long as you understand, the under, as long as you understand how the underlying dynamics relates to the formula so that you don't put... And, you know, an extraordinary amount of significance on a formula that's just giving you a pattern in collective behavior, not individual behavior. And it's individuals who move the market. So those individuals, there can always be an individual or group of individuals who come into the market that do something that completely negates the outcome of your pattern. And that's all right, because there's no way to know that in advance. It's all right. When you look at it that way, then you won't get all worked up. Then it's just a random outcome, just like a slot machine. It's just a random outcome. Because that's what you're expecting. You expect a random outcome, you got a random outcome, and there's no emotional significance.
Because here's what happens when you don't look at it this way. Let's take a typical trader who's operating out of the four fears. Okay, we got support, we got resistance, we got a nice trading range, the market's coming down to support, okay? Now, the typical trader operating out of those four fears, the fear of being wrong, the fear of losing money, missing out, you know, depending on the intensity of these fears in a given moment, he might have a hard time putting that trade on, right? He's got a viable pattern, you know, all that happened here is that when the market, he had an imbalance in conviction, remember all price movements are a result of an imbalance in conviction, the markets came down to this point right here. There wasn't one person in the world, not one, I'm going to say this, not one person in the world, in the whole world, that would offer, that would take out the bids to offer this market one tick lower than this price right here. Not one. Okay? And then all of a sudden there's an imbalance in conviction, where there are more buy orders and sell orders, it drives the price up to here, and the same thing happens, drives the price down to here, same thing happens here, here, now it's coming back down. Now, from my perspective, I'm looking at it like this. How much room do I have to give the market to tell me that the people who bought here and the people who bought here are going to come back into the market and do it again? Because right now, there's an imbalance in conviction on the sell side. That means that enough orders, buy orders, have to come into the market to absorb all the offers, to absorb all those offers with enough left over to create upside movement. Do I have any way of knowing whether or not they're going to come in? No. No, I don't. But the odds are in my favor. At least I hope they are. In any case, I'm willing to risk a certain amount of distance from my entry point to find out. That's all it, that's all it means to me. If they don't come in, it means, you know what, the guys that were that bought here and bought here, they might be out to lunch. And that happens. I am not kidding you. I know that for a fact. I've experienced it. Because I, I, I intimately knew, you know, a lot of the big traders in certain markets that would buy here and buy here. And I'm thinking, okay, they're coming back in. And they were out to lunch. Say, hey, where were you guys? But to the typical trader that doesn't think this way, what's going to happen? If he manages to get the trade on, it's going to be because he thinks he's right. It's because he thinks he knows what's going to happen next. Right? And he's not going to put in a stop because to predefine his risk, how much money does he have to, how much room in dollar wise, how much room distance of the dollar value of this distance that he has to give the market to tell him that this trade is either working or it's not. Or that to let it go any further isn't worth finding out. That's all it means to me. But he's not going to think that way. He's going to think by gathering evidence that this trade might not work, he might be talking himself out of taking it. And so by the time he actually manages to get this, get this order in the market and buy somewhere in here, he has convinced himself that he's right. Now remember I said earlier, and I think I just said it once so you might not have gotten it, that fear has an, has an effect on the way we perceive information. When we're in a state of mind of fear, we are perceiving information in a threatening way. In other words, we are having an expectation of pain. And remember I said that to experience emotional pain, there's two kinds of pain, physical pain and emotional pain. Emotional pain requires an interpretation. The up and down ticks that the market offers us are not inherently pleasurable or painful by their nature. There is such a thing as painful information. I mean, painful from the environment's perspective. If the environment, if, someone, if someone's hurling insults at you, their intent is to cause you emotional pain. But that doesn't mean you're going to experience the emotional pain unless you interpret it that way. 
If they're hurling insults at you in a, in a foreign language that you don't have the slightest idea about what they're saying, it may look to you like they're saying something isn't so nice, but then again, you don't, have, you don't know what the words are, and so what do you feel? Nothing. The interpretations come from our beliefs. The interpretations come from our mental framework. In other words, the pain's already inside of us. All the words are doing is tapping us into it. Once we learn how to manage our interpretations, we can manage the way that we feel. We can actually determine how we feel in our own state of mind. So this trader, he's operating out of a fear of being wrong. So, like I said, he convinces himself that he's right. That's the way he gets the trade on. So let's say the market... Now, I said that fear causes us to focus on, the, fo focus on the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experience we're trying to avoid. This trader is trying to avoid being wrong. Now, we have self-protective mechanisms. They're, they can work at an unconscious level. There are mechanisms inside of us that will protect us from information that we perceive as threatening. It causes what was typically referred to as perceptual blindness, where there are things going on around us that we cannot perceive, even though we have the ability to perceive it, but we're being blinded from it. If I'm afraid of being wrong, what of the information that the market is making available to me, what am I going to focus my attention on, the upticks or the downticks? You're right, the upticks, not the downticks. Meaning that, what I will do is I will place an inordinate amount of significance. In other words, the way my mind will automatically weigh this information in terms of what's significant and what isn't, it will give more significance to the upticks than the downticks. Because every time I get an uptick, it will be taking me out of my pain. I'll say, oh, it's finally all over. And then we'll get more downticks. And then we get a couple upticks and say, oh, it's finally all over. In other words, what my mind is doing to protect me is saying that these few upticks are far more significant than all these downticks. Now, do I have the ability to recognize a trend? In other words, being able to define and recognize a trend is one of the most fundamental characteristics of, a, of, of learning technical analysis. A trend is a high series of higher highs and higher lows or lower highs and lower lows. But in this moment, am I able to recognize this as a trend? No, because I'm too focused on getting myself out of the pain, which means that I'm focused on these upticks. Now, our trader is operating both out of a fear of being wrong and a fear of losing money. Now, what ends up happening is this, is that if this, if this were to represent all the negative energy inside of his mind of what it means to be wrong, There's also negative energy inside of his mind about what it means to lose. And as the market moves further and further against his position, his belief about losing will start to gain more and more significance and start to rise to the forefront of his consciousness and make itself known, make its presence known, until finally he gets to a point where he cannot stand losing one more dollar. And that one more dollar, in essence, is when the pain of losing one more dollar is one degree greater than the pain of admitting that he's wrong. In other words, when this pain is greater than that pain by one degree, he'll get out of the trade. That's when he'll admit that it's a losing trade and get out. You guys with me on this? Now, he would say that the market did this to him. But what I'm saying is that is blatantly not the case. His fear did that to him. He created the very experience he was trying to avoid. He was trying to avoid being wrong, and he made himself wrong. And ultimately, this is always the spot where the market, you know, where the market does that anyway.
You guys with me on this? Okay, now this trader gets out of this trade right here. He looks back at this chart pattern and he, why didn't I just go short? Why didn't I just go short? The ability to recognize this as a downtrend, or let's say he was blinded from his ability to recognize this as a downtrend. The distinction existed inside of his mind. In other words, he can actually make the distinction of what a downtrend is. But in that moment, while he was in that trade, he was blinded to his own distinctions. Because he was operating out of a trade-by-trade trade mentality. He was operating, I'm going to say, he was operating out of a trade-by-trade trade mentality. This trade took on the significance of life or death, just like any, any other trade that he puts on does. And to be a consistently successful trader, it, it ain't going to happen if you think that way. The pros don't think that way. Determine your risk, it either works or it doesn't, and, and, and go to the next trade. Determine your risk, it works or it doesn't, go to the next trade. That, that's all it is. That's the whole game. Now, let's say that this doesn't happen, but this happens. Let's say instead of it going against them, that the market does this. Now what ticks do you think he's going to be focused on? The up or the down ticks? The market's doing exactly what he wants, by the way. Now the market is doing exactly what he wants. And what ticks do you think he's going to be focused on? Ah, uh, the down ticks. And why the down ticks? Because he's been in too many times of trades where the market has taken away his profits. And so he places an, in, an inordinate amount of significance on every down tick and in essence ends up doing what? Leaving money on the table. So what he does is, let's say he gets out right here, so he cuts his profit shorts and lets his losses run. In Chicago vernacular, this is called, like, this is called uh, shitting like an elephant and eating like a bird. <laughs> What's that? Now, if this trader had a belief in a random outcome that he didn't have to know what was going to happen next to make money. Would he have these problems? What would he be expecting if he had a belief in a random outcome? That there was just a random distribution between wins and losses on any given set of variables that defined his edge. If he believed that, if he believed it only took one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of his edge, if he believed that no matter what reason he thinks he has for putting on that trade, that the reason why it works or it doesn't work will almost never correlate to the actual reason that he, that he conjured up. If he believed all these things, how would he be handling this? Come on, how would he be handling it? Tell me. Well, he would have a plan, or in my words, I like to use the word strategy. Okay. When he got into the trade, when he got into the trade, he's going to say that, okay, when it reaches this level right here, I'm going to get out. If it goes down to this level down here, I'm going to get out. Now, he may have ended up leaving some money on the table, but at least he's going to be in that percentage that he had already predetermined that's going to create him to be a winning percentage of trades. Would he have the same, be saddled with the same emotional problems that he had if he if he was operating out of a fear of being wrong or losing money? No. No, because he didn't have any emotion in the trade. It's saying, hey, it's following my predetermined plan that I have in place. Right. And it either works or it doesn't, right? That's right. Because I trade from a series of trades perspective. I don't know what each individual trade is going to do. This is the way the pros do it, by the way. This is thinking like a pro. You want to make consistent money, this is what you're going to have to think. Otherwise, you already know what the problems are.
trading will take on a take on a quality of of being exasperating because you can see the potential and it seems like you're always just that just like that close from getting it and you never get there how we feel our state of mind in any given situation is always real and the absolute truth now I want you to make a distinction here at any given moment we're in a state of mind state of mind could be any number of things we have a lot of ways to define states of mind it could be a state of mind of like satisfaction dissatisfaction happiness joy fear terror these are all states of mind confidence is a state of mind as a state of mind confidence when i'm confident i feel i feel compelled to step into a situation compels to thrust me forward into an experience of course if i'm fearful then what am i doing i'm pulling back because i feel threatened in some way i'm perceiving the information that's available in that moment as threatening but you got to remember for me to perceive it that way it means i'm interpreting it that way but here's where people get real mixed up about this sort of thing is that the state of mind that we experience in any given moment is always the absolute truth you can't deny the fact that if i'm if i'm feeling fearful right now then i that i'm feeling fearful that's just the way that it is i'm in that state of mind the particular interpretation that got me into that state of mind however could be completely dysfunctional you guys with me on this the interpretation that comes from what we believe could be completely dysfunctional You see as passive technical traders if we believe that somehow or another our methodology is telling us what's going to happen next on any particular trade the reason why we're having problems is because that is a dysfunctional belief it was never true now the states of mind that result from that belief are real so for an example if i put on a trade and it turns out to be a winner i think that i'm right and as a result i feel great if i put on a trade and i think that i lose well then i feel like crap cuz i was wrong the reality is neither one was really true because when you win you weren't right and when you're wrong you weren't wrong because whatever reason you had to put on the trade in the first place again had almost no correlation to what actually happened with the market in other words why the market did what it did you just happened to put on a trade at that time that worked and all technical patterns do technical indicators i mean price patterns is get you into a situation where there's a likelihood a likelihood a likelihood that when you get into that trade it'll work that's all they were ever represented to be you understand what i'm saying that's all they were ever represented to be i'm not saying they don't get you know screwed up somehow in terms of the way people represent them but that's basically that's all that basically they ever they ever were it's not on a trade by trade basis now we're going to get into the last part of it we're we're heading down to the home stretch guys heading down to the home stretch Are we all right up to this point as far as anybody have any questions about the fear and confidence and the relationships that we're talking about that what we're talking about is the fact that we've got to, if we want to we want to think like a pro so that we can experience the kind of results that the pros get which are consistent it means that we have to change our perspective from trade by trade to series of trades does anybody have any questions about that and why that's essential so if you know that why do we have to go to a series of trades perspective why Well, hold on one second, sir. You're taking all the fear out of it, and you know that through a series you'll be right more of the time than you will be wrong, and you take all the fear out of it and just work on that basis without any emotion. 
Correct. And, not, and why isn't there any emotion when you take? Give me specifically why you think there is no emotion. Well, you're doing it out of more of a mathematical concept, and not. I think it's going to do this. You're taking it's either going to be right or it's going to be wrong, and you either walk away or stay in it. I want you to use the words expectations in your in your answer. Okay. Uh, I don't really <laughs> have any. I don't have any expectations. It's either going to work or it's not. Yeah, in other words, this particular trade, you don't know what you, you think something's going to happen, but you don't know what. Right. When you when you put money in a slot machine and push the button, you think something's going to happen, but you don't know what. And if it comes out to be the a jackpot, well, hey, you're, that feels great. You're surprised, right? When I put on a trade, I'm, I feel the same way. Literally, I don't know. I don't have to know. I just have to do what I need to do to make money on a consistent basis, which means I have to take every one of these trades. I can't pick and choose. The only reason why I pick and choose is because I think I'm right. So when you change your perspective from a trade by trade to a series of trades, it automatically manages your expectations in a positive way. I'm going to set this up for you as an exercise in a little bit, okay? Um, but, but I just want to make sure we're, we're... Anybody else have any questions about any of this? So, so you know... You, you, so in other words, what, so what we're doing at this... What are we doing at this point then? So, so you know where you want to go, right? So do we know where we want to go? We want to get to a point where we are actually changing the way that we think. When you walked in here this morning, you didn't think like a pro, did you? Now you have some idea of what it means to think like a pro, right? Come on, yes or no? Come on, guys, give me some response. Okay. How are we going to get there? Now we might understand it. How are we going to get there? Well, the paper trading, yeah, well, yeah, sort of, but yeah, I didn't get, I'm not saying you just have the answer. I'm saying we've got to have a way to get there, right? We have to have, a, we have to have a series of steps to be able to get to this particular mindset because what we're really talking about here is we're talking about changing the way that we think. Now, that can have some profound implications, right? No one seems to like to change the way that they think. Most traders have to go through the process. Remember this morning? The thread, the, the common thread between all traders who end up, you know, being, uh, you know, being really successful is that they end up having to lose one or more fortunes of what they defined as a fortune to get to that point. It's because the process of losing caused them to change the way that they think about trading. Now, do you want to do this the hard way or do you want to do it the easy way? Easy way. Easy way. Okay, I'm getting some response here. Good. <laughs> the easy way, right. We want to do it the easy way. So this is what this is all about now. This is what the last part of the workshop is about. It's about doing it the easy way. Hard What's that? Hard right, there you go. How do we change? Well, that's a good question, right? That's a real good one. How do we change? A lot of theories. A lot of techniques about it. A lot of theories. A lot of theories on techniques. As far as I'm concerned, change is really a function of, well, you can break down to a series of steps, but really change is really a function of desire. When you get right down, remember how we took price movement and boiled it down and distilled it down to simply what? Price movement, all price movement is a function of what? Imbalance. Imbalance and conviction between buyers and sellers. All change is a function of desire. If the desire is there, you'll find a way to facilitate the change. And it really doesn't matter what the technique is. Honest to God, it really doesn't. I'll give you an example right here. Probably the, one of the most extreme examples I could come up with. You can, by the way, this, what I'm going to read you right now, I got off of Yahoo. And you can go Google this kid and find out more about him yourself. Okay? But as I read this to you, keep in mind how this kid accomplished this. Because the scientists that, that investigate this, they don't know. They can't figure it out. To me, it's easy. The kid's desire was so intense that he managed to find a way. Uh, this is Lincoln, Nebraska. 
Bryce Mellon is a whiz at video games such as Mortal Kombat. Who is anybody familiar with Mortal Kombat? I'm I'm not into video games though. So. Well, not those video games anyway. Mortal Kombat. Okay, got some people. Is this a tough game? Yeah, challenging. challenging. Okay. In that regard, the 17-year-old, and he's a little older now. This was a couple of years ago. In that regard, the 17-year-old isn't much different from so many others his age. Except for one thing. He's blind. And as, e and as he easily dispatched foes who took him on recently at a Lincoln Gaming Center, the affable and smiling, bright, smiling Bryce remained humble. I can't say that I'm a superhero, he said, working the controller like an extension of his body. I can be beat. Those bold enough to challenge him weren't so lucky. One by one, while playing Soul Calibur 2, which is another game, their video characters were decapitated, eviscerated, and without mercy by, uh, by Bryce's on-screen alter ego. I'm getting bored, Bryce said in jest as he won game after game. Blind since birth, when his optic nerve didn't connect because of Liber's disease, Bryce honed his video skills over the years through patient and not-so-patient playing, memorizing key joystick operations and moves in certain games while asking lots of questions, paying particular attention to audio cues. He worked his way up from games such as Space Invaders and Asteroids into modern combat games. I guess I don't know how I do it, really, Bryce said as he continued playing while facing away from the screen. Facing away from the screen. It's beyond me. That's, I'm just quoting him. Bryce knows this much. He started playing at home when he was about seven. He enjoyed, play, he enjoyed trying to play, but he wasn't very good at first, said his father Larry, but he just kept trying. He, he broke a lot of controllers. When the questions of broken controllers comes up, uh, Bryce flashes a smile and just shrugs. I used to have quite a temper, he said. Me and controllers didn't get along very well. Now they're just now we get along just fine. While playing Soul Calibur 2, Bryce worked his way through the introductory screens with ease, knowing exactly what to click to start the game he wanted. He rarely asked for help. Once the game started, he didn't need any help. How do I move? An exasperated opponent, uh, Ryan O'Banion, asked while doing battle, which his character was frozen in place. You can't, Bryce answered before finishing him off. That's what happens. That's why I don't play him, O'Banion said after his blood spattered character's corpse vanishes from the screen. Now Bryce became so how Bryce became so good is a mystery to his father. He just sat there and he tried and tried until he got it right, Larry Mellon said. He can't ever complain to me or anyone else about how hard it was. Bryce hangs out any chance he gets at the uh, Dog Tags Gaming Center in Lincoln, opened last month. Every now and then, someone will come in and think that he can, that he that he can beat the that he that he can beat the blind kid. That attitude doesn't phase uh, Brian. I'm challenged. I challenge. I'll challenge them maybe if I feel like a challenge. He said, uh, displaying an infectious con confidence. I freak people out by play by playing facing backwards. There's nothing like uh, there's nothing he likes better than playing video games. He will be a senior in high school next year after graduation. He plans a year off because he wants a break from school, and when he goes to college, he wants to study what else? Video game design. This is just an extreme example, but I think a really good one. That all change is a function of desire. If you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to do it. If you want to be able to think in probabilities because you want to be consistently successful, you will find a way to do it. I'm going to give you ways, but what I'm saying is that you will find a way. If you don't, then it's that simple. You won't. It's like almost every... Let's put it, my, the, the, the traders, when I was doing coaching, the traders that I worked with fell into the two basic categories. And there almost wasn't anybody in between. The first category would be Traders who were already consistently successful. They already knew how to win, and what they wanted was fine-tuning. So they'd go to a trading coach like myself to find ways, find some really creative ways, let's say, to fine-tune fine -tune themselves where they can actually make more money than what they were already making. And then the other category was desperation and I'll do anything. They all do anything. The, everyone in between, no way. And even the all do anything wasn't always sincere. Sometimes it was just lip service.
change is also a function of the degree to which we change is also a function of the clarity of your intent. In other words, you can have the desire, but your intent has to be really clear. Because when you think about the whole concept of changing, what you're really saying is that I'm willing to let go of a certain portion of my identity, in a way. Of some part of myself that, you know, I obviously operated out of for X number of years or months or whatever, put, maybe put a lot of energy into, and, and you've got to be willing to let that go. Is it even possible to change a belief? How about it? Is it possible to change a belief? I mean, it happens all the time, does it not? Is there anybody in the room who did not grow up? Like, this, is, this is just a simple example, a simple illustration. Is there anybody in the room who did not grow up with, with a belief in Santa Claus? Is it most everybody did? Just an example? If, if you believed at some point in your life in Santa Claus, where's that belief now? What happened to it? What happened to that portion of your identity? Because if we were all children, if we were all four and five years old, and someone knocked on that door and said, Santa Claus is out in the lobby, we'd probably be jumping over each other to get over there, to get there, right? And it was that belief, the energy inside of that belief would compel us to express ourselves in a particular way, a way that was consistent with the belief. If I believed in Santa Claus and someone said, and gave me information, said, Santa Claus is in the lobby, I'm going to be, I'm going to be jumping over these tables to get there as a four-year-old. Now, as an adult, someone knocked on the door and said, Santa Claus is in the lobby. I, I'm sure I'd just, just ignore him. Where did my belief in Santa Claus go? What happened to it? Yeah, I don't know the underlying, I mean, really, I, don't, I can't say that I know the underlying dynamics of how that energy got transformed. But I can say it, it doesn't exist inside of my mental environment any longer in a way that would compel me to express myself like I did believe in Santa Claus. In other words, there's no more energy there. I can remember when I did believe it. I can say to myself, uh, yeah, there was, you know, there was something, there's something, or maybe even something there even now, but not enough to say, not enough for me to go running out into the lobby. You can say before you walked in here that you might have had a real strong belief that whatever you used to determine your edge gave you that edge on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. In other words, I wouldn't be putting on this trade if I didn't think I was right. Now you can say to yourself, are you willing to let that go? The only way you're going to be willing to let it go, to even generate the desire to let it go, is if you're really clear about your intent. Hopefully I've given you enough insight to be really clear about your intent as to why you might want to let this go. Because it's just going to create frustration. If you like trading on a random basis, then great. Then stay on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. Then trade randomly. Because it is fun. You'll win. You'll have winning streaks. But I, I can assure you, I can assure you without a shadow of a doubt that you trade randomly and you are setting yourself up for catastrophic losses. Because anything you do could result in a win, and most of the things people end up doing are just the kind of things that, that set themselves up for a catastrophic loss. Because inappropriate, you are reinforcing inappropriate behaviors. On a trade, when you trade randomly, on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, you are reinforcing inappropriate behaviors. Those inappropriate behaviors, namely, are not predefining your risk is the biggest one. You get into a trade, you don't predefine your risk and you win, you're going to do it again, you're going to do it again until you get hit with, it, with, a, with a huge loss. And sometimes those are really hard to recover from. And in fact, for most people, they're almost impossible. Not that you can't, it's just that they just don't have the resources for it, nor do they have the, the desire or the inclination to do it. They just walk away. Are you relatively clear about why you would want to do this? Why you'd want to go from a trade-by-trade -trade to a series of trades perspective?
sincerity. See, you need the desire, you need the clarity, and you need the sincerity. It can't be lip service. It has to be real. It has to be authentic. As a matter of fact, I, I'm going to say to you that based on my experience, if you're clear, if the desire is there, it's genuine, the clarity of your purpose is there, it's unconflicted, and so the sincerity is there, it will virtually happen automatically. That is the technique for change. What most people, the problem is, is that with most people, it takes, possi- it takes usually a series, let's say it takes using various techniques that are available, that have been, you know, that have been created and thought up, that over a period of years, they finally get to the point where they're com- they have the, de- the real desire, they have the clarity, and the real sincerity is there, and once all those are in place, the change happens automatically. And they would think that it happened over a period of years using techniques. But the reality is it just clicked into that, just finally the whole thing clicked into that, that one point where it's all there like the, like the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, a good example would be about what I'm talking about in terms of how clear you have to be in some cases because some of the energy that you want to move out in terms of a conflicting or dysfunctional belief, it could be really strong energy. I mean, you know, it could be pretty substantial. When you think about it, I mean, there are traders that I worked with many years ago especially that were really, I mean, hard, hardcore technicians. I mean, these are really hardcore guys that just, you know... I'm not even going to mention the techniques they use, but, you know, it's like, well, I'll get like, like uh, Elliott Wave casualties. I mean, there they were, they were guys that were just, you know, there was a, a time in the, in the late 80s and early 90s where a lot of my off-the-floor traders were what I call Elliott Wave casualties. And, you know, uh, and because these are guys who just, you know, who love to analyze. And, you know, when you start, when they, when you start, when they start understanding the difference between analysis and execution and also the underlying dynamics of the market, it's like, it's like they had to get to a point where the realization that they'd spent 10 years or 8 years and thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on, on analysis and, and workshops and seminars when, when none of it was or very little of it was really necessary. I mean, they had to get reconcile all that stuff and that wasn't an easy thing to do. That wasn't an easy thing to let go of. It wasn't an easy thing to say, okay, it was all right. You know, the, I know what I need to know now, and, you know. But how do you know what real clarity of intent is? Imagine yourself being held underwater. Imagine yourself being held underwater. And as your air starts to run out, Second by second, it gets to the point where you believe that if you don't get a breath of air right now, you're going to drown. That is a point at which every fiber of your mental being is aligned, is aligned 100% with your desire for that next breath of air. There's no conflict. There's no hesitation. There isn't anything that argues inside of you for anything else other than that next breath of air. If you want to make money bad enough, in other words, if you want to be, want to be able to make the kind of income that you can rely on as a trader, then your desire to switch to this series of trades approach has to be greater than any resistance that you might have to stay in a trade-by-trade approach. Does this make sense? Absolutely. 
degree of conviction. I just basically gave you that too. The, the, you know, the, how much energy is behind your desire? Energy moves prices in the market. I mean, what moves prices? An imbalance in conviction. What does conviction imply? Conviction implies energy. Energy. I am not going to bid a price up to a next highest level unless I think I know what the hell I'm doing and that I can that the mark that I can make the market go further or someone else is going to come in and help me out. I have to have conviction to do the opposite of what it takes to make money, meaning buy high instead of buy low, or sell low instead of sell high. My conviction in the future has to be greater than the guy on the other side of the trade. Conviction moves prices. Conviction will move energy inside your mental environment. Focused thought will move energy out of dysfunctional, belief, dysfunctional beliefs. And that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about clarity of intent, desire. That is focused thought. You know exactly where you want to go. You want to get to the point where you believe that there's a random distribution between wins and losses, that anything can happen, that you don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money. And that's the big one. I don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money. If you understand the benefits of installing those beliefs inside your mental environment as a core component of your trading personality, then you will find a way to do it. I'm going to give you a way, but... Self-discipline. Self-discipline I define as, as simply making a conscious commitment to pay attention to what you are thinking, saying, or doing in relationship to what you're trying to accomplish in any given moment. In other words, if... For an example, I have a goal or a desire or an objective, a desire to transform myself into someone who can think like a professional trader, someone who thinks in a series of trades perspective, someone who believes in the random distribution between wins and losses in my series. And I, and I also know that you know I, I may have any number of conflicting beliefs that I've acquired over the years that say otherwise, that say, you know, even though I'm aware of, of the benefits of this, there's all these other beliefs that say this isn't true. This is not who this is not who I am. This is who I am right here. This okay, yeah, he seems to be making a lot of sense up here, but you know something? This is who I am. You want to transform yourself into someone who thinks this. You can use self-discipline as a technique, which is simply my objective is to think in a series of trades perspective, start monitoring your thoughts, your words or your actions to see that they're consistent with what it is that you want to accomplish. And then simply purposefully refocus when you find out that you're doing, saying, doing, or thinking something that's opposite or not, not consistent with what you desire. And just constantly refocus. Eventually you'll get to the point where you are that person. A uh, real good example of, of, of employing self-discipline is uh, back in the late 70s, um, I decided I want to become a runner. And I can't tell you why, I, I really, because I don't remember the reason why. I just got it in my brain that I wanted to do it. Now, back when I was a kid in high school and college, I was very active, played a lot of sports. But in the, you know, from that point on, uh, my lifestyle was such that I ended up becoming somewhat of a slug. And uh, I say a slug, just, you know, I, I watched a lot of My primary vocation other than working was watching TV. And so uh, when I decided that, you know, I wanted to become a runner, you know, what did I do? I went out and ran. And I found out that I couldn't. I mean, I, I say I couldn't. I mean, I literally couldn't. I was shocked and astounded as to how out of shape I was. I couldn't even run two blocks. And so, you know, I went out the next day and only really could run two blocks again. I thought, oh, my God. And, and then I didn't run again for probably six months. And so, so when I ran again, I at least had enough, um, enough desire to compel me to run more than a couple of days, and and something, and, and I found something out is that is that I was amazed at how fast I how fast your body adapts 
and improves. And so that gave me a lot of encouragement because, you know, I ran a couple of times and I ran the third and fourth time. And it's like I ran so much further, like the fourth, you know, third or fourth time. I'm thinking that gave me a lot of encouragement to think, okay, I, I can do this. And so I set this goal for myself that uh, this was like in May. I don't remember in May of 1979 or 1978. I really don't remember. Anyway, but I set this goal for myself that I wanted to be able to run five miles by the end of the summer. And at the time, it seemed insurmountable. It really did. It didn't seem like it was even remotely possible to me, but I, that's, that was my goal. And so I went out and uh, being kind of a methodical person, I went out and I bought a, a journal, a running journal, and a, a stopwatch, and of course the running shoes and all this kind of good stuff. And so uh, set out to uh, set out to just start running, and uh, immediately ran into a set of obstacles, and those obstacles had to do with um, like it wasn't a part of my identity because every time I said, "Okay, I'm going to go and go running," okay, I'm going to go run. Well, what do you think happened? All these conflicting and competing thoughts flooded my brain. Like, okay, it's too hot, it's too cold. I ran three or four days ago. Nobody I know, none of my friends are doing this. You know, it might rain. And the biggest one, of course, was I'll go after this program. <laughs> and of course, I never went. So I would say that out of all the times that I, when I said I am going, I want to run, I would say that I managed to actually get my shoes on and get out the door maybe 30% of the time. Okay? And, uh, and, but that 30% of the time, I was like, I was improving, okay? And, and, I, you know, and I, I was actually getting further and further and getting encouraged, but at, but I realized as, as, as I could run, f run further and further, like I was up to a mile maybe or a mile and a quarter or something, because I, because I, I, I marked it all off in terms of like every half mile kind of thing of, of the course that I did. So I realized that, that I was getting so enthused over the fact that I was even getting that far that I thought I needed a mechanism to get the five miles because I thought I'd quit. What I mean, I thought I'd quit is that if I got the two miles, that was so far beyond what I thought I could ever do anyway that what would compel me to go to five? And so um, I don't know why I thought that way, but that's what I did. I really did. So I established what I called the five-mile rule. And the five-mile rule was if I managed to get through all my conflicting and competing thoughts, and if I managed to get through those and actually get my shoes on and get outside and take one step forward, that I had to always run at least one step further than I did the time before. And I knew what that was because I kept the journal. I knew exactly where I stopped. So my rule was I always had to go, one, I could go more than one step, but it had to be at least one step. And what I found, and this was really interesting, because what I found is that there was a threshold. There was a certain threshold point at which, at which you know, all the conflicting and competing thoughts went away. And it was like, there, I just became, I became a runner. It was like, I didn't have to, I didn't have to force myself to go out and run anymore. I actually felt compelled to run. And in a sense, what I did was create a new sense of identity. Like some people might call it a habit or whatever, I just call it a new sense of identity. I actually established a belief that said, I established a belief that said, I am a runner. That's who I am. You see, it's like, it's like it was people, and then, then my friends and family, they all thought that I was really disciplined. Because, see, because that's what I say about, most people think discipline is a personality characteristic. I don't define it that way at all. I define it as simply a technique for change. Because when we see somebody doing something that we can't do, that, we, that we'd like to do, but we have a problem with it, we just naturally think that they have the same kind of problems and that they're being disciplined in doing it. And that's not the case at all. If you're doing something effortlessly, it's because it's who you are. There was a threshold point, like I said, where, where all the conflicting energy just completely dissipated. And instead of me having to say consciously say to myself oh i'm going to go out and run i actually felt compelled to run then i got i got to the 5 miles and then i got to the point where i was running so much that i actually had to establish a corollary belief 
to learn how to listen to my body because there were days where my body was basically saying, hey, this is not a good day to run and give yourself a rest. And that had to be all right. But for a while it wasn't because when you start injuring yourself, then you know you're overdoing it. So I actually had to establish a belief that it was all right not to run. So it went from, went from conflicting and competing thoughts to this is who I am. And now it's effortless. Completely effortless. There's, there's no conflict at all. That's what you're going to have to learn, or that's what you're going to learn how to do with your trading. You're going to learn how to put on a sample size of trades where it becomes completely effortless, where there's no conflicting or competing thoughts about what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. It wouldn't even occur to you not to make, it wouldn't even occur to you to make the kind of mistakes that you typically make now. That's what you want to do. You want to get to the point where it doesn't even occur to you. It doesn't even enter your brain. Does everybody understand that example? And like I said, when you, when, you, when you realize that you're not appropriately focused on your objective, meaning you notice that you're either thinking, saying, or doing something that is inconsistent with what you're trying to accomplish, you deliberately refocus your attention on the object of your goal. Just do the best you can. Okay. So, so basically, like I said, this whole section, this last section, is, is, is giving you steps and techniques for evolving into a professional trader's mindset. So what you want to do is you want to resolve. In other words, say to yourself, my desire is to be a certain way so that I can make a consistent income from my trading, something I can rely on. So I resolve to stop analyzing or trying to figure out if the current opportunity to put on a trade is going to work. Resolve to stop doing that. And when you find yourself doing it, consciously refocus your thoughts that analyzing is not beneficial in any way. As a passive technical trader, you are dependent on other, the behavior of the traders to make, you, you make your trade a winner. And you are using a mathematical formula or price pattern to predict what they will do. Math formulas or price patterns don't know the intentions, objectives, or reasons why the individual traders who are capable of moving prices behave the way they do. As a result, you will almost never know the real reason why any particular trade worked or not. There's nothing to analyze. There's just nothing to analyze. Nothing. There was a back in, in, in back when I was in you know commercial casualty sales. There was a, uh, uh, a a sales course that I bought by Zig Ziglar. Everybody, everybody know who Zig Ziglar is? Okay. And there was a part of this part of this sales course where Zig Ziglar was talking about the exact right moment to ask a closing question to close a sale. And you know he said he, and and you know he's trying to get people to understand when that right moment is, and when you know where you're at that right moment. Zig Ziglar paused, and there was silence, and then he screamed, Shut up! He screamed out much louder than that. Shut up. The first person who talks loses. In other words, when you ask that closing question as a salesman, shut up and don't say a word, because if he said the first one who talks loses, and that was the truth. That worked. I found, when I felt compelled to talk before he did, I didn't get the sale. And when I was able to keep my mouth shut and let them talk first, I did. What I'm saying to you is that when you get a signal from your methodology, stop thinking! There's nothing to think about. There's nothing to think about. Do you understand why I said that? Just put on the train. There's absolutely nothing to think about. Just put the train on. So you resolve to stop analyzing, okay? I resolve. I'm gonna not I'm not gonna analyze anymore. When I get a signal, I'm gonna stop thinking. Resolve to learn the skill of trading without fear. In other words, manage your expectations by discarding the trade-by-trade -trade approach in a favor of a series of trades approach. This is what we've been talking about for probably the last half an hour. 
the pitfalls of a trade-by-trade -trade perspective. Anything you do for any reason can result in a winning trade. The problem is many of the things that you could do that results in a winning trade could reinforce trading behaviors that could lead to a catastrophic loss. Losing streaks can easily cause one's attitude to deteriorate into a negative spiral when you trade in a trade-by-trade -trade perspective. From a trade-by-trade -trade perspective, you are making a choice to pick what you think is an edge out of all the other possible trades you could have picked. In essence, you are saying, I am picking this trade because I think it's going to work. When you trade in a trade-by-trade -trade perspective, you can't help but think you know what's going to happen next because you are picking trades that you, only picking trades that you think are going to work. And therefore, you, your expectations automatically will not be in line with the realities of the market from its perspective. And therefore, have a threat, will have the potential to define and interpret market information in a threatening way, therefore, causing your perception of that information to be all out of whack, and you're going to end up creating the very things that you want to avoid, which is lose and make money, or lose and, and, and be wrong. You guys with me on this? Yes. yes. The reality is that at a rational level, you don't know if any trade is going to work because you never know for sure who's participating and what their intent is. You're guessing. See, you know what, you know what traders is? An educated guess. This is what we do as traders. Edge. Got an edge. You cated. Guess. That means probabilities. You're making an educated guess. You've got the probabilities in your favor. That's all we're doing here. With a specific expectation of the outcome, any market information that doesn't conform to what you expect will be perceived as threatening. You will be trading with fear. If you win, you think you're right, and if you lose, you think you're wrong. In either case, you'll be setting yourself up to make a trading error on the next trade. Just think about what I just said. Regardless of what happens, if you're right, or even or if you're wrong, in either case, you're setting yourself up to make a trading error on the next trade because our minds have the natural tendency to connect the past with the present. If the trade was a winner, in other words, if you're trading in a trade-by-trade -trade perspective, and you think you were right because you won, in other words, whatever reason you use, the market seemed to validate that reason. We know now that that just is not the case. If the trade was a winner, we're susceptible to, on the next trade, not predefining the risk, well, the last one was a winner. I, I, I knew for that reason. I knew what was happening. Therefore, the risk doesn't exist. Not letting ourselves get stopped out of a loser. Jumping the gun because you're anticipating the signal. Over trading our position size. Not booking any profits because you think it's going to go on forever. Is this making sense to everybody? If the trade was a loser, you're susceptible to not predefining the risk because you're going to gather all the information that's necessary to make sure it's not going to be a loser this time. Otherwise, I wouldn't be putting it on. Right? You're going to analyze it to death. You're going to hesitate, get in late, or not get in at all. Take profits too soon or revenge trading by not booking any profits. In other words, whatever the market's given you ain't enough. I got to have more. The last trade was a loser. I got to have more. The benefits of a series of trades perspective. You know exactly what behaviors serve your purpose and what behaviors do not. You cannot trade in a series of trades perspective with a trading plan and not know exactly what behaviors will serve your purpose and what behaviors will not. Because everything's planned out. You're either following your plan or you're not. But the point is, everything is planned. You are not picking individual trades. Therefore, no one trade has any more or any less significance than the other. The next trade, this trade, they're all just trades. None of them have any more or any less significance. 
you will gain a sense of freedom to flow in and out of your trades without conflict because you are not living or dying on the outcome of any particular trade. By reducing the number of variables, you will be learning what works and what doesn't. By truly accepting that the outcome of this trade could be different than whatever happened the last time, you are positively managing your expectations. Now think about what I just said. By truly accepting. What does it mean to truly accept? It means that there's no other part of your identity or consciousness that is in conflict with accepting the fact, genuinely accepting the fact, that this trade could have a different outcome than the last one. If this la- the last trade was a winner, it means that this trade could have a different outcome. It could be a loser. If the last trade was a loser, it means that this trade could have a different outcome. It could be a winner. You see, our minds don't feel like there's anything wrong with you by thinking in the previous way. Because our minds are wired to think that way. Our minds are literally wired to connect the two. That's why it's so difficult for many people to break through into this, into this ability to think into, in, in probabilities and to break into the, this threshold of consistency. is because we're, we're working, in some cases, against natural wiring. It is natural for our minds to say, if this is what happened the last time, if the circumstances are identical or similar this time, then the same thing is going to happen. What I'm saying to you is that you have to, you have to, you have to step into an exercise where you consciously disconnect the two. In other words, your whole purpose is to disconnect this now moment from what happened the last time. Because there is no connection. The reality is there's no connection. That's the truth. You just can't let your mind think that there is a connection. There is no connection between what's going between the outcome of this now moment opportunity with what happened the last time, even though the variables that are getting you into this trade or identifying this opportunity are identical. That creates quite a paradox for our brains, okay? That's why people can understand the nature of probabilities. They can understand them, but they can't function from that perspective. You have to train your mind to function from that perspective. That's what separates everyone from the pros, okay? You have to train your mind to disconnect. Don't let yourself think that there's any connection between now and what happened the last time. Because the reality is there is none. There really isn't. I don't care how identical it looks. You can use the same mathematical formulas and, 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 and criteria in those formulas that apply to market data and come up with these patterns, but I guarantee you the traders that are operating in the market now are not the same traders, identically at least not the same traders, as the ones that operated the last time. Therefore, there's no possible way that there could be a connection between now and then. There's just no possible way. When you disconnect, when you make that disconnection, okay, you won't perceive market information as threatening. You'll eliminate the potential to make a trading error, and you will be aspiring to trade without fear in a carefree state of mind. Now that you understand that your technical methodology does not tell you what will happen next on a trade-by-trade basis, in this section I will take you through a step-by-step process that will integrate the principles of consistency as a functional part of your trading personality. Up to this point, we've talked about how we get into this mindset, about resolving to think in certain ways, but this is this is... Learning how to disconnect, in other words, learning how to circumvent that natural mechanism in our mind that automatically connects things, 
connect similar events, this now moment opportunity, this now moment event, with something that's in our mind as a memory. If there's enough, you know, if there's enough similarity there, it'll it'll it tap us into a state of mind that's identical to our memories, as opposed to what might be available in the now moment, which may be very different than, you know, may, very different than what we think that it is. I mean, that's where, you know, that's where we have relationship problems, communication problems. You know, it's like it's this 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 connect mechanism really does cause us a lot of problems. It really does. Because in many cases, a lot of the pain and heartache that we feel in our lives is not connected at all with what's really happening in that moment. But you wouldn't be able to convince ourselves, or no one would be able to convince us, or we wouldn't be able to convince ourselves that what we weren't experiencing in that moment wasn't real because what we were experiencing was the energy. It was the, the fear, the confidence, the dissatisfaction, the betrayal, you know, the, the energy of it is, is real that you can't say this is not what's happening. But the problem is that the interpretation of the information that tapped us into the state of mind and the connection that our mind automatically made from this mal moment to some memory in the past could be, like I said, completely erroneous. When you when you look at the, when you look at the very nature of the universe and the way it ex, the way it exists, there is no possible way that any moment could ever duplicate itself. No two moments are ever alike, ever, and could never be, because if you just look at it, if you look at physical reality, is constructed of atoms and molecules, and those atoms and molecules are in constant motion. They are in constant motion. For two moments to ever duplicate themselves, it means that all the atoms of all the molecules would have to be in the exact same spot they were in some previous moment right now. And that ain't going to happen. So when you really get right down to it, every moment is really unique. Every moment in the environment is really unique. But our minds don't process information that way. Every moment in the market is genuinely and truly unique. But our minds don't process it that way. We have to train our minds to process it that way if we want to make ourselves the casino. If we want to put ourselves in the situation where we are the casino, then we've got to get our minds to process information in a different way. Richard had a comment that I thought was really good. We tend to associate with a winning trade or a losing trade that when we do suffer a loss, we tend to think of ourselves as a loser instead of that is just a trade that turned out a loss. Right. And when we, so, uh, when we do get a winning trade, we think, well, I'm a winner. So you get caught up in the emotion of it instead of looking at it, that was a bad trade, this was a good trade. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a winner or a loser. Richard, have you ever played the slots? No. Never? <laughs> Well, oh, yes. Why couldn't you say? I, I, yes, so why could, uh, not anymore because no, I understand. No, 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 I say, no. Did I say, have you ever played yes. the slots? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when the tumblers didn't come up with a, any kind of a jackpot, did you think of yourself as a loser? No. Why? Because I know that the slot machine is rigged against me. <laughs> well, okay, but did you think there's any possibility of ever winning? Uh, uh, absolutely, because I did get some. But in other I eventually words, ended up with an empty pocket. But in other words, you, you, you walked into it with a belief that on any particular time that you pushed the button that there was a random outcome. Correct. You knew that, right? And so therefore you didn't think of yourself as a loser. Correct. Not Have you ever thought of yourself as a loser when you had a losing trade? Yes. And what would be the reason? <laughs> Because I lost. No, because you didn't. Trade. Because you didn't believe that there was a random outcome, sure. right? If you believed, if someone told you from the very beginning that that whatever outcomes that you experienced from any methodology that you picked to define an edge were random, would you be thinking about this completely it, differently? It makes a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in other words, you wouldn't have the same emotional problems that that you might have with the kind of errors and 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 everything else that goes along with trading with fear if someone would have just said to you you know what there's a random outcome that even help. though it's a pattern and it doesn't make sense and it creates a paradox for our minds we got a pattern that produces a random outcome if you believe that there was a random outcome where would the emotions come from 
they would go. They would certainly diminish. If not well, they go wouldn't away. be. I don't think they'd be anywhere at all, they would, would they? Go away. Yes. No, I'm saying if you just right from the very start, what okay. would you have to associate with? If if it's a random outcome, then you know that you're not wrong, <laughs> right? Correct. So there wouldn't be anything to associate the outcome with any kind of interpretation that that could end up causing you to feel some sort of emotional pain. You're right. All we're trying to do is get to that place now. Even though you've had all this backlog of experience telling you otherwise, that's where we want to get to. How are we going to get there? We're going to create an exercise. Remember the five-mile rule? Okay, we're going, to do, we're going to do the five-mile rule in a trading exercise. Why are we going to do the exercise? Remember, we have to, be, have to have clarity of intent. What is our desire? Our desire is to become a consistently successful trader, one where I can, I can generate an income I can rely on. Okay? And so we are going to actually trade for a new reason. We're going to stay focused in the process of trading as opposed to the outcome. The typical trader is obsessed with the outcome of a trade. The professional trader is focused in the process of trading and letting the outcomes take care of themselves. As a matter of fact, the best traders that I've ever encountered love the process of trading. The typical trader, on the other hand, either has no awareness of the actual process of trading or really doesn't like the process of trading, but they're addicted to or obsessed with the outcome. So you have to make up your mind, and everyone in this room, at some point in their lives, for some reason, has decided to make up their mind about something, and when you have, you got results. Everyone has, I know everyone has had that experience. You've made up your mind with so much desire, so much clarity of intent, and, and with, with absolute sincerity that you got the desired result. So I'm saying that if you make up your mind to trade for a new reason, the reason is the acquisition of skills as opposed to the outcome or how much money you're making you will acquire those skills, and then you'll find that the outcomes just take care of themselves. If you've paper traded or tested your methodology to the point where you have confidence that you have something that can generate consistent results, then you can do this exercise. If you haven't, then you're going to have to do that first. You're going to have to... You're going to have to plan your trades. In other words, you're going to have to take your methodology and determine a given set of rigid variables because what we're going to do is set up a trading exercise with just a simple 25 trade or 20 trade sample size. In other words, what you're going to say is that I am willing to invest in the development of these skills, the skill of learning to trade without fear. Learning to think in probabilities. Because when you learn to think in probabilities, the fear will go away. And so what I essentially have to do is convince myself. I have to step into, purposefully step into an experience where I am convinced, where I literally convince myself that these principles are true. Now they sound true to you. They might resonate as the truth. But you have to keep in mind that you might have a backlog of, of, of any number of experiences that, that would support beliefs that would argue otherwise. Because I could say to you that if I set up or you set up an exercise where you said, okay, I've got a particular set of variables that when they appear in the market, that is my edge, and that my edge will produce, let's say, even 60% winning trades. And you don't even have to have 60%. You can have 50% and still make consistent money. As long as what you have to risk to find out if it works is, you know, a third or a half of what you normally get when the, when the trade does work in terms of profits. But if we set this exercise up so that, there are, that there's no wiggle room, there is no wiggle room. What I mean by wiggle room is that the variables 
the criteria that you use are absolutely rigid, black and white. They either they are either present or they are not. That's the only decision you have to make. Are the, in other words, if you do it, you do it in terms of lights, whatever lights you're going to use, whatever time frame the lights you're going to use, or whatever time frame, they are either on or they're not. And if they're on, you are obligated to take the trade. And what you're going to say to yourself is that in this, whatever, whatever criteria or plan that you set up is, I am not going to take just the next trade. I am going to take the next 20 trades. I'm going, you are committing yourself to taking the next 20 trades of the occurrence of your edge. You will know in advance, based on testing and paper trading, exactly the optimum amount that you have to risk. In other words, what your risk is on each trade. And it's not going to be a, vari it's not going to be a varied amount. It's going to be a, a, a specific amount, whether it's in terms of, of dollars or distance. It will be a specific amount so that you know exactly how much each trade is going to possibly, potentially could cost you. And it should really be set up as a rigid profit, pr pr uh, profit uh, potential too. In other words, I don't want you making subjective decisions just about how far, how far you're going to let the market go in your favor. So if you can, if you can get a set of variables, well, let's say you even two to one, or even one to half to one, one and a half to one, meaning that that if I have to risk one point of something, even if it's let's say in stocks, if I have to risk a dollar to make that, that my, particular, my particular set of variables, my entry variables, will get me into a trade where if I risk a buck, I'll get $2 60% of the time or 50% of the time. Then that's what you do. You do, do two to one. There are trading methodologies that can be even the opposite. You can even go two to one here, meaning you can risk two to get one but in these cases, the trade has to be the trade has to be eighty or ninety percent correct. You can do it any percentage as you want, as long as it is fixed. There is no wiggle wiggle room. There is no subjective decision making whatsoever. Am, am I really clear about this? There is no subjective decision making whatsoever. Go ahead. The big things in, in expectancy or in, in trading uh, with uh, risk reward ratio is is you don't know which trade is going to be the the winning trade. Correct. And uh, uh, typically, you you try to let your winning trade you get stopped out on your winning trades. But what you're saying to us for this exercise is that we take a fixed stop. I understand the fixed risk, but a, a fixed essential profit stop. You know what, if you can set it up as, as a trailing stop, if you can set your trailing stops up where you're not making any kind of subjective decision, you can do that too. So if, you're as long as it's yes, if you're sophisticated enough to do that, then yes. Okay, okay most, uh, most traders in these situations are not. That's why I make it real easy. Okay? As, long, as, long as, it's, as long as you're not making any decisions. So in other words, what you're saying is that if the market goes X number of points in my favor, I move my my trailing stop up to a certain percentage below where the market is right now. And you don't move that unless you get stopped out or it moves up another gradient or whatever. An another, uh, well, uh, what am I thinking? Um, standard like deviation beyond. <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever you're using, okay? Yeah, if you can, if you can, if you can do that, that's fine. I just want it, I just want all the variables to, variables to be completely and absolutely fixed. Okay, and then you fixed all these variables, and so you say to yourself, "I'm going to take the next 20 trades, not just the next one, but the next 20, no matter what, no matter what." Now that means that you have to be prepared, based on the amount that you have to risk, you have to be prepared to take 20 losses in a row. The likelihood of that happening are, is about as remote as getting 20 wins in a row. But the point is, is that the dollar value of the risk of each trade multiplied by 20, you have to be able to afford. 
So you've got to set it up that way. You've got to set it up so that you can afford the dollar value of the risk of taking 20 losing trades in a row. Because you're, so what you're saying to yourself, if taking the risk, if, if taking the 20 trades in a row, losing 20 trades in a row based on the amount of shares that you trade. So for an example, if, if, the, if the standard amount of shares that you trade would say that, you know, by, if I had lost 20 trades in a row based on how much I've got to risk, it's going to be $5,000. You say to yourself, you know what, I don't want to spend $5,000 on this. Then don't. But say, I'm willing, truly willing to spend, let's say, $1,000 then set it up where the, the, the amount of contracts or shares that you trade correspond to adding each one up where it comes up to $1,000, even if it means just trading 10 shares at a time. Go down to a level where it's, you're completely comfortable with the dollar value. You have to be completely comfortable. And then when you get an occurrence of your edge, put the trade on and see what happens. And if it turns out the winner will be a winner, you think, oh, hey, yeah, Mark Douglas, hey, good, hey, this, this is all right, okay? Yeah, so this one turns out to be a winner, and maybe this one turns out to be a winner. And maybe, well, this one's a loser. You think, yeah, okay, I, I can handle that. And this one's a loser. Uh-oh, and this one's a loser. Now we've got three losers in a row. I have rarely met a trader who doesn't have a problem with the next trade after three losers in a row. You, you made the commitment to take every single trade. When the next one comes up and your mind is screaming, no, it's a loser. Remember how our minds are wired to think? Our minds are wired to think that way, but that is not the truth. The truth is your methodology, the mathematical formula, does not know what the outcome of that trade is going to be. And neither do you. You got to take it anyway. And see, and when these occurrences, when you can, when you purposefully put yourself into a situation where you're confronting these conflicting beliefs, because that's what's rearing its head. This is any different than me saying I want to go run, and then and then you know, well, uh, after that program, or it's too cold, it's too hot, it's raining, whatever. It's the exact same thing. You put the trade on anyway, and it turns out to be a winner. You are. You are convincing yourself that you don't know what's going to happen next. Because you created an experience that directly, that was, that directly contradicts what you thought was true. You actually created an experience that directly contradicts what you thought was true. And the more of these you run into and the more times you do it, all of a sudden, you're not thinking the old way anymore. You are truly and genuinely learning how to think in probabilities. You are integrating thinking in probabilities as a core part of your trading personality. You may understand the nature of probabilities, but now you're being able to function from a probabilistic perspective. Because what you're going to do is you're going to do this exercise until you can do it flawlessly. You are going to do this exercise and you do the first one, and if you don't execute your trades completely flawlessly, then do it again. Now, at the end of a sample size, if you don't like the outcome, if you don't like the results, meaning the amount of money that you made, or even loss for that matter, because that's possible, you don't like the bottom line, you can tweak your variables. You just can't do it in the middle of a sample size. If you want to change your variables at the end of a sample size, you're free to do it. You cannot do it in the middle of one. Cannot, absolutely cannot. You will keep doing this exercise until when? What? What? Well, yes, but there's something else I want to get. Until when? When do you? When do you? How do you know that you? How do you know you've arrived? How do you know you've actually arrived? That you've changed? But you can freely and easily put in the trade. That's right. You can just, there, there's no conflicting energy anymore. It doesn't occur to you to not do it. It doesn't even enter your brain. You don't even get the thought. You get a signal, you put on the trade. You get a signal, you put on the trade. 
It's like then, then it's who you are. You guys with me on this? You, you manage to actually work through all that conflicting energy and you've changed. You're a different person. Because the competing and conflicted, for conflicting thoughts don't even enter your consciousness. They're not there anymore. Because it's not who you are anymore. Any questions about this? Is this making sense to everybody? If you're really sincere about wanting to generate a consistent income, you'll do this exercise. And if you're not, you won't. And you might not be ready to, and that's all right. Whenever you're ready, you'll do it. But this will work. This will work. One second. Because you are actively stepping into an experience where your desire is to change the way that you think. Instead of avoiding the confrontation, you are actually embracing the confrontation. Big difference. You are embracing the confrontation because the more that you embrace it, the faster it dissipates. Go ahead. Can you speak a little bit about uh, the going from uh, paper trading to uh, real money? I, I know there's a difference. And you, you would you say you were trying a new strategy or something that you you were tweaking. You would do paper first. And what would you would you consider? It a, I mean, if you you would you look at each trade and if you executed it flawlessly and and you say you generated money, and then you went to the to real money. How would you decide, uh, I guess, if you lost money? I may answer my own question here. In other words, what would you expect the transition to be? Well, that's going to depend on the individual. One, you're always going to want to paper trade. If you've got a, a new set of variables that you're working with, you're always going to want to paper trade it to the point where you're confident that, that you've got, you can get good results. That doesn't mean that you can execute good results. It means that the potential is there. You want to know the potential is there, Correct. Once you know that the potential is there, then you move. See, the paper trading part is only to find out what variables in the market work in relationship to, you know, like, like market movement in relationship to the formula, okay? Now we're working on our brain, okay? So that's, the, that's the first step. The second step is that, is that do I think in a way that's consistent that I can extract the maximum potential out of the methodology? That means executing flawlessly. So, so what you do is you set this exercise up in a way that what will dictate it is how much you're comfortable with, if you, how much you're comfortable with the dollar amount of losing every, tra every, every single trade. That's how you know how to set it up. That's really key. It really is. It means that if you have to trade one share, then, you know, if, if that's all you're comfortable with, with losing based on the dollar value of, of how much you have to risk on each trade, that's based on your analysis, by the way. Then do it. Do, and then, and then when, you're, when you can execute one share flawlessly over a sample size or one or two sample sizes, then go to 10 shares and see how you do it. And if you can't do 10 shares comfortably and flawlessly, go back to five. You're just building skills. If you, stay, if, if you get your mind out of, out, of the, out, of, out of the money, out of the outcome part, and focus on building the skills. Once those skills are there, you're going to make all the money you want. That makes sense, doesn't it? Do this exercise and you won't believe how things will change. Until you actually change and it's just like it'll be... It'll be amazing. Do the exercise. So does anybody else have any questions about how to, how to set this exercise up? 
How long, are, how long are you going to do the exercise? If you set it up and do it, how long are you going to do it? What's the criteria? 20 trades. I understand. How many 20 trade sample size or 25 trade sample size exercises are you going to do? That's right, until there's no conflicting and competing thoughts, until you can do it flawlessly, until you can do it, until it's like just a part of who you are. It wouldn't occur to you not to do anything other than what your rules say. It just wouldn't even occur to you. It doesn't even, it doesn't even enter your brain. And I guarantee you, at that point, you will be thinking in probabilities. You will be trading without fear. You will be trading from a carefree state of mind. That's the payoff. You'll be thinking like a pro. So you want to resolve to focus your efforts on developing specific trading skills and consistent profits will naturally flow as a byproduct of the mastery of these skills. The most successful traders love the process of trading, whereas a typical trader usually ignores the process because he's obsessively focused on the outcome. On these trades, you keep saying, uh, you know, do the process and you totally, you do it perfectly, right? What are some of the pitfalls? I mean, when I trade, I don't really think that I'm doing too much wrong. So I'm curious what all can go wrong on a trade other than typing it in wrong. All the things that, like all the errors that I, that I mentioned earlier. Like, you know, not predefining your, if you're not doing stuff wrong, that's fine. You know, that's, don't, don't, don't more, <laughs> don't, don't that stuff. Yeah, don't make it, yeah, don't, if you're doing all right, then you're doing fine, okay? I don't want to give you the impression that, that there has to be anything more there. It's, you know. Okay, resolve to commit the five fundamental truths about the nature of trading as core beliefs of your trading personality. Those five fundamental truths are anything can happen. Is that true or not? Yes. Every moment is unique. Is that true? Yes. Okay, an edge is nothing more than an indication of a higher probability of one thing happening over another. Okay, is there a random distribution between wins and losses on any given set of variables that define an edge? Yes, absolutely. Do we need to know what's going to happen next to produce a consistent income? No. no. You see, so if you find yourself, as you're doing this exercise, you know, with conflicting and competing thoughts, pay attention to what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're about to do as a result of what you're thinking. And then refocus on what you want to believe. I want to believe that anything can happen, that there's a random distribution that I don't need to know, and just stay focused on, on these particular beliefs and do the best you can and keep on doing it until it just becomes a part of who you are. Sounds like a meditation. It's right. You're absolutely right. It's like a meditation. That's right. Your mantra. Put them up on your wall or by your computer screen. Because they're all true. Continually re resolve to continually reinforce a belief in your ability to be a consistently successful trader by adopting the trader's creed. By the way, these two things are in the are in trading in the zone. I, th what I just th the five fundamental truths in the trader's creed are both in trading in the zone. The trader's creed: I am a consistent winner. In other words, remember the belief that I put up that I am a runner. Remember that? I said when I, when I actually became a runner, that that belief compelled me to express myself in a way that was consistent with that belief? Well, what we want to do is install a belief that says, I am a consistent winner. And the subset beliefs that you have to have to make this true will automatically compel you to act or behave in a way that's consistent with that belief. Why are you a consistent winner? Because I objectively identify my edges. Objectively. Meaning no rationalizations, justifications, or building cases. I know what criteria defines my edge, and it's either present or it's not. I predefine the risk of every trade. Wouldn't even think about getting into a trade without doing that. Now, that doesn't mean, because who brought that up earlier? No, he's not here right now. 
That doesn't mean that I always put a stop in the market. But I trade subjectively. That doesn't mean I actually enter a stop. But I guarantee you that whatever price I picked as my risk point, I never violate not getting out at that price. The market hits my price, I get out. That doesn't mean I've entered a stop in the market beforehand. But I can do that. I don't have a problem with that. It wouldn't even occur to me not to do otherwise. I am a consistent winner because I completely accept the risk or I'm willing to scale back or let go of the edge. Meaning I'm completely free of conflict about the amount of money I'm willing to spend to find out if this trade is going to work. If you're not completely sure or let's say completely without conflict about the amount of money that it could take to find out if this trade is going to work, then scale back to a level that you're comfortable But the important thing is participate. Even if you have to scale back again to, like I said, one share, at least you're participating at a level where you've got some money at risk. I act on my edges without reservation or hesitation. I am a consistent winner because I act on my edges without reservation or hesitation. I'm a consistent winner because I continually monitor my susceptibility to making trading errors. And how do I do that? I keep journals. I pay myself as the market makes money available to me. I subscribe to a philosophy of scaling out of positions. I like to divide my position up into fractions and scale out in quarters or thirds. That way I'm continually making myself a winner. As the market makes money available, I'm extracting money out of the market because I don't know how far the market's going to go in my favor. And what I have is I usually have at least a quarter or a third on in case it just does something that, you know, I could have never anticipated. And by the time I've got just the last third on or last quarter on anyway, and, you know, I've got, a, I've got a trailing stop or, you know, at least a place in my mind where I get out if it, if it retraces back to, back to my, you know, not far beyond my entry point anyway at that, from that point on. And the last one, I never violate these principles of success. Well, what do you think, guys? Any questions? Get them now. Go ahead. Do you ever scale in? No, I you know a lot of a lot of traders who do. I just I just don't. That's it. I don't. I'm not saying that because I don't doesn't mean that 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 I that I don't think it's fine. I just don't have a particular methodology where I scale in. That's all. I get in all at once. Anything else? Here's your chance to get on the DVD. Come on. <laughs> Don't miss out. <laughs> What's that? Never violate water. Uh, well, well, no, that, why? What do you mean? That, you think... Well, what do you... Yeah, you don't have to... You, you can get to a... a, a you can get to a... Uh, go ahead. Never violate. That's a, the never is it that... They said, never say never. Well, you know, let's put it this way. You can, you can at least aspire to never violate, yeah. to uh, violate the principle. Yeah, that's good, but that's a good point. Yeah, yeah you're, making, you're making a good point. You really are. I appreciate that. You can aspire to never violate these principles of success. Anything else? Let's call it a day, then. Let's call it a day.